preface of some American storytellers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Céline Major. Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper. Preface the term storytellers has been deliberately chosen for this volume in place of novelists or story writers or any other available variant because it makes possible a more uniform manner of treatment and a more generous point of view while it is true that the modern novel in its higher development has come to mean something more important than a mere story a source of amusement for an idle hour still the fact remains that in all classes and grades of fiction the underlying story is the one common factor the one indispensable element without which the most carefully written novel becomes a mere dry-as-dust essay or sermon. Now, the ability to tell a story is precisely the one gift that cannot be taught. The late Frank Norris once wrote that in every child a storyteller was born, but that the vast majority died soon after birth. This, of course, is only a figurative way of saying that the imaginative faculty is a prerogative of childhood that successful storytelling, where it survives to mature years, is an intuitive, inborn quality not to be acquired by any amount of conscious cerebration. The subjects of the essays included in this volume differ widely in aim and in accomplishment, but all of them possess, to a considerable extent, the gift that makes them next of kin to the minstrel and troubadour, to the ancient fabulist, and to the forgotten spinner of the world's first nursery tales the gift of holding the attention by the spell of the spoken word. Indiscriminate praise is, of course, as foolish and as harmful as wholesale censure. Yet it is more helpful to discover some merit lurking in an otherwise mediocre volume than to dismiss it contemptuously because its shortcomings are all upon the surface. Some very large oysters contain some very small pearls, but that is no reason for disdainfully tossing the oysters aside with the remark, those pearls are not worth the trouble of saving. See the amount of waste shell there is. Now all of the authors herein treated contain pearls, some large and some small, and the attempt has been made in each case to find and indicate them. The intention has been not to ignore or gloss over any faults, but first of all to lay the main emphasis upon the positive merits, to show a sympathetic understanding of what each author has tried to do, and to give full credit wherever they have succeeded in their attempt. And the highest and best reward that has yet come or that can come is in those cases where the subjects of these essays voluntarily say, You have understood. A few essays are here printed for the first time. Others have been extensively rewritten in order to bring them up to date. But the majority, in one form or another, appeared originally in the pages of the bookman and the author wishes to express his appreciation of the courtesy of the editor and publishers of that magazine in allowing them to be reprinted. Frederick Tabor Cooper New York City, June 26, 1911 End of Preface Chapter 1 of Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1. Francis Marion Crawford There is a peculiar satisfaction in undertaking a critical study of Mr. Marion Crawford in a volume which by its very title avows the intention of viewing the novelist primarily in his capacity of storyteller. While it is quite true that an interesting plot is the indispensable cornerstone of successful fiction, Yet many of the biggest novels are not those in which the storyteller's art has reached its highest development. They are big because they are not only stories, but a great deal else besides. Fearless paintings of existing conditions, trenchant criticisms of life. And conversely, many a novel faulty in structure, false in coloring, exaggerated in action to the point of melodrama, has been vitalized by that magic instinct of the born storyteller that inimitable gift of making miracles seem plausible and convincing you that impossibilities could have happened simply by telling you with assured audacity that they really did happen. Consequently, to approach a novelist primarily on the storytelling side is neither a direct road to discovering his permanent place in fiction nor a barrier to such discovery. It simply determines the initial point of view, avoids the trouble of making explanations and saving clauses, 
and often makes possible a greater indulgence for shortcomings, a more cordial recognition of merit. In the case of Mr. Crawford, the advantages of this standpoint are sufficiently obvious. Whatever position may be assigned to him now or hereafter in English letters, it must be conceded that he was first, last, and always a prince of storytellers, whose title was inborn and not acquired. A little more than a quarter of a century ago, when Mr. Isaacs caught the attention of a volatile reading public, there were those who predicted, in view of its oddity of theme and treatment, that the newly discovered author would never again repeat his initial success, that Mr. Crawford would remain in the class of authors of one book. Yet anyone with a well-developed critical sense must have seen in Mr. Isaacs, beneath its oriental coloring and its mystical atmosphere, the first flowing of that strong, steady, inexhaustible current of narration, which has held its even way through upward of two-score volumes, not one of which deserves the stigma of mediocrity, while just a few possess a quality entitling them to a higher recognition than they have yet received. There is yet another reason for preferring to treat of Mr. Crawford primarily as a storyteller, namely, that it is the point of view from which he himself would have chosen to be treated. The first axiom of all impartial and helpful criticism is that an author's work should be judged in the light of what he has intended to do. Most novelists of real importance have sooner or later expressed in print their theories of the art they practiced, but few have done so with the terse clearness, the uncompromising conviction that characterized Mr. Crawford's suggestive little monograph upon the novel, what it is. To the critic, it is a most helpful little volume, not for a better understanding of what constitutes a novel, since there are a score of points on which one is inclined to take issue with the author, but for a better understanding of Mr. Crawford himself. Indeed, it is scarcely too much to say that it is a convenient key to every one of his merits and defects. And for that reason it seems wise to examine it somewhat carefully, to quote from it rather freely, and to get quite clearly before us just what are his theories of fiction, and why those theories do not always bear the fruit which he expected to obtain from them. In the first place, then, the novel is defined by Mr. Crawford as a marketable commodity of the class collectively termed intellectual artistic luxuries. In other words, the first object of the novel is to amuse and interest the reader, and a novelist is at all times under an implied contract with the prospective purchasers to give them the entertainment they are looking for and to attempt nothing more serious than entertainment. It is not surprising, therefore, that he has no tolerance whatever for the purpose novel, not merely because, in art of all kinds, the moral lesson is a mistake, but for the more specific reason that the purpose novel is a simple fraud, an odious attempt to lecture people who hate lectures, to preach at people who prefer their own church, and to teach people who think they know enough already. The novel is nothing more nor less than a pocket theatre, the novelist nothing more than a public amuser. Quote, it is good to make people laugh. It is sometimes salutary to make them shed tears. It is best of all to make our readers think, not too serious thoughts, nor such as require an intimate knowledge of science and philosophy to be called thoughts at all, but to think, and thinking, to see before them characters whom they might really like to resemble, acting in scenes in which they themselves would like to take part. Mr. Crawford need not have added to the above paragraph a single word regarding his attitude toward romance and realism, for it is obvious that the novelist who recognizes that his chief duty is to entertain, and who deliberately purposes to leave out of his books all characters whom his readers would not like to resemble, and all scenes in which his readers would not care to play a part, must of necessity have scant sympathy for the realistic school, or small use for the definition of the novel as a cross-section of life. What he does have to say upon this subject is exactly in accord with what one would expect him to say. Zola, he concedes somewhat reluctantly to have been a great man, mightily coarse to no purpose, but great, nevertheless, a Nero of fiction. But Zola's shadow seen through the veil of the English realistic novel is a monstrosity not to be tolerated. The fact that, in our Anglo-Saxon system, the young girl is everywhere— seems to him in itself a sufficient reason why we should temper the wind of our realism to the sensitive innocence of the ubiquitous shorn lamb. And after defining the realistic school as that which purposes to show men what they are, and the romantic school as the one which 
tries to show men what they should be. He frankly declares that for his part he believes that more good can be done by showing men what they may be, ought to be, or can be, than by describing their greatest weaknesses with the highest art. There is just one more paragraph which deserves to be emphasized, because it touches quite unconsciously upon the source of the real weakness, not only of Mr. Crawford's novels, but of the romantic school as a whole. Quote, Practically, what we call a romantic life is one full of romantic incidents which come unsought as the natural consequence and result of a man's or a woman's character. It is therefore necessarily an exceptional life, and as such should have an exceptional interest for the majority. Now there cannot be any question that the theory contained in this paragraph is admirable. The trouble is that as a working formula it almost never succeeds. Even in Mr. Crawford's own novels, admirable as they are, for he understands beyond question the technique of his craft, it would puzzle the critic to point out any one romantic life made up solely of incidents which have come unsought as the natural consequence and result of the man's character. The hidden flaw in all romantic fiction is due to the fact that the incidents which come unsought as the result of character rarely show the romantic quality which a Scott, a Dumas, a Stevenson demands. The novelist may take the greatest pains in his selection of exceptional types of men and women, and may show equal care in bringing them together under exceptional conditions. Nevertheless, in nine cases out of ten, if he leaves them alone to follow consistently their natural bent, if he does not actively intervene and force them to say no or to say yes, if he does not check and harass and complicate their actions by the intervention of blind, illogical fate in the shape of disaster, disease, and death, he will find them naturally and quietly doing the normal and obvious thing, and frustrating his hope of providing that exceptional interest which is demanded by the majority. In Mr. Isaacs, perhaps quite as consistently as in any of his later books, Mr. Crawford evolved a long series of highly romantic happenings directly from the peculiar temperament of his hero. Yet take away the element of chance, the accidental blow on the head received by Isaacs in the game of polo, the coincidence which made Miss Westenhoff's brother the unknown benefactor of Isaacs in his days of poverty, and finally the girl's illness and death from jungle fever and the story would necessarily have had a radically different and more prosaic ending. In Saracinesca and Sant'Elario, the most admirably real of all Mr. Crawford's Italian stories, the fact remains that the vital issues of the plot arise in the one case out of a purely chance identity of names between two distant cousins, and in the other from an almost incredible series of coincidences, a lost pin, a stolen envelope, a forged letter. Now, in romantic fiction, there is no logical objection to the use of chance, accident, fate, call it what you will. The mistake lies in trying to write romance in accordance with a realistic formula, and to convince the reader that sane men and women did strange, unlikely deeds as the direct result of their own characters. Mr. Crawford, however, in a measure disarms criticism by confessing genially that he is himself the last of literary sinners. His creed, so far as he has one, slips on and off easily, like a well-worn glove. In theory, as we have seen, he advocates romance. In practice, he is in turn realist, psychologue, mystic, whatever for the moment suits his needs or appeals to his instinct of born storyteller. His stage setting, his local color, are painted in from life with scrupulous fidelity. A Balzac or a Zola could not be more faithful to reality in matters of topography. You may at any time, if you please, trace the peregrinations of Count Scariatin through the back alleys of Munich, or of Paul Patoff through the labyrinthine paths of Constantinople. And his people are as real as his streets and houses. The whole world knows that his Mr. Isaacs was drawn direct from life, the original being a certain Mr. Jacobs, a trader in rare jewels, who later came into note through his dispute with the Nizam of Deccan over the price of the great Empress Diamond. Had you talked with Mr. Crawford about his other characters, you would have learned that there was nothing exceptional in the case of Mr. Isaacs. He would have told you with a quiet smile that the men and women who thronged the pages of his Saracinesca trilogy were all real people, whom he had for the most part known and liked well. That Corona was still living. That Spica was a composite portrait of a cadaverous Pole and a famous Neapolitan duelist who died a few years ago. 
that Count Scariatine, the crazed nobleman in a cigarette maker's romance, was in reality a German count who once a week, just as in the story, left his workbench in the little tobacco shop and sat at home waiting in vain for a summons to the Bavarian court. That Viera, the Russian girl who sold her hair to pay the count's debt of honor, was also a reality and that even Fischlowitz's dingy tobacco shop, with the absurd mechanical figure of the Viennese Gigerl in the window, existed in Munich exactly as Mr. Crawford drew it, and was in fact the shop where he went day after day to buy his cigarettes. His method, then, may be summed up somewhat after this fashion. He begins by taking a real stage setting, some one of the many corners of the world of which his cosmopolitan experience has given him intimate knowledge. He brings upon the stage a group of real people of strong and interesting personality, whom he has known and studied from the life, idealizing them to suit his purpose, yet not so much as to mar the illusion of reality. And having up to this point held himself in check, he now gives free rein to his imagination and puts these thoroughly real people through a series of highly romantic adventures, forcing them to think and say and do many things which our sober second judgment tells us they never would have said or thought or done, and yet, with his inborn power of storytelling, convincing us for the time being that it all must have happened exactly as he assures us that it did. It would be futile to attempt to survey in detail any large number of Mr. Crawford's two-score novels, nor would any very useful purpose be served were it practical to do so. There is a surprisingly large proportion of his books which a critic may quite safely ignore. Books which one and all maintain an even quality of interest, yet add nothing to our estimate of him as a man or artist. As is well nigh inevitable in a novelist who never allows himself to forget that novel writing is a business, and who has brought the technique of construction almost to a mechanical routine, the difference between his earlier and later books is mainly a loss of spontaneity, and an increased conventionality in plot and character. Mr. Crawford did not write himself out, to use the phrase which he declared was so terrible for any author to hear. His average standard during his closing years was far nearer to that of his best work than that of Mr. Howells, let us say comes to Silas Lapham, nearer indeed than many other novelists whom the world has chosen to honor could come to his own best achievement after a quarter of a century of unremitted toil. It is, nevertheless, a fact that the volumes which one feels inclined to single out for specific discussion all belong to the first decade of Mr. Crawford's literary activity. Mr. Isaacs, of course, must remain one of the volumes which will be read as long as Mr. Crawford continues to be remembered. Crude, though it may be in construction and uneven in style, it nevertheless remains a rather remarkable achievement, one of those rare first efforts that are nothing short of a sheer stroke of genius. It is usually an unwise experiment to read over in maturity a story which gave keen pleasure in early youth. Yet, if the present writer may be allowed to cite his own personal experience, Mr. Isaacs is one of the books that stand the test surprisingly well. Mr. Crawford himself admitted that he was most fortunate in having begun his literary career with this particular book. Theosophy was in the air. Kipling had not yet preempted the field of India for fiction, and there was, moreover, a certain mingling of poetry and cynicism, of mature experience and youthful enthusiasm, that went well with the strange theme and the vivid coloring. And one may seriously question whether any single volume written by Marion Crawford in the height of his powers could have duplicated the success of Mr. Isaacs if put forth as the first novel of an unknown author. Dr. Claudius, which followed Mr. Isaacs within the year, may well be passed over with the comment that for a book so badly handicapped, the wonder was that it succeeded at all. As has very truly been said, a learned Heidelberg, Ph.D., however sentimental and yellow-bearded, is a less attractive conception than a youthful and pure-blooded Iranian adventurer whose glowing eyes outshine his jewels. Yet, but for the caprice of fate, it might have been known to the world as Mr. Crawford's first book for it had been in the hands of the publishers many months before Mr. Isaacs was issued. Of the books which followed, at an average rate of two volumes a year, a Roman singer was notable for that extreme simplicity of style which has since become one of Mr. Crawford's most effective assets. Marzio's Crucifix, as representing a long step forward in the technique of unity of plot, Khaled as the most effective and artistic of all the author's purely fanciful efforts. But the volumes which it seems worth while to single out for more detailed comment are The Three Fates, 
A Cigarette Maker's Romance, and the Saracinesca Trilogy. It is a curious and unexplained fact that when the topic of Mr. Crawford's novels comes up in a company of fairly well-read men and women, and they have all expressed a more or less intelligent opinion about the Ralstons and Don Orsino and Fair Margaret, if you then make mention of the three fates, you are likely to find that no one present has read the book, nor one in ten even heard of it. Yet it is easily the best of Mr. Crawford's New York stories. It is simply not in the same class with Catherine Lauderdale and Marion Darsh. The people in it are all thoroughly alive. At times they tempt one to say that they are the most intensely alive of any characters Mr. Crawford has ever drawn. The principal figure is a young and struggling author, making the rounds of New York publishing houses and striving to win a hearing for his first novel. It takes no very profound intuition to guess that there is a modicum of autobiography worked into the pages of The Three Fates, and its author makes no attempt to deny it. If Mr. Crawford was asked which of his American stories he personally liked best, this is the one that he was almost sure to name. Adding, with a reminiscent sigh of mingled satisfaction and regret, The fact is, I put a great deal of myself into The Three Fates. The personal touch is, of course, an all-sufficient reason to explain the author's preference, but a critic's choice should rest on a sounder basis. And in this case, such a basis is to be found in the rather exceptional study it contains of some phases of love where both the man and the women are quite young. The emotions of mature men and women are comparatively easy to chronicle. They know life too well to jeopardize their happiness with imaginary woes but the very young are prone to magnify their troubles and their grievances, to torture themselves over trivial faults and absurd scruples, which are, of course, for the time being as vital and momentous to them as profounder trials are to those of riper years. And the task of interpreting these youthful crises with sympathetic understanding and a touch of indulgent irony is one which just a few novelists successfully achieve. One recalls especially certain chapters in William Black's Madcap Violet and Mr. Howell's April Hopes, and to these may be added The Three Fates. As in several of Mr. Crawford's earlier volumes, the construction is faulty. There is no clear-cut central theme. The most that can be said for the plot is that the author has sought to show how a young man of keenly sensitive artistic temperament may, in those vital formative years when his life's career is just opening before him, find his ideals of womanhood so subtly and yet so radically modified that in a comparatively brief space he has been able to love tenderly and sincerely three different women and to receive from each in turn a permanent impression, a modification of his character which time will only strengthen. And yet, as the first and the second successfully withdraw themselves from his life, he knows that there can be no going back, even should they so elect. They have been very dear to him, they have each played the part of one of the fates in his life, yet there is no resurrection for the emotions which are dead. And at the end of the story the man, sobered by sorrow and toil and hard-won achievement, even more than by the sudden and unforeseen responsibility of great wealth, hesitates to put to the test the last of his three fates. He knows that this time there is no question of a transitory passion, but rather the deep, lasting love of mature manhood. This third woman means so much in his life that even her friendship is a precious thing, which he fears to jeopardize by speaking prematurely. This denouement of the three fates is one of the most artistic and felicitous single touches to be found in Mr. Crawford's writings. We know that the third and greatest opportunity is merely deferred, not lost. Yet the contrast between the boy's precipitancy and the man's delay is the best measure of the difference in kind as well as in degree between the earlier and the later love. It is customary to regard the cycle of Italian novels, beginning with the Saracinesca trilogy and continued in Corleone and Taquisera, as the strongest and most finished work that the author of A Roman Singer has produced. This, however, is not the view held by those critics who have made the most careful study of his novels, nor is it the view held by Mr. Crawford himself. Indeed, he has sometimes expressed a doubt whether on the whole his Italian stories have not been more of a detriment to him than a help. The public seemed to expect them of him, he explains, and so confined his activity to that particular field when he would much rather have directed it elsewhere. 
of these italian books as a whole it may be said that they have at least the merit of presenting to english readers a comprehensive picture of social life in italy such as cannot be found elsewhere in english fiction the fact that mr crawford was born in rome and spent much of his early life there and that later he deliberately elected to make italy his permanent home placed him in a position to write from the standpoint of a native in fact he is on firmer ground and writes with a more assured knowledge when the scene is laid in rome than when the action takes place in boston or new york nevertheless while they are his most ambitious efforts even the best of them even saracinesca and sant'elario have not the artistic charm and unity possessed by several slighter works and the reason is not hard to find saracinesca and its sequels belong to the type best defined as the epic novel the type wherein a great social movement a moral or political revolution drawing to a climax serves as the background of the story while the destiny of some special group some single family some individual man or woman closely interwoven with the progress of the general movement forms the central thread of the plot the focus of interest at first sight saracinesca seems to fulfil the conditions of the epic novel the setting is rome on the eve of the downfall of the pope's temporal power and the achievement of a united italy and the central thread concerns itself with the fortunes of a single family the saracinesca proud conservative loyal adherents of the church yet when we study the book's construction a little closer we realize that the relation between the general and the specific theme is of the most perfunctory sort the historical background is admirable as a piece of verbal painting it shows on the surface the days of careful study which its author acknowledges that he wrought into its construction but it fails to be properly speaking an epic novel because there is no close and necessary connection between the historical movement then going on in italy and the private drama of the saracinesca family take any one of the big unmistakably epic novels whether it be uncle tom's cabin or zola's l'assommoir the epic of slavery or of intemperance you will find the central theme inseparably interwoven with the general the fate of uncle tom symbolic of the slave system the fate of gervaise symbolic of the demon of alcohol in saracinesca and saint hilario there is no such close connection no central symbol nor did mr crawford intend that there should be for the symbolic novel is next of kin to the purpose novel it teaches and preaches and does other kindred things which conflict with the creed which mr crawford professed nevertheless oddly enough don orsino much inferior to its predecessors in human interest is in point of structure much more logical and correct in fact it may be called an epic of the era of disastrous building speculation in rome and the fact that don orsino's fortunes were closely entangled in the general panic which resulted gives us the connection between the general and the special motif which this type of novel demands in point of form however mr crawford has never done anything more perfect than a cigarette maker's romance in dimensions it is a rather long novelette in structure it obeys the rules of the short story rather than those of the novel it contains no superfluous character or incident and its time of action is confined within a space of thirty-six hours it seems worth while even at the risk of repeating what must already be familiar to a majority of mr crawford's readers to run over briefly the substance of this little masterpiece count scariatin a russian of noble birth who has quarrelled with his father and has been disowned is eking out a pitiful living by rolling cigarettes for a thrifty munich tobacconist disappointment and privation have so preyed upon his mind that he has become affected with a periodic delusion that a letter has come from russia restoring him to his lost position and that messengers from his family will visit him on the morrow once a week under the spell of this delusion he absents himself from the tobacco shop and waits in confidence all day only to awaken when the clock tolls midnight to a shuddering realization of his abnormal condition on the particular night when the story opens count scariatin's periodic delusion is just coming upon him once again he tells his employer the familiar story of the letter from russia the friends who will come to-morrow the necessity of his bidding the tobacconist good-bye the tobacconist's wife who refuses to believe any part of the count's story or even that he is a count at all rudely breaks in upon him with a claim for money the value of a stolen mechanical figure 
a Viennese giggle, for the loss of which the Count is in reality not responsible. Incensed, however, by the woman's attitude and relying upon the visionary fortune which he expects upon the morrow, Count Scariatine rashly gives his word of honor that the value of the giguerre shall be paid within twenty-four hours. The next day runs its usual course, and the evening finds the Count slowly struggling to a consciousness that not only have his friends failed to come, but that he has pledged his honor to pay a sum of money which he does not possess, and has no hope of raising in time and that he is not willing to live dishonored. The rest of the story tells how Viera, the humble Russian girl who day after day has rolled cigarettes side by side with the Count and learned to love him with dumb hopelessness, discovers his desperate need and comes to his aid. How the Count, under the spell of his temporary insanity, declares his love for her and makes extravagant promises of the wonderful things he will do for her as soon as his estates are restored to him how she raises the money needed to save his honor, and how, finally, when on the morrow the Count returns as usual to his bench, and the friends he has so long awaited actually do arrive and bring him word that he is sole heir to his father's wealth, he presents to them the humble little cigarette-maker as the future Countess Scariatine. Quote, I had contracted a debt of honor, and I had nothing wherewith to pay it. There was but an hour left, an hour, and then my life and my honor would have gone together. She saved me, gentlemen. She cut off her beautiful hair from her head and sold it for me. But that is not the reason why she is to be my wife. There is a better reason than that. I love her, gentlemen, with all my heart and soul, and she has told me that she loves me. It is in passages such as this that we get the key to Mr. Crawford's perennial hold upon the hearts of his readers. His real strength lies not in his mastery of technique or his originality of plot, but in his ability to picture for us honest gentlemen and noble women, whom we are the better for having known if only through the medium of the printed page. If there is room for choice, his men are better than his women, more finely drawn, with subtler understanding. There is a long list of them whom you cannot forget even if you would. Even in Saracinesca alone there are a whole group whom it is a joy to remember." old Saracinesca, with his chronic fondness for quarrelling with his well-loved son, the melancholy Spica, whose fame in duels made him a memento mori wherever he went. Even Astradente, the worn-out old dandy, shows at the last certain fine instincts which make us glad of the privilege of having known him. It is doubtful whether any of the novelists who are writing today have given the world so many characters whom the average reader will remember with pleasure and years afterwards recall by name. What place will be ultimately assigned to Mr. Crawford in the history of fiction it is somewhat early to predict. Excepting, as a conservative force, it is doubtful whether he has influenced the formal development of the modern novel in any important degree. In a history of technique, he could not be cited in the way that Henry James or Emile Zola must be cited over and over again, as the inventor of a peculiar manner or the founder of a new school. Writers of a more striking and flamboyant type leave a trail behind them as conspicuous as the tail of a comet. Gabriel D'Annunzio, for instance, from the moment that he sprang into public notice, radiated a clear and ever-widening circle of influence, the effects of which can be easily traced by anyone who cares to take the trouble, in the younger generation of continental writers. His imitators are as conspicuous as they would be if he had chosen to wear a scarlet necktie and they had chosen to copy him in that. It would be difficult to imagine Marion Crawford ever having done anything in a literary way, sufficiently flaunting to warrant the symbolism of a red necktie. He remained from first to last as he wished to remain, wholly free from mannerism. And one of the qualities which give to his books an unconscious charm is a simplicity of style and method which may be compared to that rare good taste in dress which does not draw attention to itself. It has sometimes been claimed that Mr. Crawford was in a measure responsible for the modern spread of cosmopolitanism in fiction. But at best it must have been a remote influence, since his was that of that rare and perfect kind that few others possess the skill to imitate. We have, of course, a surfeit of novelists who choose to lay their scenes all the way around the world and back again. And while they lead us on a gay chase across three continents, their point of view all the time remains insularly British or aggressively American. With this type of pseudo-cosmopolitanism, that of Mr. Crawford has nothing in common. 
It has often been said of him that he was one of the very few Americans who had been mistaken in Paris for a Frenchman, in Munich for a German, and in Rome for an Italian. And this power of assimilating racial traits and standpoints he carried over into his novels. He was not so much a cosmopolitan in the sense of a man whose home is the world, as he was a man who has chanced to have a succession of different homes in widely scattered portions of the globe. His fondness for the cities where he successively stayed and worked, for Munich and Prague, Constantinople and Rome and Paris, always gets into his pages in spite of him, and passes on something of its contagion to the reader from between the lines. It is distinctly worth noting that he has always from choice written of what was near at hand. Mr. Isaacs, his first book, it is true, was written after his return to America, but before the first intensity of his impressions had begun to fade. And it is significant that, although he had a rich store of material as a result of his two years' residence in India, he never again reverted to it. There was in particular one story, drawn from the earlier life of the man who served as prototype of Mr. Isaacs, which Mr. Crawford had mapped out and, even so recently as two years before his death, still talked of writing. But it was one of the books destined to remain unwritten. Yet, whatever other influence Marion Crawford may have exerted, it is at least beyond question that few novelists of the present day have been more widely read or have had a more salutary effect in fostering a taste for what is clean and pure and high-minded in literature and in life. He has shown that it is possible to win and hold a very wide public while maintaining a certain high standard of literary quality. He has shown that it is possible to offer social and domestic problems that will appeal to mature and thoughtful readers, and at the same time contain nothing which one might hesitate to put into the hands of the young and thoughtless. He has set in these respects a sort of high water mark for fiction, which frankly and honestly professes only to entertain, and in doing this he is largely responsible for the increased proportion of clean, healthy, vigorous fiction that our younger writers are giving us today. Nevertheless, he occupies a position somewhat apart from the general trend of the novel of today and of tomorrow, and for that reason he is somewhat difficult to class. Almost any comparison that one ventures to make is likely to strike a majority of readers as odd and unjustified. Recently, one of the English reviews spoke of him as approaching most nearly to Trollope and Mrs. Oliphant, a curious partnership which the writer wisely did not try to justify. In purpose and ideals, as well as in the uniformly readable quality of his books, he suggests a certain kinship with the late William Black. Yet of the two, Mr. Crawford is undeniably the finer artist, as well as the better storyteller, with a far better chance of being remembered by a later generation. And whatever position is ultimately assigned to him, one thing is certain, that the general tendency of academic criticism will be to do him ampler justice and concede to him a higher meed of praise than he has hitherto received. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 2. Kate Douglas Wiggin Kate Douglas Wiggin is one of those rare and delightful spirits in modern literature who, by a certain quiet charm of their own, have freed themselves from most of the trammels of form and tradition to which more ordinary writers are subject, who, even in doing quite ordinary things, do them in an extraordinary way, who in all they do are in themselves, their personality, their attitudes toward life, their own best excuse for so doing, and who, when they happen to fit in most appropriately to a particular scheme of things, as, for instance, Kate Douglas Wiggin herself fits into a volume upon American storytellers, do so with a unique appropriateness. Ordinarily, the qualities or the demerits of a literary production are matters to be determined quite aside from an author's personality, the place and hour of his or her birth, the inches of his or her stature, and all the other little details of a personal or domestic nature into which, after our modern habit, we are forever too closely inquiring. In the present case, however, there are just a few facts that are worth putting briefly before us at the start in order to understand more clearly this particular author's sources of inspiration, range of interests, and limitations of experience. That she was born in Philadelphia. That she lived throughout her girlhood in the midst of the peaceful beauty of rural New England. That at the age of eighteen, after her stepfather's failing health had made a removal to California imperative, 
she joined her family at Santa Barbara immediately after her graduation from the Abbott Academy at Andover. That she has been twice married, the second time to Mr. George C. Riggs in 1895, although she continues to use her earlier name as the signature of her literary productions. That it was directly through her efforts that the first free kindergartens for poor children were organized in this country, and that for the past twenty-five years she has been prominently associated in many an administrative capacity with important educational movements. These facts concern us for our present purpose only to the extent to which they explain why her writings are what they are, and why they could not well have been otherwise. A single sentence will serve to make this clear. Kate Douglas Wiggin is at heart a romanticist whose romance is woven not from the stuff that dreams are made of, but from the homespun threads of everyday life. She has an exuberant and unquenchable spirit of optimism, of the sort that bubbles up spontaneously at the most unlikely moments, casting a dash of cold across her pages, just at the point where the shadows seem to lie heaviest. She reaches the heart, and she appeals to the memory because she has in abundance this power of making very ordinary lives seem beautiful, because she writes only of the life that she has seen, and because, from the first story that she wrote up to the most recent, she has always preserved the clear directness of narration, the unaffectedness of form that are the qualities inborn in anyone who hopes to interest a youthful audience, to hold bright, eager little faces under the spell of a spoken tale. A glance down the list of Kate Douglas Wiggins' writings in any one of her recent volumes reveals upward of a score of titles, and these are exclusive of the educational books and the various collections of children's stories that she has compiled and edited in conjunction with her sister, Nora Archibald Smith. It would seem at a glance that Mrs. Wiggin had a rare fertility of imagination, a wide range of interests and an unusual power of productiveness. But a little closer examination shows that such variety and range as she achieves are produced from very simple and limited materials like melodies of much depth and tenderness played on only one or two strings. The settings of her stories are of three types. The California of her early memories, based on those two years in Santa Barbara. The rural New England of her entire girlhood, which she has somewhat described as all the years that count most. And the British Isles, which have given her, probably because she came to them later in the full maturity of her receptive powers, a broader horizon and a keener intellectual stimulus than either of her other settings. She has said of herself that the more familiarity she has with a subject, the less she desires to write about it, because exact knowledge hampers one's imagination sometimes. In this respect, almost any one of Mrs. Wiggins' admirers will take the liberty of telling her that she is in a measure mistaken. It is only that saving sometimes at the tail end of the sentence that keeps her from being very far astray. It is her perfect familiarity with the New England fields and woods, the New England ways of speech and dress and thought, the New England types of men and women and children, the types of children above all things, that is the golden key to the success of such books as Timothy's Quest and Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Nor has her familiarity with these subjects made her one whit the less eager to revert to them. New England is her chosen field, and she goes back to it again and again with no visible diminution of interest or power. On the other hand, it is quite easy to see how the stimulus of foreign scenes of the kind that produced the Penelope series might grow dull as their familiarity increased. The whole point to Penelope's experiences, as to Mark Twain's Innocence Abroad, was the first sharp imprint of the unfamiliar, the incisive force of contrast, and, of course, each subsequent impression was bound to become less keen, like the duller mintings of a coin as the dye begins to wear smooth. Details of this sort, however, will be seen more clearly when we come to take up her separate works for discussion. For the moment, let us consider frankly what her standards are as a writer of fiction, what ideas she has of form and of technique, what plan she seems to make for telling her stories, and to what extent she succeeds in building them according to the accepted rules. In this connection, it seems worth while to quote a passage of reminiscences by her sister, Nora Archibald Smith giving a rather graphic glimpse of what sort of a child it was that was destined to grow into the woman who to this day has preserved such a rare insight into the hearts of the children both of real life and of her dreams. The passage in question may have been widely circulated, or it may not. It may form part of a preface to some volume already in its many thousands, or it may be an extract from a private letter. 
In any case, the present writer ran across it for the first time in a recent article by Ashley Gibson, published in the London Bookman. Quote, my sister was certainly a capable little person at a tender age, concocting delectable milk toast, browning toothsome buckwheats, and generally making a very good parent's assistant. I have also visions of her toiling at patchwork and overseeing sheets like a nice old-fashioned little girl in a storybook. Further, to illustrate her personality, I think no one much in her company at any age could have failed to note an exceedingly lively tongue and a general air of executive ability. If I am to be truthful, I must say that I recall few indications of budding authorship, save an engrossing diary, kept for six months only, and a devotion to reading. Her literary passions were the Arabian Nights, Scottish Chiefs, Don Quixote, Thaddeus of Warsaw, Irving's Mahomet, Thackeray Snobs, Undine, and the Martyrs of Spain. These and others joined to an old green Shakespeare and a plum pudding edition of Dickens were the chief of her diet. For our immediate purpose, the center of interest in the above passage lies, of course, in the list of favorite books. What a splendid stimulus they are, one and all of them, to the young imagination, and how superbly defiant of the trammels of modern technique. Who in the world of his reading had been limited to these books, even though they include such gems as The Christmas Carol and Undine and The Forty Thieves, would ever dream even remotely? of the modern short story form with its insistence on unity of effect and economy of means. And this is an excellent place at which to say that had no one seen fit to betray what Kate Douglas Wiggin's early reading included, it would have been a safe venture to make up from pure conjecture very nearly the same sort of list. In the case of an author who combines so many merits with so few defects, there can be no harm in saying quite bluntly that however much or little she may know of the accepted rules of story structure, she deliberately and blandly ignores them wherever she sees fit. And to a critic who rates the importance of technique of form rather highly, it is almost exasperating to find how frequently she justifies herself, and by breaking the rules secures an effect that could not have been gained by adhering to them. She seldom knows when she has reached the end of a story. She almost always stops too soon or else not soon enough. That is, if you are judging her stories by the ordinary tests. But that is precisely what nobody wants to do. If she stops too soon, no one ever thinks of saying to her, This is inartistic and unfinished. Not at all. They simply emulate Oliver Twist and cry for more. If she fails to notice when the end of a story is reached and goes steadily onward with that unflagging power of invention, that felicitous mimicry of human types, that sparkle and sunshine of hope and faith, no one would ever think of stopping her, of saying, you have gone beyond your goal. You ought to have turned in at the gate. They are only too glad that she forgot to turn in. Now all this is as it is for the very simple and sufficient reason that with Kate Douglas Wiggin, just as with a few other big-hearted, clear-sighted writers, whose purposes are very simple and few and worthy, the substance is so vastly more important than the form, or rather, I ought to say, than somebody else's dictum of what the form ought to be. Kate Douglas Wiggin is in a measure an anomaly in American letters, being on the one hand so peculiarly native and even local that one feels it would be possible to pick out the particular habitation of her childhood simply by strolling through New England byways until one happened upon it, and yet on the other, so cosmopolitan that she has been frankly recognized in England by more than one critic as our leading writer of her sex, with just one possible rival, Mrs. Wilkins Freeman. And while she has that high standard of good taste in letters that makes her next of kin to Agnes Replier, is this, by the way, a mark of sisterhood due to her Philadelphia birth? She nevertheless has achieved that approval of democracy so conclusively and substantially attested by sales that reached the 200,000 mark. Now, the easiest way to understand all this, the easiest way to explain why her books are what they are, and not something altogether different, is to remember that before she was known as a writer she was a master hand at kindergarten work. She knew how to hold the attention of children. She knew the way which for her was the best, the inevitable way to tell a story to children. And all the stories that she has told, and all the stories she has printed have owed their power and their charm to that pervading simplicity and sincerity and naive literalness that made her success as a teacher of children. And it is precisely in the spirit of childhood that the public has received her books. 
whether she writes of the simple-hearted Rebecca or the cosmopolitan and sophisticated Penelope, there is the same clamorous demand for more, a demand which, like all good-natured storytellers, she does her best to gratify. And because they are all imbued with a simple, unaffected kindergarten spirit, the public receives them with the uncritical mind of childhood, closing its eyes to the fact that the further adventures of Rebecca are not quite as good as the earlier, and that the experiences of Penelope in Ireland and Scotland lack something of the freshness of her first months in England. How many times we have heard children clamoring for just one more story! And the tired storyteller says doubtfully, but I don't know any more stories. I haven't any good ones left. And the children answer, We don't care. Tell us anything. Anything so long as it is a story and you tell it. That, in brief, is the public's attitude toward Kate Douglas Wiggin, tacitly expressed by the popularity of each new book. And after all, an author can hardly have a higher order of praise than this public testimony that her worst is preferable to many other authors' best. The writings of Kate Douglas Wiggin fall of their own accord into three classes, one of which, the purely educational, written in collaboration, such as Freebold's Gifts and Kindergarten Principles and Practice, does not concern us here. The other two groups are, first, the bulk of her writings, being stories dealing more or less directly with the life problems of children, and so written that they appeal almost equally to the child reader and to the man or woman who has preserved, even though pretty deeply buried, some smoldering embers of the childhood spirit. And secondly, a group of books much harder to characterize because they are not, on the one hand, novels, nor, on the other, can they fairly be called inspired guidebooks. And yet, unless they are to be recognized as in some proportion a blending of these two, there is no other existing classification for them. The childhood stories begin as far back as 1888 with The Bird's Christmas Carol a simple, tender, whimsical Christmas tale that has quite justly come to be already a sort of children's classic. Then followed in swift succession the story of Patsy, a summer in a canyon, one of the few books due to her Santa Barbara memories, and in 1890, Timothy's Quest. This volume is worthwhile pausing over for a moment, not only because it is an excellent prototype of the bulk of Mrs. Wiggin's works, but because it helps us to see how limited in their variety are the threads with which she weaves and the patterns that she chooses to make. Timothy is a lad of ten or eleven. Foundling asylums are not over-accurate in their records. Lady Gay, his protégé, is an exceedingly pretty child of possibly eighteen months or more. Certain people have seen fit to pay periodic sums for the support of these two waifs to a bedraggled and drunken hag named Flossie in a reeking slum known as Minerva Court for the simple reason that so far as the writer is aware, this is the one time in all Mrs. Wiggins' fiction where she has permitted herself to picture a slum, it is worth while to quote briefly from her description of Minerva Court. Had she chosen to do so, she might not ineffectively have rivaled the squalor and repulsiveness of Arthur Morrison's Tales of Mean Streets. Quote, Children carrying pitchers of beer were often to be seen hurrying to and fro on their miserable errand. There were frowsy, sleepy-looking women hanging out of their windows, gossiping with their equally unkempt and haggard neighbors. Apathetic men sitting on the doorsteps, in their shirt-sleeves smoking. A dull, dirty baby disporting itself in the gutter, while the sound of a melancholy accordion, the chosen instrument of poverty and misery, floated from an upper chamber, and added its discordant might to the general desolation. The sidewalks had apparently never known the touch of a broom, and the middle of the street looked more like an elongated junk heap than anything else. That was Minerva Court, a little piece of your world, my world, God's world, and the devil's, lying peacefully fallow, awaiting the services of some inspired home missionary society. This paragraph is here set down chiefly for the sake of its contrast to all of Mrs. Wiggins' later methods and ideals. Not that she has ever lost her interest in the swarming life of big cities, the brilliant and the sordid alike. To realize this, one has only to read her account of Market Night in one of the Penelope chapters entitled Tuppenny Travels in London. Yet in that very chapter, she voices that prevailing spirit of her books, which insistently iterates that in a world where there is so much sunshine, it does not pay to look too closely into the shadows. Quote, as to the dark alleys and tenements on the fringe of this glare and brilliant confusion, 
this babble of sound and ant bed of moving life, one can only surmise and pity and shudder. Close one's eyes and ears to it a little, or one could never sleep for thinking of it, yet not too tightly, lest one sleep too soundly, and forget altogether the seamy side of things. But to go back to Timothy's quest, Flossie the hag has died, and the almshouse is the destined fate of Timothy and Lady Gay. But the instinct of chivalry and protection has awakened early in Timothy, and in obedience to this instinct he steals out into the night with the baby girl in his arms, and laboriously, doggedly, fearlessly makes his way far from the city hour by hour, mile after mile, till a beautiful, restful, eminently safe country house by the wayside appeals to him as the ideal spot where Lady Gay should find a home. The mere fact that this farmhouse is presided over by two mature spinsters who have never before in their lives had children around them is not a matter to daunt a valiant soul like Timothy's, nor disconcert a heaven-sent storyteller like Mrs. Wiggin. And, of course, Timothy triumphs gloriously in all his plans. The point that it seems worth while to make just here is that in this book, as in Polly Oliver's problem a little later, and still again in both of the Rebecca books, the underlying motive, the germ idea, as one may call it, is a sort of premature sense of responsibility, possessed by just a few children, an embryo foreshadowing of the father-love or mother-love which is to come later, that makes the Timothys and the Pollys and the Rebeccas of real life bend their fragile shoulders under burdens almost too heavy for their young strength. It would not be within the scope of the present essay to speak at any great length of Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. It has received, to be sure, quite triumphantly the popular vote. Its central character is the one that already enjoys the widest acquaintanceship, and now that she has come before the footlights, she is destined to a new and still wider fame. Rebecca is probably the volume by which the author will be most frequently measured in literary analyses, largely for the reason that it is the one by which she is most easily measured. If we make due allowance for the change in manners and ideals from decade to decade, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm appeals to the readers of today for much the same reasons and with much the same right that Miss Alcott's Little Woman appealed to an earlier generation, and Elizabeth Wetherill's Wide, Wide World to a generation still more remote. Indeed, if one shuts one's mind to the rather exasperating priggishness of that earlier period, the ubiquitous praying and psalm-singing and reading of scriptures, which in those days was an inseparable quality of all properly conducted little heroines, there is a good deal in the advent of Ellen Montgomery to her Aunt Fortune's farm, her sensitive shrinking from her aunt's rough ways and rougher tongue, her haven of refuge in the slow-spoken, slow-moving farmer, Mr. Van Brunt, and in general, the whole atmosphere behind the story of New England farm life, farm hardships and farm festivals. There is, it seems to me, in all this a great deal of the same sort of appeal as that which the present generation finds in Rebecca. But of course there is one rather important distinction. It was the habit in those days to look resignedly upon this world as a veil of tears to be passed through somehow as best one could, while to Kate Douglas Wiggin, and to one and all of her heroines, it is a supremely glorious thing just to be alive, and to smell the flowers and see the sunshine. And the author who can spread the contagion of such feeling among a few thousand of readers is a sort of inspired home missionary society in herself. One would like to have the space to say a few pleasant things about Rose o' the River, which is as tranquil and naive a little pastoral as a modern Daphnis and Chloe. The old Peabody Pew is another slim little volume, at least so far as its text goes. It is the ambition of the illustrator which has necessitated the wide page and ample margin that tempts one to bestow upon it a disproportionate amount of notice. Just the fulfillment of a long-cherished dream the final blossoming of a hope that had almost withered in the heart of a New England girl, now a girl no longer, who had seen the bright years slip away one by one while she waited, mutely, patiently, for the lover who had gone away to seek his fortune, the lover who through all these years had sent no word and to all appearances had forgotten her. It is a true Christmas story, bright with the spirit of hope and faith and love. And what is more, it is the best piece of fiction so far as pure structure goes that the author has ever put together. The second and last group into which Mrs. Wiggins' stories divide themselves are those of the scenes of which are enacted in the British Isles. As already intimated, they are of a more urbane, more sophisticated type, and appeal in consequence to a more special audience on both sides of the Atlantic. 
the first of the penelope books the one containing that delightfully independent and well-poised young woman's experiences in london and in rural england is easily the bright and shining gem of the collection the late mr lawrence hutton did not quite share this view to his enthusiastic appreciation any gradation of merit in the penelope books was not to be thought of her first course he once wrote served in england is as delicate and savoury as in her second course pervade in scotland while her third course now being dished up in ireland promises as well as did those which preceded it we can only hope before the symposium is brought to a close that she will regale us with whales as a salad and with the isle of man as a dessert now mr hutton's enthusiasm is easy not only to understand but to share those three volumes devoted to the confidential relations from the facile and diverting pen of miss penelope hazelton are surely to be numbered among that sadly small collection of modern volumes that people of real culture and intelligence find themselves from time to time reverting to for another and yet another perusal but to pronounce all three of them of equal merit is to proclaim one's own lack of discrimination it is the same sort of mental astigmatism as would prompt one to claim that there was no gradation of merit between the autocrat of the breakfast-table and its companion volumes devoted respectively to the professor and the poet as there is much to be said in the praise of the penelope books it is well to begin with what little there is to be said against them and to have it over with kate douglas wiggin it may be noted parenthetically never attempted a regularly constructed full-length novel penelope is her nearest approach to a regulation heroine and that simplicity of structural form that tendency to harp upon just one or two strings which pervades all her other works is equally in evidence here let us analyze quite briefly and without malice these three volumes which for convenience sake we may christen the trilogy of the rose the heather and the shamrock first in penelope's experiences in england we are introduced to that perennially delightful trio penelope herself and her two travelling companions francesca and salomina offering an infinite variety in feminine moods temperaments personal appearance and age whether regarded as a guide-book as a picaresco novel of the gentler sex as a summer idol or just as a miscellany of feminine cleverness the book is a delight but any one who wishes to epitomize the plot finds himself reduced to something like the following a young american woman charming but fancy free finds it a pleasant summer's pastime to be made love to intermittently by a young man very much in earnest amid the picturesque surroundings of english byways and hedges churches and ruined castles then comes a weary interregnum during which the suitor is detained elsewhere a little loneliness teaches her what she ought to have known all the time and prepares her to give him the right sort of a welcome when he at last comes back to claim her the experiences in scotland simply shift the limelight from penelope to francesca a charming and unattached young woman finds it pleasant to be wooed amid the scotch heather by an earnest young minister of the established church but she too remains somewhat uncertain of her own mind until a few weeks separation gives him a chance to come and play the conquering hero the experiences in ireland are again the same tune in a new key with salomina as the light motif salomina is not exactly young though still undeniably charming and not strictly unattached because many years ago she loved an irishman who inconsiderately married some one else but is now a widower she in her turn finds it pleasurably romantic to be courted in a reserved middle-aged fashion amid the irish lakes the bogs of lisconnel and the glens of antrim she too finds a brief loneliness salutary and is quite prepared to signify a cordial assent just as soon as the irishman vouchsafes her a second chance such at least is the summary which an unfriendly critic might give if he felt in a carping mood there is a rather obvious duplication of plot running through these books which after all is a better and franker thing than an artificial attempt at variations when the author knows and the reader knows and the author knows that the reader knows that the plot is only a makeshift at best something to carry the real vital substance of the book and every bit as conventional as a blue muslin rose or a cigar store indian the real charm and magnetism of these penelope books depend of course upon their personal equation 
Mrs. Wiggin chose for her purpose the freest, most elastic vehicle that she could find for conveying her exceedingly subtle and equally frank observations of such points of difference as must inevitably strike the cultured and well-bred American visitor to the British Isles. That she has done this thing with rare tact is best evidenced by the fact that the English enjoy the cleverness of her attack quite as much as we do ourselves, and that such a paper as The Spectator genially remarks that she is the most successful ambassador that the United States has yet sent to England. The Penelope books are a part of the mental equipment that the American visitor to the British Isles will do well to provide himself with upon his first visit in precisely the same way that on his first trip down the Thames he will read Jerome K. Jerome's Three Men in a Boat, or William Black's Strange Adventures of a Houseboat, and on reaching Florence or Rome will wish to refresh his memory of Romola or the Marble Fawn. And yet there is a certain inevitable compunction that follows even a suggestion that the romance of these Penelope books is perfunctory. One feels, somehow, that the author's eyes would follow one with a haunting disapproval because to her the world is obviously made up of romance. She cannot help it. She is so constituted, and thank heaven that she is, because there are so lamentably few writers today in whom sunshine and bright hopefulness and the joy of living are incarnated. And among these, Kate Douglas Wiggin holds a privileged place. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Three, Winston Churchill. If there is any one writer among the American storytellers of today who best illustrates the familiar paradox that genius is a capacity for taking infinite pains, that writer is Mr. Winston Churchill. That his novels are born of an inexhaustible patience a dogged determination to be true to his own stern exactions both in style and substance, is a self-evident fact. It is not necessary to know the prosaic details of his literary methods, or even to remember that he considers three or four years none too long a time to bestow upon a single volume. Such matters do not concern the critic, excepting in so far as they stand revealed by internal evidence, and in the case of Mr. Churchill they are woven into the very warp and woof of every page he writes. There is no escape from the pervading sense of careful documentation, plodding diligence, endless repolishing. It is impossible to read a single chapter without being aware that its production involved a labor not unlike the slow process of chipping away fragment by fragment, grain by grain, the enveloping marble from the emerging statue, and no small share of that labor is expended in covering its own traces. The net result is that from Richard Carville to a modern chronicle, these novels present themselves to the public with an air of solid dignity and conscious worth that involuntarily calls to mind portly, middle-aged, prosperous gentlemen in immaculate frock-coats, who typify the so-called pillars of the church. In other words, the sum and substance of all adverse criticism upon Mr. Winston Churchill's books may be reduced to this. There is in them all a streak of literary pharisaism, a certain air of seeming to thank God openly that they are not like other books. Let other books, if they choose, be frivolous or melodramatic, or ultra-modern according to any one of the fifty various and transitory schools of fiction that spring up and pass like mushrooms. Mr. Churchill's books desire no kinship with such as these. They aspire to be literature, spelled with a capital L. They are carefully fashioned upon the great mid-Victorian models. One almost questions whether the author did not deliberately draw his dividing line at Thackeray and refused to regard any subsequent developments of technique in fiction as deserving of notice. The consequence is that in his method of construction, Mr. Churchill has retained the chief faults of his early models as well as the qualities that he has sought to emulate. The conception of a well-knit plot without irrelevant characters and episodes, and with the interest strongly focused upon some one main issue is distinctly modern. So also is the instinct which tells an author at what point in the infinite sequence of human events his special series of episodes logically begins and at what point it ends. The naive assumption of the earlier novelists that a story begins with the birth of a particular man or woman has long since become an exploded fallacy. The writers of today recognize that in its broadest sense the life story of any human being has already begun unnumbered generations before his birth 
and that its end is not within the powers of human foresight to predict. While in a narrower sense, the history of a human life cannot in itself constitute a story structure, but is at best the raw material for several stories. Now, when an author chooses to follow the old-fashioned method of introducing his characters practically in their cradles, and following their subsequent development step by step and year by year, well into the prime of life, it is too much to ask of him that he shall give us a well-constructed plot. Indeed, the form itself warns us that he is attempting nothing more complex than a family chronicle, and therefore necessarily of a loose and rambling nature. As a matter of fact, Mr. Churchill's plots are not his strong point. As we shall see in taking up the separate volumes, they give the impression of wandering aimlessly along the highways and byways of life, most of the time with no clear structural reason for turning to the right rather than the left, no preconceived goal toward which the various tangled threads of the story are converging. Now, there is no intention of conveying the idea that Mr. Churchill is unaware of what he is doing. On the contrary, nothing is clearer than the fact that he knows perfectly well the sort of plot structure that he is using, and that he could have used quite a different kind had he so chosen. His method is the time-honored method of Fielding and of Thackeray, and to some extent of Dickens. Like Thackeray, he chooses to think of himself as master of the show, and to keep us reminded that it is he who pulls the wires that make the puppets dance. He even interrupts himself occasionally to regret, between parentheses, that the space limit of his book will not let him tell us more about some particular character whom he has just introduced, but assures us that we shall meet that character again in a later volume. Mr. Churchill likes to do this sort of thing, and the mere fact that the whole tendency of fiction today is toward the objective method, and away from the old-fashioned, confidential relation between author and public obviously does not concern him in the least. After all, it is a sufficiently harmless mannerism, but nonetheless as out of date as powdered wigs and knee breeches. The practice of chronicling the childhood of hero or heroine calls for rather more specific notice. There is, of course, only one ground on which it may be defended, just as there is only one ground on which to defend the analogous practice of narrating the family history of the hero's ancestors for several generations back. If we grant that human character is the result of heredity modified by environment, then, of course, a knowledge of a man's ancestry explains his inherited traits, and a knowledge of his early surroundings shows how those traits have become modified. But now and then we find a man or woman in whom heredity has had a free hand, and environment has accomplished little or nothing. We realize that it would have made small practical difference in which hemisphere they had been reared, or what manner of guardians and teachers they had had. The strong, primitive impulses and passions of their race, whether for good or bad, are no more to be curbed or changed by food or climate or higher mathematics than the color of their hair and eyes. When dealing with such strongly defined characters, it is simply a waste of time to picture minutely the influences to which their childhood was subjected. Mr. Churchill's heroes and heroines belong with hardly an exception to this dominant self-sufficient class. Even as small children, they have a precocious assurance. They foreshadow, with surprising accuracy, the men and women they are destined to become. It is true that Mr. Churchill's portraiture of childhood is rather well done. He allows himself in these portions to fall into a lighter vein. He comes nearer than anywhere else to genuine humor. Nevertheless, the impression he leaves in one and all of his books is that his characters have become what they are, not because of environment, but in defiance of it and for that reason the introductory chapters of each book are structurally superfluous. The foregoing remarks, however, apply only so long as we are considering Mr. Churchill's books as studies of human character. But it must be remembered that a second, and in his eyes, an equally important function of his books is to picture the life of a period, the net results of national or social development. There can be no question that he has succeeded admirably in handling big backgrounds. Few American novelists have achieved as he has that sense of wide spaces of earth and sky, the weariness of dragging miles, the monotony of passing years, the motley movements of humanity in the mass, the whole fundamental trick of making us feel the relative value of our own modest holdings, our individual interests, our brief hour as contrasted with mankind and with eternity. It makes small difference whether he is describing a drunken broil in a colonial tavern, an Indian massacre in Kentucky, or a political riot in a New England state legislature. 
In either case, his trick of characterization is as graphic and almost as indefatigable as that of a camera lens. You see face after face, figure behind figure, each drawn with fewer and swifter strokes as they become more blurred by distance, yet every one individualized and recognizable. And back of these, beyond the range of sight, you still feel the presence of a crowd, shoulder jostling shoulder, tongue answering tongue, full of the rough virility of conflict. Taken as a whole, with the exception of his earliest and latest, The Celebrity and a Modern Chronicle, Mr. Churchill's books may not unjustly be defined as comprehensive panoramas of American history, each standing as a vivid summing up of some national or local crisis. Regarding the literal accuracy of historical novels in general, and of Mr. Churchill's in particular, those critics may quibble to whom the letter seems more essential than the spirit. One cannot escape the conviction that the author of Richard Carville errs too far on the side of accuracy, that if his facts were questioned, he would be painfully prompt in producing original documents. Indeed, there are episodes in Richard Carville, and in The Crisis, and The Crossing as well, that narrowly escape the weariness of the historical monograph, and make one wish that the author had burned his library and relied upon the sheer force of his imagination. Les Trois Mousquetaires had a scant allowance of historical accuracy, but it had what was far more essential, a generous supply of real flesh and blood. And yet, any fair estimate of Mr. Churchill must necessarily recognize that his favorite formula narrowly misses that of the so-called epic novel, just as we have already seen that Marion Crawford missed it in his Saracenesca series. He uses, with conscious purpose, a double theme. First, the big basic idea underlying some national or ethical crisis. And secondly, a specific human story standing out vividly in the central focus with the larger, wider theme serving as background. Where his stories fail to achieve the epic magnitude is in lacking that essential symbolic relationship between the greater and the lesser theme. His central figures find their lives molded and modified, as all lives must be, by the conditions and the events of their own epoch. But they are scarcely symbolic of that epoch. They do not leave the impression that they are the mouthpiece of their country and generation. Thus, Richard Carville was, at best, an example of the colonial aristocracy, but he was not in character or career such an embodiment of it that the term a Richard Carville would have any real significance. David Ritchie, in The Crossing, is part and parcel of that movement which began the great western migration that was destined to stop only at the Pacific. But there is nothing in his life which in any way symbolizes a great awakening— he is of his time and generation because he has to be, rather than because he would not have had it otherwise if he could. It has seemed worth while briefly to point out in a general way the extent to which Mr. Churchill parts company with the modern trend of technique and fiction. To note these differences is by no means equivalent to passing censure upon them. By a stricter system of construction, a sterner elimination of non-essentials, it is quite possible that Mr. Churchill's novels would have lost as much as they would have gained. They would at least have lost one element which every reader of them must feel to a marked degree, namely, that sense of the unexpected and inexplicable, that infinitude of daily happenings, of accidents and coincidences, the meaning of which in the ultimate pattern of life must always baffle us. Aside from a short satiric play, The Title Mart, Mr. Churchill's published works now include seven volumes. Of these, the earliest in point of actual composition was Richard Carville, although its publication was anticipated by some months by the celebrity, a clever farce of the mistaken identity type, which served its purpose as a sort of comic poster to attract public attention to his more ambitious work. Of the remaining six that have since come, at almost uniform intervals from his pen, the earlier three, Richard Carville, The Crisis, and The Crossing are historical novels in the accepted sense. Coniston and Mr. Crewe's career, while presumably resting on an equally solid foundation of local history, fall into the class of the American political novel, with its unsavory accessories of bribery, lobbying, and bossism. The type familiarly exemplified in Paul Lester Ford's Honorable Peter Sterling and Bran Whitlock's 13th District. The last of the six, A Modern Chronicle, is a new departure for Mr. Churchill, being an ambitious study of American marriage and divorce and belonging in theme, if not in magnitude, on the shelf with Professor Robert Herrick's much discussed together. 
the statement was made earlier in this chapter that plot construction was Mr. Churchill's principal weakness, and the justness of this criticism may easily be seen by a brief examination of the separate stories. To begin with, Richard Carville concerns itself with the life history of an orphan boy in the province of Maryland, reared by his stern old grandfather in strict Tory principles, but little by little imbibing revolutionary doctrines from associates of his own generation. An unscrupulous uncle scheming for the family inheritance has young Carvel waylaid, kidnapped, and flung aboard a pirate craft, to be later dropped over the rail at a convenient time. The pirate boat, however, is scuttled by the famous naval hero John Paul Jones, and Carvel is the sole survivor. Subsequently, fate lands him in London, penniless and without friends, where he spends some weary months in the debtor's prison, knowing all the while that the girl whom he loved back in America is now also in London, courted by dukes and earls, and that his present predicament is known quite well to the girl's father, who is only too glad to have a troublesome suitor out of harm's way. The rest of the story consists of some swift changes of fortune, some well-drawn pictures of fashionable English life in which Horace Walpole, Charles James Fox, and other historic personages take part, a few stirring naval battles, and finally peace between the two countries and Carvel happily married and settled on his ancestral acres. It is to be noticed that this plot is merely a string of episodes governed for the most part by the intervention of chance. It is little more than a highly developed Picaresco type, with rather less cohesion than the average Dumas romance. Whatever literary quality it possesses is due not to plot, but to individual portraiture and a pervading sense of atmosphere. The specific story of David Ritchie in The Crossing has even less cohesion than Richard Carvel. Throughout the greater part of it, Ritchie is a mere lad and as drummer boy accompanies the expedition led by George Rogers Clark from Kentucky northward to the Wabash River and Vaisen. It is a chronicle of border warfare, of Indian treachery and ghastly massacres. It is scarcely fiction at all in the strict sense of the term, but rather a sort of pictorial history of the Clark expedition painted in vivid words. In the second half, the plot grows more cohesive. Ritchie, like Carvel, is an orphan with a worthless uncle, who, instead of befriending him, flees to England at the outbreak of the war. The uncle's wife takes advantage of her husband's desertion to elope with her lover, leaving a small son to shift for himself. This son, Richie's cousin, later makes it his chief object in life to hunt down his mother and her companion and inflict vengeance upon them. But long years pass before he finally, through Richie's intervention, finds her in New Orleans, dying of yellow fever, and is reconciled with her before her death. This, and the additional fact that Richie has found in New Orleans the young woman whom he is destined to marry, constitute all that is worth epitomizing in the way of a central plot. Now, it is the lot of a good many human beings, both in childhood and in later years, to drift along the stream of life, not shaping their own destinies, but allying them with the destinies of others. And it often happens that somewhere or other, in the course of such drifting, they meet a woman whom they wish to marry. It does not, however, usually occur to a novelist that this is the stuff of which books are made. Mr. Churchill's own explanation of the crossing is that it expresses, the first instinctive reaching out of an infant nation, which was one day to become a giant. In his opinion, no annals in the world's history are more wonderful than the story of the conquest of Kentucky and Tennessee by the pioneers. He confesses that it was a difficult task to gather together in a novel the elements necessary to picture this movement, that the autobiography of David Ritchie is as near as he can come to its solution, and that he has a great sense of its incompleteness. There is but one flaw in his self-criticism. The trouble with The Crossing is not that it lacks completeness, but that it fails to be a novel. Passing over the crisis, that story of the Civil War, which is at best a less vigorous repetition of the qualities and the shortcomings of Richard Carvel, we come to Coniston. This is a book which deserves rather careful consideration, not merely because it shows us people no longer through the veil of romantic glamour, but face to face but more especially because it is the one book he has yet written the plot of which will bear careful dissection. Coniston may not unfairly be called a prose epic of political corruption as it existed in New England a generation or more ago. From the critic's standpoint it is quite unimportant whether the particular state that the author had in mind happened to be Vermont or Connecticut or Rhode Island. What is important is that we get a sense of life and of conflict, 
of impulses to do right clashing with the instincts of self-protection, of a grim party battle for the political survival of the fittest and the entire state, its banks, its franchises, its governor, its legislature, all reposing in the pocket of one man, the undisputed party boss. This man, Jethro Bass, simple farmer by origin, taciturn, inscrutable, with his streak of sardonic humor, and his slight unforgettable stammer, is easily the most important single figure that Mr. Churchill has drawn. One might venture to predict the most important figure that he is destined ever to draw. Jethro Bass is not merely an individual. He is the concrete presentment of a type which, though well-nigh passed away, is destined to be remembered. It is not too much praise to say that in the annals of fiction a Jethro Bass deserves to stand for as definite a figure as a Pecksniff, a Micawber, or a Becky Sharp. A big vital political issue for a background, a unique and dominant figure for the central interest, are already two prime factors of an important novel. What binds the whole together and makes this volume, in contrast to all Mr. Churchill's others, a piece of good construction, is that the individual tragedy of the story grows out of the self-same source as the bigger issue, namely Jethro Bass's utter unscrupulousness. Like Mr. Churchill's other books, Coniston gives us the entire childhood of its heroine. In fact, it goes further than that and shows us the youth, the marriage and death of the heroine's mother but this time he has treacherously justified his method. The childhood of Cynthia Wetherell, under the guardianship of Jethro, is to be sure no more a study of character molded by environment than was the childhood of David Ritchie in The Crossing, or, as we shall presently see, the childhood of Honora Leffingwell in A Modern Chronicle. But it happens that in Coniston the focus of interest is not Cynthia Wetherell, but Jethro Bass and the story of her childhood serves a second and more important purpose as a masterly study of a man's slow transformation under the influence of affection and trust. Jethro Bass once hoped to marry Cynthia Wetherell's mother. At that time he was too young with a choice of ways before him. He chose then and there to take the first step toward the political conquest of his town, the first step toward the bossism of the whole state and the girl's clear, fearless eyes looking into his own read him aright, and knew there could be no happiness for her where there could not also be honor. Afterwards, when Jethro befriends the dead woman's orphan daughter, and sees in her those same clear, fearless eyes, his one great wish is that she may always be spared the knowledge of his knavery, the source of his wealth, the secret of his power. To the reader, all the undercurrents of dishonest politics are exposed, naked, and unashamed. Mr. Churchill has nowhere else approached than sheer narrative power the graphic vigor of the best scenes in this book. That, for instance, of the wonderful Woodchuck Session, in which the Truro franchise is jammed through the legislature by a bit of unparalleled trickery, and the equally remarkable interview with President Grant, in which Jethro saves the power almost wrested from him by forcing the appointment of his candidate for a second-class post office. Scenes like these are enough on which to build a reputation, they belong to the memorable situations in the annals of fiction. And the climax to which the story inevitably works up is a fitting conclusion to an exceptionally good piece of constructive craftsmanship. It happens that the life-happiness of Cynthia can be purchased by Jethro only at the price of his own political downfall. And this sacrifice he makes freely, gladly, secretly. To the world at large he is defeated and dethroned, a man who has outlived his usefulness. To Cynthia, he is not merely the source of happiness, but a man in whom her affection has worked a great and wonderful reformation. The climax of the book triumphantly achieves the double purpose of effecting a crisis equally momentous to the individuals of the central group and to the world at large that forms the story's background. It would be an anticlimax after Coniston to examine in detail Mr. Crewe's career, which treats of the same order of corruption in state politics, but deals with a later generation and in a spirit of lighter comedy. Accordingly, there remains only Mr. Churchill's new volume, A Modern Chronicle. Here, for the first time, the author ventures to make woman, the American woman of today, his central point of interest. It is rather remarkable that no one has taken the trouble to point out that in all his earlier books the portrayal of woman was one of Mr. Churchill's serious deficiencies. Even in his period of Romanticism, his men stood out strongly like living portraits, 
but his women have for the most part been mere conventional sketches, either quite colorless like Dorothy Manners in Richard Carville, or impossible symbols of all the virtues at once, like Cynthia Wetherell in Coniston. That is why it is such a surprising thing to find him giving us in Honora Leffingwell a woman who is really alive, a woman full of illogical moods and caprices, a woman who, take her from start to finish, is very nearly, although not quite, a consistent piece of characterization. It is rather exasperating to see by how narrow a margin Mr. Churchill missed doing a big piece of work in a modern chronicle. That he did miss so doing is due mainly to that inherent fault of his, the unwillingness or inability to construct carefully. Honora Leffingwell's story seems too largely a matter of the whims of chance to be of great significance to the world at large. Her childhood and youth are sketched at rather tedious length, with the net result that we know she almost, but not quite, made up her mind to marry Peter Irwin, the close companion of these early years. Subsequently, after a week's acquaintance, she consents to marry Howard Spence, portly, prosperous, and not too young, a typical modern businessman whose soul is in the money market and who, after marriage, does not realize that a wife needs an occasional word of appreciation. Honora naturally seeks attention elsewhere and finds it in Trixton Brent, who is an adept at making love to other men's wives. What saves her from Trixton Brent she never knows. His failure is not his fault. It is simply a matter of temperament. But when she meets Hugh Chiltern, with his personal charm and his unspeakable reputation, she ceases to have a will of her own. Being for the first time in his life seriously in love, he easily persuades her to break with her husband, go west into the exile of a divorce colony, and after the needful delay marry him. But her second marriage for love proves as big a failure as her first marriage for ambition, and when Chiltern rides a horse against which he has been warned and breaks his neck in consequence, the reader gives a sigh of relief. Then Peter Irwin, her childhood friend, drifts into view again, and we leave her on the brink of a third matrimonial experiment. Just a succession of episodes, you see, the story of a woman who does not know her own mind. The disillusion and unrest of the first marriage are good workmanship. So also are the dragging weariness and the heartache of that year in the divorce colony. But the book lacks finality. There is no good reason for supposing that the third marriage, the marriage of sympathy and pity, will turn out one whit better than the other two. Regarding Mr. Churchill's place in American fiction, it is possible to speak with more confidence than in the case of most of his contemporaries. That he has a widespread popularity is a fact that cannot be disregarded, and this popularity, instead of waning, has remained a constant quantity. He builds his books solidly, as one builds a house upon a rock with the intention that it shall not soon be torn down. He has, moreover, the advantage of a careful style and a scrupulous regard for truth. There are some of us who are inclined to feel that he has been taken rather too seriously by the present generation, in much the same way that Mrs. Humphrey Ward has been overrated by her contemporaries. Of the two writers, it seems a fairly safe prediction that Mr. Churchill has a rather better chance of maintaining his present level in the years to come. He is still young, and his later work shows a real gain in the knowledge of what fiction as a serious literary form should mean. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 4. Robert W. Chambers. There are certain novelists whose phenomenal popularity challenges us, almost like a blow in the face, and demands an explanation. Mr. Robert W. Chambers is a case in point. We have not at present a large number of writers who have made good their claim to a place among the born storytellers. But of these few, Mr. Chambers is one who, in the estimation of the big reading public, seems to have proved a clear title. For this reason, it is distinctly worth while to examine the work of Mr. Chambers with an unsparing frankness that would seem unkind to a writer of less popular favor, and to ask ourselves, without prejudice or illusion, just what he has succeeded in accomplishing, wherein he has fallen short of his early promise, and why he has not attained that higher goal which has always seemed to lie so easily within his reach. In the first place, it is worth while to rehearse briefly and keep in mind just a few biographical details. That Mr. Chambers was born in Brooklyn, May 26, 1865. 
that he and Mr. Charles Dana Gibson were fellow students at the Art Students League in New York, that in 1886 he went to Paris and studied at the École des Beaux-Arts and at Julian's for seven years, his paintings finding acceptance at the Salon when he was about twenty-four years of age. He returned to New York in 1893, and a glance over the old files of Life, Truth, and Vogue reveals his activity at that time as an illustrator. But the story writer's instinct, the riotous fertility of imagination that insisted on flashing endless motion pictures before his eyes at all times and in all places, demanded a fuller and more rapid means of expression than that of palette and brushstroke. The tangible realities of his student's life in Paris formed the raw material for his first novel, In the Quarter, while the yet undisciplined extravagances of his imagination found outlet in the short stories of uncanny and haunting power that make up the volume entitled The King in Yellow. It was the cordial recognition accorded this second volume that decided Mr. Chambers' subsequent career. To a critic attempting a conscientious and discriminating study of Mr. Chambers' work, the first and most salient feature is his productivity. In barely seventeen years he has produced thirty-six volumes, including four juvenile stories and a collection of verse. Furthermore, his uncommon versatility once found expression in a drama entitled The Witch of Ellangowan, written for Miss Ada Rehan and produced at Daly's Theatre. It is neither practicable nor advantageous to study in detail more than a fraction of these works. Singling out such as clearly mark the author's several periods of transition and stand as significant landmarks of gain or loss in technique. But before taking up these separate volumes, it is well to get a general impression of Mr. Chambers' literary methods, his characteristic practice of the art he has chosen, in preference to that for which he was trained. The emphasis of position is deliberately laid upon the concluding phrase of the preceding paragraph. The disadvantage under which the art of fiction has always suffered is that there is demanded of it no such long period of probation, no such definite apprenticeship as are exacted from all the other arts. It is true that many a beginner in story writing is condemned, usually with justice, to months and years of disappointment, an augmenting collection of rejection slips, and the consignment, one by one, of treasured manuscripts to the waste paper basket. On the other hand, it happens every now and then that a new writer breaks into print like thunder out of a clear sky, with scarcely any preliminary training and by sheer force of an inborn talent. But the important point is that, whether premature or belated, the success of the story writer comes from self-tuition. There exists no Julians to train the budding novelist, no salon to give a worldwide recognition to real genius. The case of Mr. Chambers himself is interesting and significant. Seven years seemed not too long a time to serve for the right to have a few sketches published in our illustrated magazines. But when one day it casually occurred to him to sit down at his desk and to turn the things he had seen into written pages, the result a few months later was the irrevocable black and white of a printed book. Of course, in one sense, such an experience is high testimony to a writer's natural talent, and not merely justifies but well nigh demands his continuance along the same path. On the other hand, such an inborn and spontaneous vein of creative power is a handicap as well as an advantage. It minimizes the importance of self-discipline and of that mastery of technique which is to be acquired only at the price of many failures. All this is by way of preface to the one obvious and all-pervading weakness in the writings of Mr. Chambers. For it is important to get this weakness clearly in mind before we recognize cordially his many distinctive talents. Some admirers of Mr. Chambers have spoken enthusiastically of his rare constructive ability and of the unerring instinct with which he brings his stories to the desired climax. To a great extent this is true, if only we place the principal accent upon the word instinct. What Mr. Chambers' literary methods are, the present writer does not know in detail, but a careful analysis leaves the impression that he allows his stories very largely to construct themselves relying upon that inborn faculty for narrative which we have already so cordially granted him. For instance, the elementary principle of economy of means is a rule for which Mr. Chambers seems to have no use. He has found, by experience, that the public likes to listen to him, and so long as they listen, he sees no reason for curtailing to fifty words a sentence which left to itself flows along to upward of a hundred. 
In his latest books, he no more sees the objection to interrupting the progress of a plot by a few pages of unnecessary dialogue than in his earlier period he saw the harm of delaying progress with superfluous paragraphs of quite vivid and wonderful description. In other words, the impression left by Mr. Chambers' work as a whole is that he has not chosen to study carefully and to practice the best technique of the recognized masters of modern fiction. He prefers to begin and to end a story where he pleases, regardless of the question whether this beginning and end coincide with those dictated by the best art. In a measure, this is rather curious, because of all the arts none is so closely related to fiction as that of painting, none that should be a more unerring guide to the best methods of composition. And yet, in his stories, Mr. Chambers over and over again interjects extraneous details which, if he had been thinking in terms of brushstrokes and paint tubes, he would have known at once to lie far beyond the borders of his canvas. These criticisms of Mr. Chambers' methods are based not upon individual impressions but upon facts easily to be demonstrated from the books themselves. Nevertheless, they are made hesitantly because it is quite possible that Mr. Chambers has been wise in writing precisely as he does. It may be that his erratic, effervescent, irrepressible flow of invention would have become clogged and diverted under the trammels of a stricter technique. What he does possess, and what must be acceded to him freely and generously, are a graphic power of visualization that sets before you, with the lavishness of a glowing canvas, precisely the picture that he has in his mind's eye, an ability to handle crowds and give you the sense of the jostle and turmoil of busy streets, the tumult and uproar of angry throngs, the din and havoc of battle. And thirdly, he possesses to an exceptional degree the trick of conveying a sense of motion. You are caught, swept off your feet, and breathlessly carried onward by the irresistible rush and surge of his narrative. Many another writer has succeeded in describing speed. Few of them have been able so intensely to make you feel it. Few of them have given the impression of the inexorable rapidity with which the tragedies of life sometimes succeed each other. And furthermore, a quality which must be conceded to Mr. Chambers in common with such specialists in the outdoor life as Stuart Edward White or Charles G. D. Roberts is an enthusiastic and all-pervading love of nature, of wood and field and water, of hunting and fishing, of all creatures of the earth and air, large and small. There is not a story but what has in it some furred or feathered creature that plays a more or less prominent part in the structure. Not a chapter that is quite lacking in the song of birds or the fragrance of flowers or the flutter of insect wings. And with all this is the unmistakable imprint of authority. You feel that Mr. Chambers may blunder in the color of a man's hair or the motive for a woman's action, but he is too good a naturalist to mistake the species of a beetle or a butterfly or misname a wayside weed or a woodland creeper. The great majority of our society novelists confine themselves so largely to the artificial life of drawing-room and boudoir that we ought to be grateful to Mr. Chambers, if only for the sake of the breath of open air and song and sunshine that he never quite loses, even in the darkest and meanest of our city streets. It will not be necessary, in order to arrive at a well-rounded estimate of Mr. Chambers' real value, to examine critically more than half a dozen of his books. An author's first published volume usually possesses a peculiar significance as a standard of measurement for what comes after. Therefore, in the quarter cannot be disregarded. One's first impression in reading it is that of astonishment at its vividness. It is so unmistakably a series of pen drawings, of things actually seen and lived, a pell-mell gathering of the humor and pathos, the gladness and the pain of the modern art student's life, one's second thought is that, while essentially modern in material, the book is curiously old-fashioned in structure, almost as destitute of coherence as La Vie de Bohème itself. There is not an episode that you wish to prune away. They are so frankly enjoyable for their own sake. But as for plot, with the best intentions in the world, one fails to extract anything more definite than this. An American art student, who drifts into quite the usual entanglement with a young girl of a rather better sort than the average Parisian model, an estrangement brought about by the American's inheritance of a fortune, and the interference of the French girl's jealous sister, and finally the unjustifiable and melodramatic murder of the American by the sister, just as all misunderstandings have been cleared up and the wedding is arranged. In this book, in spite of certain crudities, the following points are to be noticed. Here, at the very start, 
Mr. Chambers showed a rare power of description, a distinct ability at portraiture of such types as he really knew. And because the book was written under French influences, the slight structure that it possessed was logical. Even the melodramatic ending was foreshadowed and structurally justifiable. Following this novel came a succession of volumes which, with the exception of one or two negligible efforts, consist of collections of short stories. The King in Yellow, The Maker of Moons, and The Mystery of Choice. Mr. Chambers has, at intervals since then, published other volumes of tales, such as The Tree of Heaven and Some Ladies in Haste, but unquestionably his fame as a writer of the short story will rest upon these earlier volumes. Widely as they differ in character and quality, ranging from painfully sinister horror stories to fantasies light as rainbow bubbles, they all of them have one quality in common. A wanton unreality, a defiance of everything that, in our sober senses, we are accustomed to believe, coupled with a certain assumption of seriousness, an insistence upon little realistic details that force us for the time being to accept as actual the most outrageous absurdities and to vibrate as responsively as a violin string to the touch of the author's finger and the sweep of his imagination. It would be easy to pick a dozen of these stories as characteristic examples of Mr. Chambers at the height of his fantastic mood. As a matter of personal preference, I would single out the story which gives its name to the volume entitled The Maker of Moons, for it runs the gamut of all the varied emotions that characterize these stories. The repulsion of tangible, physical ugliness, the dread of unguessed horror, the witchery of supernatural beauty, the pervading sense of invisible, warring forces of good and evil. We start with cold, prosaic details, a favorite trick of Mr. Chambers. The United States Treasury officials have reason to believe that an unscrupulous gang of counterfeiters have discovered a method of manufacturing gold so adroitly that it defies chemical analysis, and they decide that these makers of moonshine gold must be suppressed. There is only one peculiarity about this gold, and herein lies the first suggestion of creepy repulsion. Wherever a lump of the gold is found, there are pretty sure to be found also one or more curious, misshapen, crawling creatures, half crab, half spider, covered with long, thick yellow hair and suggestive of uncleanness and venom. The headquarters of these counterfeiters is somewhere in the northern woods in a region of peaceful trees and still waters and the whole effect of the story is obtained by the swift series of transitions between the physical violence of a ruthless manhunt and the ineffable charm and beauty of a dream lady who appears to the hero repeatedly and without warning standing beside a magic fountain and talking to him of a mystic city beyond the seven seas and the great river the river and the thousand bridges the white peak beyond the sweet scented gardens the pleasant noise of the summer wind laden with bee music and the music of bells. It is hard in a clumsy retelling of such gossamer spun tales to give the impression of anything more than a jumble of mad folly. Yet the tale itself leaves an insistent memory of supernatural beauty, seen vaguely through moonlight, and of the fulsome opulence of demon gold distilling foully into writhing, crawling horrors. Lorraine, Ashes of Empire, The Red Republic, and The Maids of Paradise, though appearing at irregular intervals from 1894 to 1903, belong together, for the twofold reason that they all four have the Franco-Prussian War as a setting, and dashing young Americans for their heroes. Of these four, Ashes of Empire seems best adapted for analysis, since it shows perhaps the best of any of them, the qualities and weaknesses of Mr. Chambers in this type of novel. It is essentially the type of the modern novel of adventure, the type made familiar by Stanley Wayman, Max Pemberton, Henry Seaton Merriman, and Richard Harding Davis. And on the whole, Mr. Chambers' treatment of the type may be compared not unfavorably with any one of these. He happens to know unusually well both the history and the topography of France during the period that he has chosen to treat. He attempts no ambitious character study, he takes no daring liberties with recorded facts. He is content to tell a series of rattling good stories that not only keep moving but keep you moving with them. And there is no doubt that he himself is having as much enjoyment in the writing as any of the readers have in the reading. And yet it is evident that this type of book is not what Mr. Chambers would have deliberately chosen as his favorite life work. 
one may venture to risk the conjecture that he would never have written these books at all had it not been for the sudden popularity a decade ago of the adventure novel coupled with his own fatal facility for turning out pretty nearly any sort of story that he chooses to undertake had he cared more for his work we should have had in these books characters less wooden and more like real people and episodes more uniformly serious and less apt to approach the borderline of farce ashes of empire is in this respect typical it deals with the empress eugenie's flight the siege and the surrender of paris there are two young american war correspondents who happen to be outside the tuileries at an opportune time to aid two unknown young women to hoodwink the crowd and effect the empress's safe retreat these two war correspondents partly by design partly by good luck succeed in tracing the young women to their home abutting on the city's fortifications learn that the girls live there quite alone renting the upper apartments to lodgers and keeping a bird shop on the ground floor in which parrots jackdaws and a tame lioness harmlessly romp together the war correspondents promptly fall in love with the two sisters rescue them from the villainous machinations of two german americans who turn out to be prussian spies and after undergoing the usual allotment of hair-breadth escapes marry and live happily ever after but while the characterization is weak and the plot conventional the background is really alive we feel the tension of a national crisis the dread of approaching disaster the scream of shells and the wails of starvation the despair of a people who know that both from within and without they have been betrayed to this extent at least the book is a worthy piece of work and it is exasperating in the same way that so much of Mr. Chambers' work exasperates, because we feel that he might so easily have made it better. Many a sincere friend of Mr. Chambers has frankly declared outsiders to be his one great blunder. Yet it is a finer and more sincere piece of work than many of his successful volumes. Moreover, it throws some useful light upon his attitude not so many years ago toward publishers, critics, and life in general in the city of New York. It is not surprising that the book failed to achieve popularity. He committed in it almost all the indiscretions which are supposed to bar the way to a big sale. He ridiculed American culture, American architecture, and American social standing. And he rounded out the story with an ending which sinned doubly by being not only unhappy, but structurally unnecessary. Nevertheless, one cannot help liking the book. It is so vigorous, so cleverly satirical, and in the main so well written. The life of the self-styled bohemian circles, the life of the petty artists, the minor poets, the second-rate scribblers of all sorts is, to be sure, largely done in caricature, but it is caricature of an easily recognized sort. And the background, though frankly painted by an outsider and a hostile outsider at that, is vividly, unmistakably, aggressively New York. You cannot at a single moment of this story forget your whereabouts or imagine yourself in any other city in the world. Quote, Far up the ravine of masonry and iron a beautiful spire, blue in the distance, rose from a gothic church that seemed to close the great thoroughfare at its northern limit. That's Grace Church, said Oliver with a little catch in his voice. It was the first familiar landmark that he had found in the city of his boyhood, and he had been away only a dozen years. Suddenly he realized the difference between a city, in the old world acceptance of the term, and the city before his eyes. This stupendous excrescence of naked iron, gaunt under its skin of paint, flimsily colossal, ludicrously sad, this half-begun, irrational, gaudy, dingy monstrosity, this temporary fairground, choked with tinsel, ill-paved, ill-lighted, stark, treeless, swarming, crawling with humanity. In the decade that has since passed, Mr. Chambers has learned to make his characters, even when they have long resided abroad, more uniformly courteous regarding their expressed opinions of American cities and American customs. One wonders a little whether this is because he has succeeded in acquiring a taste for our ugly buildings and our noisy streets, or whether it is simply a matter of expedient reticence. Be this as it may, one cannot read attentively his latest and most mature volumes, his present series of contemporary New York life, without observing that descriptive passages of city streets and buildings are conspicuously absent. The moment that he escapes from the city, the moment that he finds himself in the open once more, on the wide-spreading levels of Long Island, or the picturesque stretches of the main coast, or the Adirondacks, we get again that fertile vividness of landscape painting which was one of the great charms of his earlier books. 
For the most part, however, one notices a great change in method in these later society novels that already include The Fighting Chance, The Younger Set, The Firing Line, and The Danger Mark. He has begun to take himself much more seriously. He no longer gives you the impression of deliberately having fun with his characters and situations. He is trying, quite sincerely, to handle social and ethical problems of real importance, and what is more, to handle them in the only way that is worthwhile namely, by using for his setting the present-day social life in the city and among the people that he best knows. And for these reasons the recent work of Mr. Chambers must be judged more strictly than his earlier volumes. Because he has become more ambitious, he must be held more closely to account for his deficiencies. These four novels have the following points in common. The action is divided between the social world of New York City and the country homes of the fashionable set. The central interest in each of the four volumes is due to certain hereditary instincts or impulses which make it either inexpedient or impossible for a certain man and woman to marry. In two of the volumes, namely, The Younger Set and The Firing Line, they unwisely have married and the story itself largely hinges on problems raised subsequently by divorce. In The Fighting Chance and The Danger Mark, the problem is that of unfitness to marry, the only difference between the two volumes being that the one is the reverse of the other, the former presenting a case where the man inherits a craving for alcohol and the woman an abnormal instinct for the flattery and attentions of men, while in the latter it is the woman who is intemperate and the man whose gallantries are uncontrolled. Now it cannot be denied that these themes are good enough in themselves and that, if properly handled with adequate knowledge of life and sincerity of purpose, they might have given us something worthy of standing as an American substitute for the continental type of analytical novel. And it is precisely for reasons of this sort that one becomes every now and then distinctly exasperated with Mr. Chambers. Not because his work is bad, but because one feels that it falls just short of being something a great deal better. The Fighting Chance and The Danger Mark are easily the best works of this later period, so much better than the two divorce problem novels that the latter may be left out of consideration. You read along in The Fighting Chance, rather skeptically perhaps at the start, because of a conviction that it has been much overpraised by the general public. Then, little by little, you find it taking hold upon you, because it has much of Mr. Chambers' earlier qualities and something new in addition. It has his pictorial vividness, his skillful light and shade, his rapidity of action, his mesmeric trick of making even the improbable seem quite a matter of course, and at the same time it reveals a new power of delineating character, of presenting us with people who are not merely types but individuals as well, people whose inward struggles and anxieties we feel a keen and growing desire to share. And then, all at once, we run up against a paragraph or a chapter that gives us a shock, because it seems so out of keeping with the rest of the picture, so clearly the sort of thing that people do not say or do. One charitably-minded reader, who is at the same time a sincere admirer of Mr. Chambers at his best, explains these occasional notable lapses, at least so far as the dialogue is concerned, on the ground that the author at such times has contented himself with merely giving, as it were, the bare scenario with telling what his characters said, without taking the time or trouble to work up the still more important question of just how they really said it. In other words, the simplest explanation of the unevenness of style in the fighting chance is that Mr. Chambers, to borrow one of his own titles, permits himself at times to be a young man in a hurry. But the real reason why Mr. Chambers' studies of American life at times strike a note that we feel to be off the key is this. His portraits of men are always a little stronger, surer, more convincing than those of his women. Study them all carefully from first to last, from his roughly blocked-in women of the Latin Quarter, and the vaporous dream-maidens of his early fantasies, down to the designedly flesh-and-blood women of his latest book, and you feel that in varying degrees they all have one little defect. They are all of them what men like to think women to be, rather than the actual women themselves. In their actions they live up to the man's expectation of what they are going to do next, rather than to woman's inalienable right to do the unexpected and illogical thing. Take, for example, the fighting chance. In substance, it amounts to this. A young woman already pledged to a man enjoying all the advantages of wealth and position, one day meets another man under the shadow of a heavy disgrace due to his intemperate habits. They are guests at the same house party, 
they are thrown much together, and within forty-eight hours she falls, unresisting, into his arms, and yields her lips as readily as any servant girl. Heredity, says the author, the girl cannot help it. The women in her family have for generations been all that they ought not to be. Nevertheless, the reader retorts, the girl does not become all that she ought not to be. During the weeks that follow there is many a venturesome scene, many a dialogue between the two that skirts the edge of impropriety. But in spite of heredity, the lady never quite loses her head. And after they separate at the close of the summer season, and the months slip by, and she knows quite well that the man she loves is drinking himself to death, when a word from her would stop him, she continues to wear the other man's large diamond ring and play her part in the social whirl. And only after the lapse of many months does it occur to her that she can effect the salvation of a human soul without in the least endangering her own reputation by merely calling him up on the telephone and having a five minutes chat. Now, this is not said with the object of belittling Mr. Chambers' work. The greater part of it is good, surprisingly good when one considers that he is a romanticist suddenly turned psychologue. Only it does not seem that a real woman could have acted in quite that way. She either would have flung discretion to the wind and done all sorts of mad things earlier in the game and thrown the blame upon heredity, or else she would from the very beginning have had sufficient self-control to keep her lips her own for somewhat longer than forty-eight hours. It is always an interesting question, interesting largely because it is in a measure unanswerable. What position is going to be assigned by a later generation to any one of our contemporary novelists? As regards Mr. Chambers, there are just a few predictions which may be made without hesitation. As a writer of short stories, he has produced at least half a dozen that deserve to rank among the best that American writers have produced, and no future collection of representative short stories can claim to be complete if it happens to neglect his name. As a novelist, he has to face the handicap that must accompany too great an adaptability. With rare exceptions, the great names in fiction are those of writers whose work throughout has been fairly homogeneous, writers who have known from the beginning precisely what sort of books they wanted to write, and whose volumes have differed in degree and not in kind. Mr. Chambers has veered, and apparently with intention, in accordance with the breeze of popular demand. First, to the French historical novel, then to the Civil War story, and finally, when the demand was sufficiently emphatic, to the contemporary society novel. In this last field, there is still a hope that Mr. Chambers will at length find himself, and the fact that the last of the four books is the best and most sustained and most honest piece of work that his later manner has produced affords solid ground for the hope that he may have still better and maturer volumes yet to come. Nevertheless, the accumulated experience of the ages has inculcated a wise distrust of the literary weathercock. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Five, Ellen Glasgow. In glancing backward over the twelve or fifteen years during which Miss Ellen Glasgow has been practicing her careful, deliberate, finally conceived art, and patiently striving not without an occasional blunder toward her present mastery of technique, one feels that, all things considered, she has not yet had in full measure the generous, widespread, and serious recognition to which she is entitled. Some of her volumes, to be sure, have enjoyed an encouraging popularity, and in many quarters she has had cordial critical appreciation. And yet, at best, it seems distinctly disproportioned to a talent which stands in the forefront of American women novelists, outranking on the one side Mrs. Atherton, as far as it outranks Mrs. Wharton on the other. A talent which sees life if not more deeply than the author of The House of Mirth, at least through a far wider angle. A talent which replaces the riotous unrestraint of the author of Ancestors with that greater strength of logical purpose and symmetry of form. Now, in order to make clear the sound critical ground for assigning so high a place to the author of The Deliverance and the Miller of Old Church, it seems not merely worth while but even obligatory to examine rather carefully her understanding and her use of the technique of form. Miss Glasgow's creed in fiction is obviously that of the realists, although her adherence to it is not so rigid as to preclude her from the occasional excursion into romanticism. Her novels are not only realistic, but, like the novels of Frank Norris, Robert Herrick, and David Graham Phillips, they are, in the best sense of the term, Zolaesque. 
that is to say they have an epic sweep and comprehension an epic sense of the surge of life and the clash of multitudinous interests this particular type of novel is so seldom successfully achieved in english that although there has been occasion to speak of it more than once already in the present volume it seems desirable even at the risk of repetition to call to mind once more just what are its characteristic features the epic novel like the epic poem must have a twofold theme a specific human story and a big general problem the wrath of achilles and the trojan war the expulsion from eden and the fall of man the fate of uncle tom and the whole problem of slavery and the very essence of this epic quality lies in the ability to tell the specific central human story and hold and stir you with the pathos and the tragedy of it and yet all the while keep before you the realization that this specific story is only an isolated case of a general and widespread condition that achilles brooding in his tent is only a symbol of the pervading wrath and sorrow and desolation begotten by war that the empty cabin of uncle tom is only a symbol of the cruelty the broken ties the inhumanity attendant upon slavery it is a curious fact that mrs stowe probably without any conscious understanding of technique produced an almost perfect epic novel according to principles that were destined to be formulated fully half a century later and it is equally curious that the first american woman since mrs stowe to succeed in writing a genuine epic novel should also have chosen a similar setting and a similar theme to state the case more correctly, it is curious that the first woman among our modern writers to achieve this type of novel should have happened to be a southern woman. Because, since Miss Glasgow happens by birth and education to have a knowledge of Virginian scenes and people beyond that of other parts of the world, she has simply been obeying the most elementary principle of good technique when she chooses for her setting the region that she knows best while such a volume as the wheel of life in which the scene is laid in new york is to be classed in spite of much that is good among the number of the author's blunders one feels in this new york story as though miss glasgow were slightly out of her element as though she lacked sympathy even for the best of the characters in it and frankly disapproved of the others it is even more difficult for a woman than for a man to attain the attitude of strict impersonality which is demanded by the highest rules of modern construction and herein one feels lies one of miss glasgow's failings she could not if she would help showing us her heart goes out to certain favourite characters young and old white and black alike nor would we have it otherwise because in her affection for these people whom she understands so profoundly lies the secret of the abiding charm which they in turn possess for us human stories strong tender high-minded her volumes undeniably are but what one remembers about them even after the specific story has faded from the mind is their atmosphere of old-fashioned southern courtesy and hospitality of gentle breeding and steadfast adherence to traditional standards of honour she has dealt with special skill with the anomalous and transitory conditions of society that followed the close of the war the breaking down of old barriers the fruitless resistance of conservatism to the new tendencies of social equality the frequent pathetic struggles to keep up a brave show in spite of fallen fortunes, the proud dignity that accepts poverty and hardship and manual labor with unbroken spirit. Such books as The Battleground, The Deliverance, The Voice of the People, are, in the best sense of the term, novels of manners, which will be read by later generations with a curious interest, because they will preserve a record of social conditions that are changing and passing away more slowly yet quite as relentlessly as the dissolving vapors of a summer sunset. In order, however, to understand on the one hand just how she uses her technique, and on the other how she succeeds in giving such poignant reality to her people and her scenes, it is necessary to examine in somewhat more detail at least a portion of her books and the battleground as one of her earlier works and also one that reaches back historically to the time of the civil war forms a convenient starting point it is besides one of the most obvious instances of miss glasgow's characteristic method of epic structure in the first place it deals with the wide general theme suggested by the title and in this wider sense the central figure is not a person but a state the state of virginia and the story is the story of that state before during and immediately after the four years of devastating struggle but more specifically the battleground is the intimate history of one southern family 
the Lightfoots, or rather of one member of that family, Dan Montjoy, whose mother, old Major Lightfoot's only daughter, had made a runaway match with a hot-headed, mean-natured scamp who caused her a brief misery and an early death. Dan Montjoy comes naturally by his hot temper, but for the most part he is a true Lightfoot, and the idol of his grandfather's old age. But there comes a day when youthful impetuosity leads Dan into certain foolish escapades that his grandfather takes too seriously. Angry, unforgettable words are exchanged, and the young man goes forth penniless to fight his way in the world alone, leaving home, friends, and the girl he loves. What he might have made of himself under other conditions is a question that Miss Glasgow does not even touch upon. But it happens that this quarrel occurs on the eve of the Civil War. Dan's secession from the family circle coincides with the South's withdrawal from the Union. And so, throughout the rest of this powerful war novel, we see a double struggle waged upon a double battleground, the struggle of a family of federal states at war with each other, and the struggle of a human being for independence of the ties of blood. And in the end, when the South as a whole is brought to accept defeat, Dan has learned still another and more personal lesson, and returns once more, wiser and happier with the sober happiness of maturity, to those at home who have never ceased to hope for his coming. Similarly, in the deliverance, there is a double significance of title and of plot. After the battle comes the vultures, says a Union soldier in the battleground. And, in a broad general way, the deliverance may be said to symbolize the sufferings of the South in the years immediately following the war, when so many of those who had constituted the wealth and pride and aristocracy of the country saw their remaining possessions wrested from them by corruption and by fraud. Christopher Blake is only a single instance of this widespread injustice and robbery. He has seen his father die, broken in body and in mind, has seen the magnificent estate that had been for two centuries the property of the Blakes, sold at auction and bought in for a beggarly sum by Bill Fletcher, his father's former overseer. Nothing can be done in a legal way, for Fletcher has been careful to see that all documents and account books that might serve as evidence against him were destroyed by fire. Christopher, a mere boy, with a crippled mother and two sisters on his hands, finds himself turned adrift, with no refuge save the overseer's former cabin and a few acres of tobacco fields, down in one corner of the estate, which should have been his own. The mother, paralyzed and blind, is transferred all unaware of the change one day when she is being carried out for her accustomed airing. Knowing nothing of the fall of the Confederacy, of the death of Lincoln, of the freedom of the slaves, she lives on in a world of her own imaginings, nurtured on an elaborate tissue of lies, daily issuing orders to an army of slaves which no longer exists, and delicately partaking of broiled chicken and sipping rare old port, while her son and daughters exist painfully on hoe-cake and fat bacon. Such is the tragic and impressive symbolism by which Miss Glasgow pictures to us the contrast between the hopes and the humiliations of the South. And in the story of the Blakes we see not merely a single family tragedy, but behind it an entire country given over to desolation, with countless estates passing into unworthy hands, countless impoverished families taking up unaccustomed burdens and cherishing in their hearts a mortal bitterness because of the dead dream of the Confederacy that refuses to be forgotten. But in the case of Christopher Blake there is another and more specific story. As a boy, his first mad impulse after being turned from his home was to murder Fletcher. But the impulse, once checked, has turned to a smoldering hatred, a fixed and secret determination for revenge. Fletcher has two grandchildren, a girl and a boy. The girl Maria marries and goes abroad before Christopher has had time to determine whether his feeling for her is hatred or love. Toward the boy Will, he has but one feeling, and that is a steadfast longing to use him as an instrument of vengeance. The boy is the one living thing that old Fletcher loves. Therefore, by making him a liar, a coward, and a drunkard, Christopher feels that he is paying back with interest the wrongs the Blakes have suffered. He never once realizes the unworthiness of his own conduct until Maria, after some years of marriage and widowhood, returns home and they meet once more and realize the feeling they had cherished as boy and girl needs only a word to make it flame into love and not hatred. But Christopher has himself done a vulture's deed in accomplishing the ruin of Maria's brother and when the lad in a drunken frenzy kills his grandfather, Christopher, realizing his own moral responsibility, aids the other to escape and gives himself up as the murderer. 
Deliverance finally comes, so the book seems to preach. Deliverance of the land from vultures like old Fletcher. Deliverance of men like Christopher from the curse of their own mad deeds. But neither the one nor the other may be hurried. They come only with patience, in the fullness of time. There are two other volumes by Miss Glasgow separated by an interval of nearly a decade, which nevertheless deserve to be analyzed together because of the interesting contrast they afford. The Voice of the People and the Romance of a Plain Man Throughout all of her books, one notices a theme to which Miss Glasgow reverts again and again with never-flagging interest, and that is the theme of unequal marriages. Under the changed conditions of the Reconstruction period, it was inevitable that the old distinctions of race and breeding, the old prejudices against honest toil and industry should be to some extent modified, and that the daughters of impoverished families should not in all cases think that they were stooping if they wedded brave and honorable men whose fathers perhaps had been mere plain tillers of the soil. This problem in its various aspects Miss Glasgow has approached over and over again, but it is only in the two books now under discussion, and to some extent in her latest and maturest volume, The Miller of Old Church, that she has frankly made it the central theme. Far apart as they are in other respects, since the voice of the people is not without crudities of construction, while the romance of a plain man is with one exception Miss Glasgow's finest achievement, the two books offer a curious parallel of plot for very nearly the first half of their development. Nicholas Burr and Ben Starr are both small, barefoot, not over-clean boys when they first meet, in the one case Eugenia Battle, in the other Sally Mickleborough, spick and span and freshly starched, and in each case the small girl makes the small boy exceedingly uncomfortable by declaring that she cannot play with him because he is common. In each case the childish insult fires a latent ambition. Nicholas Burr confides to kindly old Judge Bassett his secret hope of some day becoming a judge, and Ben Starr similarly owns to General Bolingbroke, who happens to be the president of the Great South Midland and Atlantic Railroad, his own determination to work his way up eventually to the presidency of that same road. In each case, the boy's ambition both amuses and pleases the busy man, and in each case the boy's education is cared for, his way made smooth and the first steps toward his ultimate goal are guided by a wise and protecting hand. And in the later book, Sally Mickleborough is brought to acknowledge, precisely as Eugenia Battle acknowledges in the earlier, that common was a mistaken and an unjust word, and that she is glad and proud to give her heart and hand to the man who has already achieved so much for her sake. But here the two books part company. In each of them, the pride of the girl's family forms an almost insurmountable barrier. In each of them there is another man who by birth, fortune, and education seems expressly designed for the girl's husband. In the earlier book, Miss Glasgow decides that between Nick Burr and Eugenia Battle there is too great a gulf ever to be bridged over even by love. A stray scrap of scandal touching him, too hastily believed in by her, estranges them permanently. She marries the man in her own class while he goes on doggedly climbing the rungs of the political ladder to his final goal as governor of the state. The voice of the people through the ballot has given him his political ambition. The voice of the people, through the tongue of scandal, robbed him of married happiness. The voice of the people through the mad frenzy of a mob, bent upon lynching a negro whom he, as governor, has sworn to give a fair trial, robs him of his life and the woman lives on in a marriage that has brought neither joy nor sorrow, finding her only real emotion in the cares of motherhood. The Romance of a Plain Man is a book as much bigger and stronger as a decade of steady growth can well make it. To begin with, Miss Glasgow has realized that such a story, concerning itself mainly with the inward growth of a man's character, has everything to gain and nothing to lose by being seen through the man's eyes. Therefore, she tells it in the first person. Secondly, she realizes that when two people care for each other with the fierce, unreasoning passion either of Nick and Eugenia, or of Ben and Sally, they are not likely to let either small opticals or great ones come between them. That they will brush aside entreaties, warnings, and commands, and take their chances of being either supremely happy or utterly miserable. In the marriage of Ben Starr and Sally Mickleborough, the author, if we rightly understand her, wishes to show how difficult it is for a man sprung from a humble and rather vulgar source to understand the finer feelings of those more gently born. For Sally's sake, 
Ben Starr wants wealth and education and power. And for her sake he wins them, rapidly, surely, and with apparent ease. He wants them first to prove that he is not common, and afterward having won her in defiance of her family and her social world, he continues to strive for more money, more power, more positions of trust, always with a fixed idea that they will bring her greater happiness. And here is where he makes his one great mistake that almost wrecks their married life in mid-course. He does not realize that his absorption in the big game of finance leaves him little time even to think of his wife, and none at all to place at her service. Because the obvious difference between himself and the men in Sally's own class is money and position and education, he makes the natural mistake of thinking that the attainment and possession of these things is in itself the key to social equality, the one thing essential to his happiness and hers. And the last and most important lesson in his whole course of self-education he is slow in learning, that the essential thing does not lie in these achievements but behind them. It lies in a man's power to mold his own character until he is capable of attaining his goal. It is not a bank account, nor a directorship in a railway, nor social recognition, nor a knowledge of the odes of Horace that in themselves win and hold the love of a woman like Sally Mickleborough. But without the energy and persistence to compass these things, Ben Starr would not have been the kind of man to win her. But having once won her, though he should lose his money, forget his Latin, find himself under a social cloud, she is the sort of woman who will cling all the more loyally, and with feminine illogic to be the happier for serving him. This lesson Ben Starr might have learned early in their married life, during temporary reverses, when for some weeks Sally is slowly nursing him back to health after a desperate illness, and, incidentally, earning their daily bread with her own frail, unaccustomed hands. Had he been less of a plain man, and gifted with a little more subtlety, he would have seen that for these few weeks they were nearer to true happiness than at any time before. But as a matter of fact he does not see but goes on toiling, amassing, reaching out for more power, more fame, and year by year approaching his boyhood's ambition, the presidency of the Great South Midland and Atlantic Railroad. And at last it is only under the stress of a great sorrow and a greater fear, only when he sees his wife's life trembling in the balance, that this essentially plain man receives enlightenment, and realizes that the path to happiness may lie through the deliberate sacrifice of a lifelong ambition. Such in brief is the substance of the romance of a plain man, which at the time of its publication two years ago was easily Miss Glasgow's most thoughtful, most mature and altogether biggest novel. It is a peculiarly American novel, since it symbolizes with a subtlety that is essentially feminine and a force that is almost virile, the practical limitations of the doctrine that all men are born free and equal. It was quite natural that in reading it one should say, In this book Miss Glasgow has come to full maturity. She may give us many other volumes worthy of a place beside it, but surely nothing better or stronger. But in the Miller of Old Church she has climbed to a still higher level, because never before has she succeeded in being at once so preeminently local and so universal in her appeal. Old Church deserves to become one of those historic landmarks in fiction, with a physiognomy and an individuality as unmistakable as George Eliot's St. Ogg's and Thomas Hardy's Wessex. Yet the underlying problem, while presenting a certain surface newness, is in reality not peculiar to Old Church or to Virginia or to the New South, but is as old as civilization itself. It is new to this extent only, that the specific conditions which determine its episodes are of recent origin, forming a definite stage in the slow transition in Southern social and economic life that began with the Reconstruction period and is not yet ended. But in its essence, Miss Glasgow's theme is nothing more nor less than that of the universal and inevitable struggle of the lower classes to rise, and the jealousy of caste that would hold them back if it could. And it is precisely the universality of the theme, studied under vividly local conditions, that gives to the book a large degree of its vitality and strength. The central human story of the Miller of Old Church has to do with the complex fortunes of Molly Merriweather, the illegitimate daughter of Janet Merriweather and Jonathan Gay both of whom have been dead many years before the opening of the story. Janet Merriweather belonged to that humble and despised division of the white race in the South which even the Negroes felt at liberty to look down upon. Before the war one hardly ever heard of that class, it was so humble and unpresuming. 
Jonathan Gay, on the contrary, was of the aristocracy. The Gays of Jordan's journey were easily the dominant social power of the neighborhood. At heart, Jonathan sincerely loved Janet. He had meant to deal with her honestly, and he would have been glad to make reparation by marrying her. But it was at this crucial time that Angela Gay, Jonathan's widowed sister-in-law, came to make her home with him. Now Angela was one of those frail, ephemeral, flower-like women who keep their family, friends, and medical adviser in a state of chronic anxiety, and tyrannize over the home circle with a strength born of their weakness. In fact, it was tacitly understood that Angela was not long for this world, and that everything and everybody must be sacrificed in order to spare her agitation and guard against a strain upon her dangerously fluttering heart. In a vague way, Angela knew about Jonathan's irregularities of life. But according to the standards of her station and her epoch, there were matters which a woman of refinement could not allow to be mentioned in her presence. It was part of her sweetness that she never faced an unpleasant fact until it was literally thrust upon her notice. Consequently, when Jonathan tried gently to break to her the idea that he was half inclined to marry Janet, Angela made it plain to him that for a gay so to demean himself would be equivalent to a death blow to her. Janet's shame, insanity, and early death distressed Angela in a vague way. But marriage would have been something a thousand times worse, a stupendous unimaginable calamity. So Jonathan, not dreaming that Angela would outlive him, contented himself with leaving a secret bequest and a paper acknowledging Molly as his daughter, all of which was to be made public only when the girl should reach the age of twenty-one. He did not foresee that the belated revelation would fall all the more heavily because of the delay upon the fragile woman to whom he had sacrificed his own happiness. Now at the opening of the story all this is ancient history. Molly is on the threshold of womanhood. She has ripened into great beauty and is eagerly sought after by the young men of the new order. The order, as one character phrases it, that is rapidly forging to the surface and pushing us dilapidated aristocrats out of the way. But by no one more eagerly than by Abel Revercombe, the miller of old church. Now it happens that Jonathan Gay the younger, Angela's only son, after long years of absence in the north, at last comes to Jordan's journey to see for himself how she can stand it. Almost the first person he meets is Molly, and her beauty and tragic history kindle so quick an interest that ancient wrongs seem to have a prospect of being at last set right. And so they might have been, in spite of Molly's avowed hatred of men, but for the fatal circumstance that before meeting Molly he had lost his way while taking a shortcut across lots, had been set on his right path again by Blossom Revercombe, and learned that, not his philosophy, but the little brown mole on a woman's cheek stood for destiny. Jonathan is a true gay by nature, and a gay will go on ogling the sex as long as he is able to totter back from the edge of the grave. All the time that he is openly paying court to Molly Merriweather and goading the miller into sullen jealousy, he is secretly meeting Blossom Revercombe, the miller's sister, and the old-time tragedy bids fair to be reenacted. There has been an ancient feud between the Gays and the Revercombes. In fact, it is current gossip that the shot which killed the elder Jonathan ten years earlier was fired by Uncle Abner Revercombe, who had never been quite sound in mind since the old days when the sweetheart of his youth, Janet Merriweather, was lost to him. And when he learns of the clandestine meetings between his niece and the younger Jonathan, he takes the law once more into his own hands, and by the death of another Gay squares a long-standing account. So much of the bare plot of the Miller of Old Church it has seemed necessary to tell in detail in order to understand the symbolic meaning behind it. Of the subordinate stories, the secondary interests, the complex, interwoven threads that make this volume a richly embroidered piece of living tapestry, it is impossible to take notice here without a risk of blurring outlines and confusing motives. It seems almost a pity that it is necessary to lay such special stress upon the bare skeleton of a book which, considered as a human story rather than an ethical problem, finds its main interest less in the sheer narrative than in the atmosphere of a unique locality and the intimate concerns of a group of people whom we grow to love in a very personal way on account of their sterling merits or rare whimsicalities. But it was necessary to get the bare framework of the book clearly in mind and for the following reason. Without so doing, we could not understand the masterly way in which Miss Glasgow has here once again employed the epic method. 
in the broadest sense, this book is not so much the history of Molly Merriweather as it is the story of the New South. The various factors that tend either to hasten or retard development are personified one by one in the several characters of this little local drama. In Angela, for instance, we have the incarnate spirit of the old-time southern aristocracy with its pride and its traditions, sorely stricken since the war, moribund yet still clinging to life with the amazing tenacity of chronic invalidism. In the older Jonathan, we have the bygone type of the reckless, devil-may-care, hot-blooded southerner who at any cost would maintain his family standards and traditions, and in the younger Jonathan and Abel Revercombe we have respectively the new dignity of labor and the new and broader tolerance of gentle breeding. And lastly, if we read Miss Glasgow's purpose rightly, we have in Molly Merriweather herself the future solution of the social problem. In her origin and in her character, Molly represents a mixture of two natures, a compromise between the upper class and the lower, combining the better qualities of each. Furthermore, she typifies a social intermingling which a generation earlier was not to be thought of, but which today, owing to changed conditions, has come more and more to be tolerated. In other words, the stigma of the girl's illegitimacy stands as a symbol of the social ostracism of the poorer whites even for many years after the war, and her belated recognition by her father's people in consequence of his posthumous acknowledgment of her symbolizes the reluctance with which the social barriers begin to yield. And even Molly's marriage has its deeper hidden significance. Even had Jonathan lived, she would not have married him, the representative of an effete social code. She would inevitably have taken the man whom she did take, the sturdy miller of old church. Because the younger society of the New South is destined more and more to recruit itself from the vigorous ranks of the rising democracy. Such, at least, is what Miss Glasgow seems to have set herself to say. And in this, it is not easy for the reader to misunderstand her. For she has said it with a courage, a clearness, and a strength of conviction that make it easily her best book, her wisest book, the book that amply justifies the most sanguine prophecies of those who have had an abiding faith in her. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 6. David Graham Phillips. In any critical analysis of the life work of the late David Graham Phillips, it is well to recognize frankly at the outset that he has been a rather important figure in the development of American fiction in recent years. We could name on the fingers of one hand the contemporary novelists who, like Mr. Phillips, have devoted themselves to depicting and studying the big ethical and social problems of their own country and generation, and doing it in a broad, bold, comprehensive way with a certain epic sweep and magnitude. And among these few none was more deeply in earnest than Mr. Phillips. None strove more patiently to do his work in the best, most forceful, most craftsmanlike manner. Having made these concessions, we are free to recognize that his results fell somewhat behind his intentions, that with all his industry he developed his technique rather slowly, and that while just a few of his novels are of a quality which no serious student of present-day fiction can afford to neglect, a large proportion of the remainder may conveniently be set aside as merely tending to increase the bulk of a critical analysis without contributing any light of real importance. Now, in saying that Mr. Phillips was slow in acquiring the technique of construction, it behooves a critic to define rather carefully just wherein he showed himself defective. It certainly was not due to any lack of willingness or ability to practice infinite pains. On the contrary, the habit of making the act of writing a slow and conscientious toil grew upon him year by year. Few novelists of his degree of success have accepted adverse criticism in a more tolerant spirit. But there was one thing that he resented, and that was the charge of careless haste. People sometimes say that I write too fast, he protested not long before his death. They said so about my light-fingered gentry. They don't know anything about it. I don't believe anyone ever wrote more slowly and laboriously. Every one of my books was written at least three times. He paused a moment, then added in correction, and when I say three times, it really means nine times on account of my system of copying and revision. 
when once under full headway in a book he worked immoderately producing an actual bulk of material far in excess of what was needed for the limits of the story i have writer's cramp every spring he said with a laugh as he became better acquainted with the characters and situations in a book his great difficulty lay in confining himself to such details as were strictly relevant to his central purpose he was hampered by knowing too much about his people, their habits of life and methods of thought. They were all the time taking matters into their own hands, and insisting upon his setting down upon paper all sorts of happenings quite extraneous to the story. According to his own estimate, he usually ended by discarding not only in paragraphs and episodes, but also in whole chapters, from two to three times as much as he retained in the published volume nor are his faults of construction due to a lack of acquaintance with the best methods of the modern schools of fiction abroad as well as at home there are certain qualities in his later volumes such as old wives for new and the second generation which are to be explained only through the influence of the best french realism qualities which on the one hand are not the result of a conscious and deliberate imitation but on the other cannot possibly have been an independent and spontaneous creation the broad zoalesque sweep of phrase and action the sense of jostling crowds and ceaseless activity the endless panorama of city streets the whole trick of treating humanity in ranks and battalions as though the crowd were a natural unit of measurement these are things which mr phillips learned to do as just a few other american writers frank norris for instance and robert herrick have learned to do them and necessarily he must have studied at the fountainhead Indeed, his whole conception of what a novel should be was French rather than Anglo-Saxon. When one discussed with him about theories of fiction, he would admit frankly, on the one hand, that he had small use for such artificial devices for giving unity to a series of volumes as Balzac's scheme of the Comédie Humaine or Zola's complicated family tree of the Rougeau Macquart. But he did insist upon seeing every human story as a cross-section of life and by a cross-section of life he did not mean a little local slice carefully measured to fit the dimensions of the particular story he happened to be telling. On the contrary, if he was narrating the simple love affair of a boy and girl in some small town of the Middle West, he was always conscious, even though he had no need of bringing this out in the story, that there was between that boy and girl and all the other people in that town an inevitable and all-pervading human relationship that the town was not an isolated community but was itself only a link in the vast network of social and industrial life stretching over the wide continent from the atlantic to the pacific with endless miles of railroad intersecting it with a centralized government a president and congress at washington and with countless lines of steamers keeping it in touch with the other world powers all this helps in a measure to show what to mr phillips was a very vivid actuality and of course the writer who always sees each little human happening not as an isolated incident but as a detail in a tremendous and universal scheme necessarily has a wider outlook upon life and necessarily communicates to his readers a similar impression of bigness and of vitality this brings us directly to the question why is it that so many of mr phillips's books contain more of promise than of fulfilment why is it that, starting as they do with big ethical problems and a broad epic treatment, they are so apt at the end to leave rather the impression of having given us an isolated and exceptional human story than of having symbolized some broad and universal principle? The answer, I think, is simply this, that there was a curious anomaly in the manner in which Mr. Phillips' mind worked when in quest of the germ idea of a new story. In spite of the fact that his instinct led him to write purpose novels, and that his interest in social and economic problems was in some respects keener than his interest in people, yet according to his own admission, no story ever began to shape itself in his mind in the form of an abstract principle, an ethical doctrine. Reversing the usual process followed by writers of the epic type, he always started from a single character or episode and built from these sometimes indeed from nothing more definite than a face glimpsed for a moment in a crowd a striking case in point is the origin that he assigned to one of the novels left unpublished at the time of his death the theme of this story was the outgrowth of mr phillips deep interest in the economic independence of the modern woman and more especially in the peculiar dangers and temptations which beset her as contrasted with the more sheltered lives of her mother and grandmother 
He had been deeply stirred by recent statistics regarding the influx of refined young southern women into New York, so many of them fated to be swept under by the surge of city life. He wanted to know whether such a girl could, by her own efforts, struggle up, out of the depths, to a position of independence and social standing. Such, in substance, is the longest book that Mr. Phillips ever wrote, a book that in the form in which he left it ran to considerably more than three hundred thousand words. The title of the book has not yet been made public, but it is probably safe to conjecture that it is the volume which he intended to call Susan. At all events, it is utterly unlike any of his previous efforts, and the author himself confessed that it baffled his powers of self-criticism. But, like all his other books, it received its first impetus not from economics but from a trivial incident, namely a passing glimpse of a young woman seated in a wagon. The incident in question occurred when the author was a lad of fourteen. It was in a western town where he chanced to be staying at the time, and the face of the young woman in the farm wagon haunted him long afterward. It was a beautiful face, a face indicating breeding and culture, but it bore the stamp of dumb, hopeless tragedy. As he stood gazing at her, a gaunt elderly man, rugged and toil-stained, with the hallmark of the well-to-do farmer plainly visible upon him, climbed to the seat beside her, gathered up the reins, and drove off. Mr. Phillips, a boy though he was, noticed how the girl shrank and whitened as her companion's shoulder touched her. He heard the girl's story afterward. She belonged to a family of local prominence. But there had been a scandal, sordid, notorious, unforgettable. The girl herself was probably the one person in the community who did not know the facts. She could not understand why her people were shunned socially, nor why they welcomed the chance of providing for her by marriage with an illiterate but prosperous old farmer who lived at a desirable distance from town. The girl's story has nothing to do with Mr. Phillips' novel, but the suffering on her face was his inspiration after the lapse of a quarter century. It is the logical result of Mr. Phillips' method of working from the concrete to the abstract, from the specific to the general, that his big underlying principle, whatever it may be, is never personified with that graphic visualization that makes it everywhere and at all times loom up portentously, as for instance in Zola's L'Argent, the Bourse looms up, in Le Ventre de Paris, the Halle, in La Samoire, the Wine Shop like so many vast symbolic monsters wreaking their malignant pleasure upon mankind. In Mr. Phillips' books, one feels the ethical purpose far more vaguely. He is always stimulating. He sets us thinking deeply over big problems, most deeply perhaps when he most strongly antagonizes us. But it is difficult to say with precision, or at all events to say within the limits of ten words, just what principle any one book of his stands for. Take, for instance, the best and strongest of all his books, The Husband's Story. Even here the general public has groped rather helplessly to decide just what the author meant. It must be admitted that on the whole the general public has in this particular case been rather stupid in failing to recognize that when Mr. Phillips chose to see this particular story through the eyes of a certain shrewd and unscrupulous financier, he deprived himself of the chance of expressing his own ideas directly, and was obliged to give us every detail strongly colored by its passage through another man's temperament. Nevertheless, it is undoubtedly to some extent Mr. Phillips' own fault that a majority of his readers assumed that the husband's story was an indictment of the American woman as a whole, and not simply of one limited and ultra-snobbish type of American woman and the same question of his meaning is raised with considerably more justice in every one of his earlier books. Is Old Wives for New a protest against girl and boy marriages, or an endorsement of divorce or both? Is The Hungry Heart an arraignment of the doll's house treatment of a wife, or a plea for equal standards for man and woman in questions of morality? And is The Second Generation to be taken mainly as a protest against inherited fortunes, a glorification of work, or as a satire upon the snobbery of America's idle class. In other words, had Zola written this book, would his symbol for it have been the probate court, the dinner pail, or the powdered flunky? It was part and parcel of Mr. Phillips' habitual tendency to see his cross-section of life in its entirety, that he found himself unable to do one thing at a time, found himself obliged to complicate and obscure his central purpose by having in reality several simultaneous central purposes. This brings us face to face with the real fault of Mr. Phillips' method of work, the real weakness of even his best achievements. 
he was not merely the clear-eyed and impartial observer of life. He was always a partisan and a reformer. His interest was so keen in the problems he was seeking to set forth that he found it impossible to keep himself and his ideas out of them. Of course, when you take one of Mr. Phillips' novels to pieces, you discover that in its essence it is a problem novel. But this side of his work he had learned to disguise pretty cleverly. It is not so much the way in which he twisted the lives of his characters in order to point a moral, as it is the slight running comment going all through the narrative portions of his stories that keeps us reminded both of his personal outlook upon life and of the annoying fact that he is trying to do our thinking for us. Here, for instance, is a trivial little example that may stand as typical of his method. In White Magic, he had occasion to tell us, as evidence of the expensive scale on which his heroine's mother ran her summer home, that she had no less than five footmen in attendance at the front door. Now, some of us may think this mere foolishness, others may wax indignant over it as a criminal extravagance, and others again simply regard it as no more than what was proper for a person in her position of life. Mr. Phillips had as good a right as anybody else to his own opinion about it, but it was not good art for him to force that opinion upon the reader by couching this little fact in the following terms. Five lackeys, five strapping fellows with dumb faces and the stalwart figures that the rich select as menial showpieces. There is a veiled sneer in the very intonation of such a sentence that is incompatible with the best art. It is this uncontrolled tendency to inject the personal equation into his books that every now and then sets the reader tingling with sudden antagonism in the midst of some of his strongest scenes. His outlook upon life was extremely clear-eyed and broad, and if he had been content to give us the uncolored facts and let us think what we would about them, we should get considerably more benefit as well as enjoyment out of contact with his people and their histories. That there is a good deal of snobbery among our wealthy and fashionable class, our imitation aristocracy of money is undoubtedly true. And to the average sane-minded American there is something distinctly foolish in the sight of an American mother trailing her daughters through Europe with the open and unashamed intention of selling them to a title. But after all, questions of this kind are largely a matter of the point of view. There is no useful purpose served in waxing indignant over people who happen to regulate their lives somewhat differently from the way in which you or I would regulate our lives. It is always worth while to set forth as strongly as possible in a story certain existing social conditions which the author in his secret heart condemns, but there is nothing gained by insisting that the reader must condemn them also. It may very well happen that the reader does not at all share the author's views, and in that case such an attempt to prejudice him is fully as irritating as is the coloring given to news in a paper of the opposite political party to your own. This interference on the part of Mr. Phillips, born as it was of over-earnestness, produced upon the types of his people and the construction of his plots certain modifications which are precisely what a shrewd judge of books might have expected in advance to find there. In the first place, it led him quite frequently to picture not what average people are doing under existing conditions, but what somewhat unusual people would, in his opinion, have done under conditions just the reverse of those that exist. As, for instance, in the second generation, not what happens to the inefficient heirs of great wealth when the hard-working father dies, but to the distinctly exceptional and self-sufficient children of a rich man who, for their own good, deliberately disinherits them. Or, again, in White Magic, he studied not the typical case of the girl reared in wealth and luxury who, upon losing her heart to an impecunious artist, fights a long battle with herself because she cannot go against her training, but the exceptional case of the girl who flings such training to the winds and brazenly offers her heart and hand to the penniless artist in question, who, being himself equally an exception, repulses her because he selfishly thinks that she will interfere with his art. And, secondly, this tendency to tell us what we ought to think has its effect upon the individualization of his characters, and more especially upon his women. What I mean here is best illustrated by taking for a moment a book from which this particular fault is absent, The Husband's Story. The fact that this book was written in the first person made it of course impossible for Mr. Phillips to obtrude directly his own opinions and probably it is due to this fact quite as much as to any other that, artistically speaking, this is the best book that he produced. The character of the wife Edna we get entirely as colored by the husband's eyes. 
as strongly colored as though we were looking at her through a piece of stained glass. The admirable thing about it is that the color is uniformly and consistently maintained from start to finish, a bit of craftsmanship that requires a rather masterly touch. In turning from this book to others that are not written in the first person, we realize that a good deal of the time Mr. Phillips was coloring his women, not so strongly to be sure, but nonetheless to a noticeable extent. In other words, that he was forcing us to see them through the medium of his own eyes instead of directly from life. We become aware of this by finding that he quite frequently expects us, indeed demands of us, to admire things that his heroines do and say, which we ourselves cannot find at all admirable. And sometimes he is led into making them take certain actions that we are quite sure the women that we ourselves think they are would not have been guilty of taking. But questions of this kind are not a matter for generalization. They can be better understood when we proceed to take up for separate analysis a few of the more significant of Mr. Phillips' novels. During the dozen years that represent the period of his activity as a writer of fiction, Mr. Phillips produced somewhat less than a score of volumes. To analyze these books one by one in the order of their appearance, beginning with The Great God, Success and A Woman Ventures, and coming steadily down the list through Golden Fleece and The Cost, and all the rest of them, would be not only tiresome but futile. It would be simply one of the many ways of making it impossible to see the woods because of the trees. Mr. Phillips was striving from the start to do pretty much the same sort of thing in all his work and the only practical difference between his later volumes and his earlier is that he was steadily learning to do the same sort of thing considerably better. For this reason there is no point in spending time on those earlier volumes than if one were writing an analysis of Zola. It would be worth while to waste space on Madeleine Ferrat and Nantas and Thérèse Raquin. In point of fact, one gets quite effectively the whole range of Mr. Phillips' powers and also of his weaknesses in the volumes that belong to his period of mature development the volumes produced within the last four or five years. The Second Generation is probably the best book to recommend to a reader approaching Mr. Phillips for the first time, because, on the one hand, it contains less than most of his books that is likely to arouse antagonism, and, on the other, it admirably illustrates his strongest qualities, his ability to give you the sense of life and motion in the clash of many interests. The substance of it can be told in rather fewer words than is usual with Mr. Phillips' novels. Old Hiram Ranger, millionaire manufacturer of barrels in a small western town, suddenly makes two rather painful discoveries. First, he learns that his remarkable physical strength, which has never once failed him throughout all his years, is at last breaking, and that he has not many days in which to set his house in order. And his second and even more painful discovery is that for twenty years he has unwittingly been harming his son and his daughter by overindulgence allowing them to grow up in idleness, to form foolish and extravagant tastes, to choose their friends exclusively from the ultra-fashionable circles, and to learn to despise the humble beginnings from which he himself sprang and from which the money that they thoughtlessly waste has come. He decides in bitter agony of soul that there is at this late date only one thing that he can do to repair his huge mistake, and that is to deprive his children of the inheritance on which they have counted. The act hurts him more cruelly than it can possibly hurt them. It hurts him through his love for them, through his pride in them, and through his desire for public esteem and approval, since he foresees that such an act will be misunderstood and disapproved. All of this part of the story, the old man's sturdy courage and shrewd common sense, contrasted with the weak vanity and costly luxury of the son and daughter, is given with graphic truth, rugged strength, and a sure swiftness of movement. But from the middle point of the story we get a rather exasperating impression that we are being allowed to behold not so much a cross-section of life as an up-to-date morality play. Old Hiram Ranger has chosen rather drastic methods to teach his son and daughter a lesson, to reform their characters, practically to make them over. No one can say that a situation thus created is without interest. But it becomes exasperating to find that the old man has made his calculations with the sureness of omnipotence that his plan succeeds even in all its minor details, and that the son and daughter repent of all their errors, reform themselves completely, are to all intents and purposes born anew. Mr. Phillips was probably not conscious of it when he wrote the book, but nonetheless it is to all practical intents a grown-up version of the story of the bad little boy who went fishing on Sunday and was drowned, 
and the good little boy who went to church and was rewarded with plum pudding. A dozen different readers would probably give a dozen different statements of the central theme of Old Wives for New. The real importance of this book, for among Mr. Phillips' books it is unquestionably one of the important ones, is that it sets forth quite pitilessly the gradual estrangement that arises between a husband and wife in the course of long years through the woman's sloth and selfishness and gratification of all her whims. It is an open question whether Mr. Phillips' method of presenting this problem might not have been improved upon. What he has done is to show us first in a brief prelude the sudden ardor of a boy and girl attachment, each caught by the mere physical charm of youth and health and high spirits, and rushing into a marriage with no firm basis of mutual understanding. Then he skips an interval of about twenty years, and takes us into the intimate life of this same couple, showing us with a frankness of speech and of thought that is almost cruel in its unsparing realism the physical and mental degeneration of the woman, fat and old and slovenly before her time, and the unspoken repulsion felt by the man who has kept himself young, alert and thoroughly modern in outward appearance as well as in spirit. The situation is complicated by the presence of two grown children, a son and a daughter who see unwillingly the approaching crisis and realize their helplessness to ward it off. Such a situation in real life may solve itself in any one of fifty different ways. What Mr. Phillips has chosen to do is to bring the husband in contact with a young woman who represents everything in which his own wife is lacking. And although the man fights for a long time against temptation, in the end he obtains freedom from the old wife through the divorce court and promptly replaces her with the new. There is probably no other American novel that gives us with such direct and unflinching clairvoyance the sordid, repellent, intimate little details of a mistaken marriage that slowly but surely culminates in a sort of physical nausea and an inevitable separation. What a good many of us are apt to resent in the book is the stamp of approval that the author seems to place upon the man who deliberately discards a wife after her youth and beauty are gone not because he thinks it for their mutual welfare, but for the cold-blooded reason that he wants to marry somebody else. There is a sort of heartless immorality about the whole proceeding that makes us feel that the slovenly faded wife, with her shallow pretense of having worn herself out with household cares, her gluttony that has been the ruin of health and beauty, her peevish temper and ridiculous vanity, makes on the whole a rather better showing than the husband. One cannot leave this book without adding just a word of protest against what may seem a trivial detail, yet is the sort of detail in which Mr. Phillips' technique sins rather frequently. The husband has met the woman who embodies his ideal of feminine perfection, quite by chance in the woods, where he and his son are camping out. In the course of three weeks, almost without their knowing it, they have fallen in love with each other. Then comes the awakening and they go their separate ways, the man still knowing nothing of the woman's identity, of her station in life, or of the particular corner of America which is her home. Several chapters later, the man is in New York helping his daughter buy her trousseau. There are a thousand shops in New York from which she might choose, but purely by chance she takes her father to the one shop which happens to be presided over by the woman with whom he is in love. A coincidence of this sort is bad enough when it seems to be more or less of a structural necessity. But when, as in this case, one can think of a dozen simple ways of avoidance, it becomes unpardonable. There is only one excuse for pausing to speak of Mr. Phillips' next volume, The Fashionable Adventures of Joshua Craig, namely that it shows that even yet the author was weak in the power of self-criticism. How it was possible for a writer possessing the breadth of view and the power of expression that have gone into the making of at least four or five of Mr. Phillips' best novels, to put forth seriously a piece of cheap caricature like Joshua Craig, quite passes the understanding of the ordinary impartial outsider. Joshua Craig is simply an exaggerated specimen of a rather exasperating type of novel, which has unfortunately become far too common in American fiction. The novel which shows the refined and carefully nurtured American girl, usually from the East, belying all her inherited instincts and acquired training by marrying the rugged, virile, usually rather vulgar man of the people, who, for the purposes of this type of novel, is generally represented as coming from the West. The whole type seems to have originated at about the time that Owen Wister made Molly's New England conscience capitulate to the Virginian, and the type has steadily degenerated year by year. 
but of course it is never fair to quarrel with an author simply because one does not happen to like what he has tried to do the trouble with joshua craig is that he has so obviously failed to do what he tried joshua is not merely bluff and rugged and primitive of manner he is loud-mouthed and vulgar and deliberately discourteous margaret severance the reigning beauty of washington whom he decides in his stormy violent irresistible way to marry not because he loves her but because he conceives the idea that she loves him is in point of manners pretty nearly his match she has a way of looking at people with a lady's insolent tranquillity and on one occasion when she receives a letter that angers her and her maid happens at the same moment to be buttoning her shoes she relieves her feelings by springing up and bringing her sharp french heel down with full force on the back of her maid's hand leaving it skinned and bleeding she is distinctly an unpleasant personality yet even so to marry her to such a cyclonic bore as joshua craig does seem rather like making the punishment exceed the crime passing over white magic which is simply an innocuous little love story told with rather more explosive violence than the theme warrants we come to the two books that exhibit mr phillips ripest powers the hungry heart and the husband's story the hungry heart is a sincere and detailed study of a marriage that threatens to be a failure because the man adheres to old-fashioned standards regarding women while the wife with her modern education and progressive views finds it impossible to accept the role of domesticity and inaction to which he would assign her as a piece of careful construction this volume deserves frank praise the entire action takes place within the house and grounds of the husband's ancestral home the cast of characters is limited to just four people two men and two women we hardly get even a passing glimpse of any outsiders friends or relatives or even servants and yet within this little world of four people we get a sense of universality of theme and interest an impression not of learning the secrets of a few isolated lives but of learning much that is big and vital about man and woman there is nothing essentially new in the specific story it is simply one of the many variants of the familiar triangle the husband and wife who drift apart the other man who takes advantage of a woman's loneliness to persuade her that she is in love when really she is only bored and finally the inevitable discovery by the husband of his wife's infidelity what gives the book its value is not the episode of the wife's frailty but the wise far-sighted understanding of the way in which two people physically mentally and morally well equipped to make each other happy gradually drift apart through stubborn adherence to foolish prejudices mistaken reticence petty misunderstandings and a hundred and one trivialities no one of which by itself is worth a second thought while the cumulative effect of them all becomes fatal mr phillips solution of the story in which he makes the wife experience a revulsion of feeling that drives her from her lover back to her husband while the husband after hearing her confession not only forgives her but practically admits that he is glad everything has happened as it has because the effect upon him is to have reawakened his love this solution comes as a disappointment one feels it to be in the nature of an anticlimax to an exceptionally fine piece of work that a man of this husband's conventional conservative type could bring himself to pardon and receive back the woman who admits her guilt with a frankness of speech that makes one wince rings false forgiveness under such circumstances is a delusion and a blunder the ghost of such a past would simply refuse to be laid an interesting sidelight on the concluding chapters of the hungry heart which in point of fact came near to being the author's favorite among all his books is shed by the following anecdote it was pointed out to him one day in friendly criticism that a woman such as the heroine was portrayed to be throughout the first half of the story would neither have remained with her lover nor gone back to her husband but would have lived alone unless some third man eventually came into her life this comment impressed mr phillips to an extent which seemed disproportionate until he confessed that the solution of a third man was precisely what he had planned from the start as definitely as it lay in him to plan anything in advance but he explained when he had reached the midway point his characters took the matter quite out of his hands he suddenly awoke to the realization that his heroine was quite a different woman from what he had all along supposed her to be she made it clear to him that she was not the kind either to hold to the old lover or to take a new one she was the type of woman who would have the courage to go back if i have not made her convincing he concluded to that extent the hungry heart is a failure but he added undauntedly 
I know the type of woman I was after, and I know she would have done just what I made this woman do. Lastly, we have the husband's story, which is the type of book that we had long had the right to expect from Mr. Phillips, and which, if he had been spared, might have been the first of a long series of equal strength and bigness. Like all of this author's best previous work, it is a study of marriage that failed. And the reason that it is a better and bigger book than any of his others is not because of his theme, but because of his workmanship. The thing is better done in its underlying structure, in its working out of details, in all that goes to make up good technique. Robert Herrick, when he wrote The Diary of an American Citizen, attempted to handle much the same subject in the same way, but that book, clever though it was, hardly did more than scratch the surface of the opportunity lurking in his theme. Mr. Phillips dug deeper. He has shown us, in the lives of a certain couple, Godfrey Loring and Edna, his wife, all the artificiality and selfishness, the empty ambitions and false ideals that lie behind the tinsel and glitter of the so-called four hundred. The husband tells the story with great simplicity and directness. He makes no secret of the utter sordidness of their origin in Passaic, New Jersey, of Edna's father, the undertaker, known as Old Weeping Willie, and his own father, honest, innocent soul with a taste for talking what he thought was politics. He makes it clear that Edna married him not for love, but because he was getting the biggest salary of any of the young fellows whom she knew and so offered her the best chance of advancement. She deliberately intended when she married him to get as much out of him as could be gotten by clever driving, nor could she have planned the thing more ruthlessly had she been acquiring a beast of burden instead of a husband. Now the one thing that saves the story and renders it at all possible is the fact that the husband is an exceptional man with that extra sense which constitutes the business instinct and, coupled with it, a saving sense of humor. The early chapters, picturing the transition period while Edna was floundering out of the half-baked standards of Passaic into the midway stage of Brooklyn, are full of those wonderful little flashes of first-hand observation that seem like fragments filched, if not directly out of your life and mine, at least from that of the family next door or of the neighbor across the street. This husband is never for an instant under any illusion about his wife. He realizes her incompetence, the incompetence of thousands of young American wives for the particular work they have undertaken, the work of wife and of mother and of housekeeper. He realizes, too, her craving for social advancement, and, in a half-confessed way, he sympathizes with her and is willing to accept the fruits of her social conquests although he will not raise a finger toward helping her. This, perhaps, is the cleverest touch in Mr. Philip's satire. He does not tell us in so many words that the husband is just as much at fault as the wife, just as unfitted for his task of husband and father and master of the house as she is for her duties. But he makes this perfectly clear and distributes the blame with an admirable equity. If she has been cold and calculating and dishonest in her social life, he has been cold and calculating and dishonest in his business life. If she is meanly and snobbishly ashamed of the people from whom she sprang, so also is he. If she has been too absorbed in her schemes for advancement to give him the companionship due from a wife, he in turn is too absorbed in huge financial deals to give her the love and care due from a husband. In other words, this book might be defined as an indictment of the high life American marriage on the ground of the woman's vaulting ambition and overweening self-importance, and the man's inertia, coupled with his absorption in the busy game of chasing dollars. A large part of the merit of this undeniably big novel lies in what it merely implies, rather than in what it says. To conceive a story of this sort is something in itself to be proud of, but to conceive of telling it through the husband's lips was a stroke of genius. To have told it in any other way would have been to rob it of its greatest merit, the all-pervading sting of its satire. As I have tried frankly to recognize, Mr. Phillips was a writer with many qualities and some defects, like all men who have it in them to do big things. But it would have been easy to forgive more serious faults than his in any one possessing his breadth and depth of interest in the serious problems of American life and his outspoken fearlessness in handling them. There are, unfortunately, few in this country today who are even trying to do the sort of work that he was doing. And the fact that he did it with apparent ease, 
and that he had reached a point where he had begun to do it with triumphant strength multiplies tenfold the tragedy of his untimely death. The interruption of fate at the midpoint in his career has entailed a loss to American fiction, not only irreparable, but one which can never be accurately measured. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Seven Robert Herrick. It was in the autumn of eighteen ninety seven that Professor Robert Herrick, who occupies the chair of rhetoric in the University of Chicago, produced a novel entitled The Gospel of Freedom. His name at that time was not quite unknown in fiction, thanks to a few earlier efforts more notable for manner than for content. Yet the gospel of freedom came quite unheralded, a glad surprise to the serious student of fiction who at that period was forced to take a rather pessimistic view of the future of the American novel. One did not need to read a dozen pages before discovering that here was a man who was familiar with the best of what the modern French school has to offer, who understood wherein lay the strength of Maupassant, of Bourget, of Zola, and in a tentative and by no means inadequate way was trying to profit by their teaching. Its theme was one already familiar to readers of continental literature, the revolt of the modern neurotic woman against the trammels of social conventions, the awakening of the unhappily mated wife to a sense of her inborn right to live her own life in her own way. In other words, it was a variation of the underlying motif of Magda, of Hedda Gabler, of the Doll's House, executed with a nice appreciation of European craftsmanship and an equally subtle insight into peculiarly American conditions. Altogether it was a book of big promise, in spite of considerable unevenness and here and there a touch that was almost crude. At the time it looked bigger no doubt than it does today, as we glance back at it along the vista of his later achievements. One realizes now that he had not yet found himself, that he was working a trifle uncertainly, with tools not quite adapted to his needs, experiencing the dilemma of a foreign-trained machinist attempting to put together American-made implements with nuts and screws cut to a scale of centimeters instead of inches. What he had not yet learned to do, and what he soon realized that he must learn before success could come, was to adapt continental methods to Anglo-Saxon needs, to revise his craftsmanship with the same independent courage with which from the beginning he had chosen his themes. It was during this transition period, this process of finding himself, of discovering just what he was trying to do and how he was trying to do it, that the two books of least interest as stories and of least worth in point of technique were written, The Web of Life and The Real World. One feels in reading them over again today that the two titles in some degree symbolize the mental attitude of their author at that time. Like his heroes, Mr. Herrick was finding the threads of life's web in a rather sorry tangle, and was groping for a solution of the world's real meaning. And so, inevitably, they forced the reader to do some little groping on his own account. In short, like many another author's second and third book, they were disappointing, and people who had based their faith upon the gospel of freedom were justified in asking, Is Mr. Herrick destined to remain in the rank of writers of a single book? But the appearance in due course of time of the common lot and its still more virile successor, the memoirs of an American citizen, answered this question with a vigorous and welcome negative, and foreshadowed the coming of the volume which remains to this day, not only Mr. Herrick's biggest achievement, but the finest, boldest, most representative piece of American fiction that has appeared within the past decade. Together. And this statement is made not merely with Mr. Herrick's subsequent volume, a life for a life, clearly in mind, but largely for the purpose of discriminating sharply against it. A life for a life represents, as we shall presently see, a curious, and it is to be hoped, a transient apostasy. Something still remains in it of the old Herrick. Certain pages here and there, of a purely pictorial character, flash forth, with a graphicness that is almost cruel in its unsparing truth, the swarming, turgid city life of today. Nonetheless, when the sum total of its plus and minus values has been honestly taken, a life for a life must be set down upon the debit side of its author's literary account. In other words, it is a rather audacious, rather splendid failure. 
but before considering this new phase of Mr. Herrick's development, it is essential to run over quite briefly his earlier novels and thus obtain a bird's-eye view of what in each case he has tried to do and how far he has succeeded in doing it. The first thing of which you become aware in taking up the gospel of freedom is the initial debt which its author owed to Ibsen and Zudelman, and to that whole tendency in drama and fiction that took its impulse from Heimath and Hedda Gabler. In other words, its theme is in the main the spirit of revolt of the modern, restless, somewhat neurotic woman against the established conventions and the tragedy which such a revolt entails, because the woman fails to understand that freedom is something that must start from within and not from without. Something that cannot be acquired by a mere payment of money or a flagrant breaking of the marriage bond. Adela Anton is too healthy-minded a young woman to be classed with the Magdas and Hedas of the old world. But she has, to a large extent, a strain of what, for lack of a preciser term, is wont to be stigmatized artistic temperament. She does not quite despise the brick industry on which the colossal fortune of the Antons has been reared, nor the comfortable blocks of brick stock which form her independent means. But she does rebel against the prescribed routine of her conventional social life forces her family to allow her the semi-liberty of a course in the Paris art schools, and at the opening of the book seems in a fair way to marry Simeon Erard, a penniless dabbler in art, a parasite on her uncle's bounty, who has shown much promise in a dozen different lines and accomplishment in none. But before she makes up her mind to bestow her hand and fortune on Erard, in fact before Erard has made up his mind to ask her, a restless, energetic, successful young Westerner, John Wilbur, who is spending a hard-earned vacation in Paris, takes her by storm, dazzles her with the picturesque account of his big achievements in irrigation machinery, and, more particularly, his conquest over men and over natural forces. Marriage with him would mean a splendid partnership, a new and undreamed-of freedom, an opportunity to have a share in the world's big enterprises. The awakening comes quickly. Marriage, she learns with a shock, is not a partnership. It has its obligations, against which she rebels mutely. But of compensations, in the shape of an understanding and interest in her husband's vast business schemes, she finds there is nothing for her. Within a year after her marriage she is declaring bitterly, There is no freedom for women. They are marked incapable from their birth and are supported by men for some obvious and necessary services. Between times they have a few indifferent joys dealt out to them. But what brings about the final wreck of her marriage is not merely temperamental incompatibility, but a difference in standards of honor and business integrity. Wilbur's business conscience is elastic. If he does not actually have a hand in bribing the legislature to pass certain railroad measures that send stocks and bonds soaring upward, he does participate in the profits. And what Adela finds impossible to forgive is that the very house she lives in is paid for with what she persists in regarding as stolen money. Then follow the death of her only child. The arrival in Chicago of Simeon Erard and his somewhat too pronounced friendship with Adela. Her husband's rather vulgar jealousy of the artist. And finally, Adela's open revolt. Her refusal to live any longer in a marriage that she feels is only a bondage, and her departure to Paris for an indefinite period. Reckless of conventions, she openly flaunts her friendship with Erard a friendship which in her defiant mood she is willing to let drift to any length. But Erard, coldly working for his own best interest, bides his time until the news comes that her husband, through the courts, has given the wife her freedom. In this, however, he overreaches himself. This subservience to the world's opinion on the part of the man who had taught her to despise conventions, and to whom until now she would willingly have given herself, brands him, in her eyes, a hypocrite, with whom life would be simply another and ignobler form of bondage. She realizes at last that in her rebellion she has not been attaining freedom, but simply beating herself impotently against the bars of a prison largely of her own making. It has seemed worth while to examine the gospel of freedom at some length, because in it we find already well developed the two themes that in one form or another underlie all Mr. Herrick's subsequent work. THE DISCORDS OF SEX AND THE DISCORDS OF COMMERCIALISM Adela Wilbur's repudiation of her marriage duties, John Wilbur's repudiation of the highest standards of business integrity, are only the first instances in a long series of lives that Mr. Herrick shows us, wrecking themselves on the same dangerous shoals. 
the web of life and the real world his next two books in point of time need only a brief mention because they are rather loose in structure and of no great significance in the history of his development the web of life may be conveniently defined as a male gospel of freedom a man's rebellion against the obligations which the world's conventions thrust upon him just as adela wilbur rebelled against the obligations that life laid upon her howard summers is a promising young physician whose good fortune it is to find on landing in chicago that some old friends of the family the influential and wealthy hitchcocks are disposed to help him that the daughter louise hitchcock looks upon him with favor that a place is open for him on the staff of the famous dr lindsay in short that he is on the high road to fortune but his professional conscience will not leave him in peace his impractical ideals teach him that it is wrong for a physician to accept payment beyond a mere pittance his intolerance of the conventions of a fashionable practice makes his early expulsion from dr lindsay's office a foregone conclusion and the long disheartening hand-to-mouth struggle that follows with all its inherent miseries and the incidental loss of the woman he loves is needful to bring him to a sane understanding of the necessity of accepting the world as it is and effecting an honourable compromise between reality and our ideals the real world while it is an attempt to develop still further this same idea is mainly interesting as a study of individual lives the gradual building up of jack pemberton's character from his early boyhood isolated on a small farm on the main coast until he finally achieves success prosperity and happiness is undoubtedly a fine and strong piece of portraiture executed with a more assured touch than mr herrick had previously achieved the high purposes which take permanent hold upon the lad at the prompting of a girl seemingly forever beyond his reach and which continue to force him onward and upward step by step even when the girl herself has disappointed his ideals and would have dragged him down with her are all interpreted with such sympathetic understanding that the secrets of a human soul are laid bare before us and we understand minutely and intimately how jack pemberton succeeded in his endeavour to keep faith with life but mr herrick's strength lies not in the probing analysis of individual lives but in the broad comprehensive interpretation of human motives and tendencies in the mass and this gift of generalization this rare ability to treat life on an epic scale with a bold sweep of brush strokes an imposing breadth of canvas has developed and progressed steadily with each successive volume up to the full ripeness of together the first of his stories however that showed clearly wherein his real strength lay was the common lot like all stories of the bigger type it has a twofold motive first a specific story of the struggle of a young architect between his artistic ideals on the one hand and business success on the other secondly the big general far-reaching problem whether the common lot the comparative obscurity and narrowness of the vast majority of lives is not better and happier than wealth and position attained at the cost of self-esteem francis jackson begins with splendid ambitions and had the millionaire uncle who gave him his training at the paris beaux-arts also made him his heir instead of leaving the bulk of his fortune to found an industrial school the nephew might never have felt the temptation to be untrue to his art or to compromise with his conscience but under the goad of vanity and ambition and a feverish desire for wealth he yields to the tempting offers of a dishonest contractor consents little by little to turn out inferior work to permit shameless tampering with specifications to connive at the bribery of building inspectors in short to lend himself to every crooked trick known to the profession and one fine day retribution overtakes him he is disgraced in the eyes of his friends and relatives because they discover that the industrial school erected under his direction with his uncle's money is a fraudulent piece of work from cellar to roof this however can be and is hushed up but another and worse disaster follows the destruction by fire of a so-called fireproof hotel which with his full knowledge the contractor has so skimped and slighted that it is little more than a cardboard death trap and even if the scandal could be silenced jackson could never silence the memory of the victim's screams as they flung themselves from the windows or fell inward to a still worse fate the experience leaves francis jackson a sadder but far wiser architect and although he lives down the scandal he has learned his lesson well that it is better to share the common lot and be at peace with oneself than at the cost of self-respect to attain wealth and power and the envious admiration of the world 
because there are few things that make any great difference to real men and women, and one of the least is the casual judgment of their fellow men. The memoirs of an American citizen, which might with equal aptitude have been called the Confessions of a Chicago Packer, treats more specifically, and from the opposite point of view, the whole big problem of honest and dishonest business methods. Edward Harrington comes to Chicago, a friendless lad without money or prospects. He begins as driver for a retail market, and from this he works himself up, step by step, by clever tricks, unscrupulous moves, dishonest deals and combinations, until he ends as controlling power of the meat trust, master of the destinies of many railways, banks and trust companies, and United States Senator from Illinois. There is not a step in his upward path that by the higher standards of honesty is quite beyond reproach, not an achievement that is not somewhere besmirched. Yet, as he unfolds this very frank and ingenuous chronicle, you feel that the man is honest in his frankness, that he believes himself to be in the right, and justifies to himself each and every questionable act. He believes that it is best for the world that he shall succeed, and in order to succeed he must fight the world with its own weapons. And at the end he looks out over the city of Chicago with its drifting smoke, its ceaseless traffic. Quote, I too was a part of this. The thought of my brain, the labor of my body, the will within me had gone to the making of this world. There were my plants, my car line, my railroads, my elevators, my lands, all good tools in the infinite work of this world. Conceived for good or for ill, brought into being by fraud or daring, what man could judge their worth? There they were, a part of God's great world. They were done, and mine was the hand. Let another more perfect turn them to a larger use. Nevertheless, on my labor, on me he must build. Involuntarily my eyes rose from the ground and looked straight before me to the vista of time. Surely there was another scale, a grander one, and by this I should not be found wholly wanting. There in a paragraph we get the colossal, egotistical, invincible confidence of the successful magnet in the justice of his cause. And yet, had he stopped here, Mr. Herrick's picture would have remained unfinished and not quite convincing. But, with unerring instinct, he has added here and there the needful little ironic touch. This masterful man, so sure of himself, so infallible, so far beyond the reach of malice or envy, knows that there are just two or three people in the world whose approbation he craves and cannot win. The old judge who once befriended him, and now does not see him when they pass. The trusted employee who will no longer serve him. His brother's wife, who in early days might have been his own, had he chosen to speak, and who now would starve and see her family starve with her, rather than take a penny of his money. It is the knowledge of these facts that rankles and adds a dash of bitterness to his final triumph. To sum up this brief review of Mr. Herrick's past achievements, the general impression that they make upon the critical mind is that, granting their strength, their subtle understanding of life, their admirable lights and shades, their frequent splendid brilliancy of description, they after all suggest not so much an accomplishment as an apprenticeship to something bigger and higher. To be sure, they are American, unmistakably so, the product of keen interest and intimate understanding of the conditions of life in this country, and more specifically of life in the big progressive Middle West. And considered as individual volumes, stories of separate human lives, little groups of humanity working out their individual destinies, they deserve to stand high in the list of the best fiction our writers have produced in the last decade. But from the first volume to the last we cannot escape the impression that Mr. Herrick's dominant interest is in something beyond the mere story he has to tell, that his ideal of fiction is to present through the medium of individual men and women the big basic problems on which depend the welfare of a people, and what is more, so to present them as to force the reader, whether he will or not, to take thought of them. Hitherto, however, he has not been ready to accomplish on a big scale the sort of novel of which he has so evidently dreamed the novel of wide, sweeping, Zolaesque magnitude, with its symbolic title, its crowded canvas, its motley panorama of human lives. Central ideas he has had, to be sure, and his titles as well as his themes have not been lacking in symbolism, but there was a certain vagueness about them, a lack of specific intent. One might, without serious injustice, 
shuffle his titles, and redistribute them. In a general way, the central characters in all these books are struggling in the web of life, learning their lesson of disillusion from the real world, rebelling against the common lot, and thirsting for the gospel of freedom. It is curious to see how, with each successive book, Mr. Herrick has broadened his field of vision as his knowledge of life has widened, how he began as a psychologue of the school of Bourget and Henry James, and little by little swung around to the freer, more objective methods of the realist, caring less and less for the vivisection of a human heart under a microscope, and more and more for tracing the orbit of an ethical problem through a telescope. Sooner or later, those who had faith in him felt sure that Mr. Herrick would produce a really big book, perhaps the first of a series of big books. And suddenly, and rather sooner than was expected, he justified this belief with, together, his fine, sane, fearless study of American marriage. It may be said with some assurance that no American novel of such ambitious purpose and such a sweeping amplitude of outlook has been written since Frank Norris gave us the opening volumes of his Epic of the Wheat, and no such relentless probing into the subtle characteristics of American womanhood since Robert Grant precipitated a war of critics over unleavened bread. And there is this important distinction to be made in favor of Mr. Herrick's book that whereas Robert Grant gave us in Selma White just one memorable type, the author of Together, has given us a score of types, every one of them undeniably, surprisingly, triumphantly true and essentially American. As we have already seen, throughout the wide diversity of his themes, one of Mr. Herrick's persistent preoccupations is the tragedy of mismated marriage. Sometimes, as in the Gospel of Freedom, the woman simply mistook for love her unbounded enthusiasm for the man's fighting strength, his virile power to achieve success. Sometimes, as in the real world, she makes the more sordid and less pardonable blunder of thinking that wealth and social prestige will compensate her for the absence of love. Sometimes, as in the common lot, she loves not the actual man whom she has married, but a figment of her imagination, an ideal that she has created in his image. And when one day he stands revealed and she sees him as he is, the whole universe crumbles miserably to pieces around her. In comparison, however, with Together, all these earlier themes take on the aspect of preparatory studies, trials of strength, as it were, preparing the way to his first big unqualified achievement. There is no useful purpose to be served by attempting to analyze the central story of Together. Like L'Argent, or La Samoire, it has no central plot in the usual conventional sense. But just as Zola's novels are the embodiment of some big symbolic idea, frenzied finance personified by the bourse, intemperance by the wine shop, earth's universal motherhood by the soil, so Robert Herrick has for his central figure the personification of marriage. The married life of Isabel Price and John Long, with whose wedding the volume opens, leaving them henceforth man and wife before the law, before their kind, one and one and yet not two, is obviously not intended by the author to be more typical or more significant than the score of other marriages of which he unveils for us the intimate joys and griefs. Every well-composed canvas must have its central group, its focal point towards which its significant lines converge. But in Together, we must bear in mind that it is not Isabelle Price who is the real protagonist, but marriage with a capital M, the symbolic figure of American wifehood. Graphic as the picture is of this particular couple's first mistakes, their temporary and makeshift readjustment, and their slow, reluctant awakening to actualities, this special side of the book, considered as an individual human story, is only a fragment, an unfinished pattern, a single thread in the intricate and complex fabric of human lives that the author has patiently and splendidly woven. It is not the individual nature of Isabel Price that we remember as we call to mind those bold opening chapters, which are probably the most thought-compelling portrayal of a young couple crossing the threshold of married life that any author has given since Maupassant wrote his unforgettable pages in Une Vie, she stands for us simply as the average type of young American womanhood, entering blithely, unthinkingly, unwarned, upon the most serious obligations of life, more engrossed in the guests, the presence, the fit of her wedding gown, the brilliant social function of which for the moment she is the center, than she is in the years of intimate companionship that lie before her. And then, after all has been done, 
as ordained by the church according to the rules of society, and it remains for man and wife to make of it what they would or could. The inevitable awakening comes, and they look into each other's eyes, as countless thousands of wedded couples have done before them, and realize that they are looking into the eyes of strangers. It is not on this particular couple that our gaze should be focused as we read, but on those countless couples that preceded them and the countless other couples that are fated to follow. The crucial point is not the mere fact that this particular marriage was a mistake, but that it was one of the millions of mistakes women make out of the girlish guess, mistakes arising from blind ignorance of self and life. In short, the recurrent burden of Robert Herrick's theme is the hidden, insistent, inevitable tragedy underlying countless married lives, the tragedy so often summed up carelessly, even scornfully, with the flippant euphemism of incompatibility. A plunge in the dark, a bewildered awakening, a losing fight for readjustment, an inevitable revulsion. Such is Mr. Herrick's epitome of thousands of marriages the world over. And while this holds true for the world at large, the conditions, he seems to think, are peculiarly aggravated in America. Our lives here are lived to a great extent at fever heat. The husbands tend more and more to consume their vitality in ceaseless nerve-wracking strife for more and ever more wealth and power. And the wives are daily sacrificing to vanity and pleasure, social leadership and browning societies more and more of the obsolescent virtue of domesticity but it would be a mistake to assume that Mr. Herrick finds no happy marriages in America, or even that he would assert that the happy marriage is a rare exception. The reproach which has been too frequently made against together, namely that by assembling a score or more of ill-mated couples, truant husbands, erring wives, the whole sad gamut of incompatibility, infidelity, and the divorce courts, he has shown a distorted perspective, a false sense of proportion, really rests on no firmer ground than a similar reproach against Uncle Tom's Cabin, Le Somois, and every other big epic study of ethical problems. Mr. Herrick is here studying unhappy marriages, not happy ones, and with the latter type he has no more concern than the pathologist engaged in a research of malarial germs has with healthy human beings or healthy mosquitoes. And equally mistaken is the effort to find in together a remedy for matrimonial discord. Mr. Herrick simply records a certain number of typical cases. He attempts no solution. He merely gives us the facts and says in effect, Here is what I find. Think this over for yourselves. How to remedy the prevailing lack of common interest between husband and wife, the men engrossed in the great game of amassing wealth, the women equally engrossed in the game of spending it, the decrease in domesticity, in motherhood, in the old-fashioned family affection and loyalty, these are conditions which he depicts without bias and without comment, but with the calm assurance of one who is certain of his facts and of the high moral worth of his purpose. And for this reason, together is a book which, whatever may be its relative value as a contribution to literature, belongs, as regards the spirit in which it is conceived, in the category of Zola's Fécondité and Tolstoy's Kreutzer Sonata. It seemed reasonable to assume, after a triumph of such magnitude, that our author's course was definitely laid at least for some years to come, that together was the harbinger of a lengthening series of similar vigorous studies of the crucial problems in our busy, arduous American life of today, handled with the same fearless and robust naturalism. For this reason, when A Life for a Life was published, it could scarcely fail to bring to a good many of its author's sincere well-wishers something of a shock when readers who had hitherto not been in sympathy with Mr. Herrick's aims and achievements permitted themselves to say somewhat patronizingly that a life for a life was in a distinctly different vein from many of his previous work, and that he seemed at last to be really in earnest, it was only natural that his admirers should approach the book with rather somber misgivings. Here was a writer who for twelve years had produced very nearly an annual volume, every one of which had borne witness that he was not merely in earnest, but just about as earnest as, humanly speaking, it is possible for a writer to be, earnest, that is, in his determination to handle the big truths of life as frankly and sincerely as lay within his power, and to satisfy his own conscience regarding the substance and the method of his work, unmindful whether the general public liked it or not. He had steeped himself in the theories and practice of the Continental School as opposed to the English and American, 
that was the real secret of his fearlessness and his strength if now for the first time he had so altered his method that any reader could make the mistake of attributing to him a new-born earnestness it could mean only one thing that he had begun to obtrude his own personal opinions that to some extent at least he had lost that purely objective attitude which has always been one of his chief assets and this was precisely what had happened a life for a life is as radical a departure from the substance and the method of together as in zola's case les quatre évangiles were from the substance and method of les rougeons macquarts it was small wonder that to many a reader the volume brought keen disappointment small wonder that a review like the london academy found itself gravely saying it is rather baffling when we remember the high standard attained by mr harrigan together a book which seemed to hold clear indications of a masterpiece later on to find that in his latest volume he lapses almost into mediocrity yet on the other hand there were those who hailed a life for a life as the author's high water mark it contained scarcely anything likely to offend those poor squeamish souls who shrank from the fine honesty of together it dealt with what newspapers like to speak of as live issues and the one fault of construction in its closely interwoven plot is that it is too careful too symmetrical to ring true what then is the matter with the book the answer is so simple and so obvious that if you cannot see for yourself there is small use in trying to point it out to you mr herrick has made that disastrous mistake that many another and bigger novelist has made before him of becoming more interested in his text than in his story of losing his clear perception of men and women in his sociological theories about man and woman of blurring his whole picture because he tries to paint the universe at once what he has undertaken to do so far as one may venture to expound his purpose is to crowd into the limits of a single canvas the sum total of those social and economic questions that are today responsible for most of our national unrest it involves problems as wide apart as the curbing of the trusts the suppression of anarchy the justification of trade unions the regulating of the social evil it covers a vaster field than even uncle tom's cabin for although that book dealt with a problem nationwide in interest it at least narrowed down to a single question with but two possible answers a life for a life propounds a score of questions each with more size than can readily be counted in all modern fiction only one other volume comes to mind so all-embracing in its summing up of existing social conditions zola's paris and paris does not occupy a high place in the life-work of emile zola in undertaking to epitomize a life for a life one feels something of that awkwardness which is experienced in an attempt to pick up any rather bulky object that seems to protrude an uncomfortable number of points and angles here however in a brief and somewhat ragged abstract is the substance of it hugh grant a foundling indebted to his foster father even for the name he bears leaves his country home yields to the lure of the city the author nowhere says that the city in question is new york but his local color fits no other place on the terrestrial globe the city's wealth and power are symbolized in the person of alexander arnold banker and multimillionaire who gives you a chance for no better reason than that arnold had once known the elder grant and incidentally cheated him out of a fortune hugh finds lodgings almost directly beneath a mammoth electric advertising sign that perpetually flashes the word success into the eyes of men incidentally he forms a friendship with a man at war with society who is known to the reader by no other name than the anarch also he meets a sweatshop girl a certain young jewess named mina and witnesses the hideous accident by which she is maimed for life and driven into what mr kipling has called the oldest profession in the world these details sound fragmentary that is the inevitable penalty of overcrowding a pattern now arnold banker and millionaire maker and destroyer of men likes young grant and proceeds to try him out by sending him west and using him as the tool with which to acquire certain vast western properties consolidate amalgamate play all the tricks of the big financial game heedless of the trail of ruin that the process may leave in its wake hugh being what he is fails to live up to arnold's expectations he is too clean-minded or has breathed too much clean western air or if you please he is as arnold thinks too big a fool to succeed in the modern business struggle then there is still another complicating factor 
Like Polonius, Arnold has a daughter, and like Hamlet, young Grant harps upon her. Like Hamlet also, when the time comes for him to accept the good things of life that are offered to him, he practically tells her, Get thee to a nunnery, because to win her means acceptance of modern economic conditions, and to this he cannot bring himself. Having symbolized all the varied strata of society, all the warring creeds and doctrines of the economic world, Mr. Herrick obviously felt the need of some impressive spectacular climax, some titanic convulsion of nature, which, like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, would symbolize the wiping out of the old order of things and the ushering in of a new. This he accomplishes by the simple device of transferring the San Francisco earthquake and fire to New York City. Pictorially, his presentment of the vast upheaval of a metropolis, the clamor of men and the crash of falling buildings, the writhings of massed humanity in their death throes leaves nothing to be desired. But what one does resent is that nice subservience of chance which obligingly lets all the characters in the book meet one another at the psychic moment in the midst of chaos. Hugh, shaken from bed in the cosmic crash, casually wanders out through reeling streets, meets Mina, the woman of the gutter, and exchanges with her what Homer would have called winged words, then moves onward through showers of stone and sheets of flame, and casually rescues from a mob Arnold's daughter, Alexandra. Then follow more winged words, in the course of which the girl rises to the heights of unselfishness that he once had vainly demanded of her, and he explains that it is now too late, since he is a sick man dying of cancer. Moving onward along more reeling streets, they reach her father's bank, where Alexandra learns that her husband, I forgot to mention that she had married her father's partner, lies dead in the safe deposit vault, smothered by the very mechanism provided to protect his wealth. Her father, meanwhile, is speeding eastward in his automobile toward the Brooklyn Bridge, plowing a juggernaut course through frenzied mobs, when just on the threshold of safety, the Anarch, who turns out to be old Arnold's disowned son, arises out of darkness an avenging nemesis, springs into the machine, swings it around and drives himself and his father back to their fate in the flame-swept city. As above pointed out, the effect of this synopsis is to leave an irritating sense of detached fragments, and that is precisely the sense one gets from the book itself. It conveys the impression not of a vast, complex, closely reticulated scheme of society, but of a handful of individuals afloat in some sort of an attenuated social medium, who by some strange law of attraction miraculously meet each other under seemingly impossible circumstances. Picture for a moment the chaos of a mammoth city overwhelmed by earthquake and by fire, a man might go mad at such a time, impotently seeking the loved ones whom he could not find. Mr. Herrick simply lost his sense of reality in the latter part of his book. It is a thing he never did before, and one sincerely hopes that he will never do it again. Much symbolism, it would seem, hath made him mad, and furthermore, it is an obscure symbolism that leaves the reader groping. This, then, today, is the position of Robert Herrick. For nearly a score of years he has been true to a definite ideal, writing to please himself, regardless of popular approval. And through pleasing himself, he attained at last, in together, that pleasantest of victories, a popular endorsement of his own methods and standards. And then suddenly, inexplicably, he chooses to fling aside the victories attained, abandon a hard-won battlefield, and branch off in a new direction to fight on untried ground. It is to be hoped, not only for his own sake, but for the greater good of American fiction, that, before it is too late, Mr. Herrick will go back again to the firm ground of his acknowledged victories. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 8. Edith Wharton. In undertaking a critical estimate of any of our modern novelists, there is usually a good deal to be learned from a study of their early work, the volumes that stand as a record of their apprenticeship. In the case of Mrs. Wharton, however, we have to dispense with any such sidelight. When her first collection of short stories appeared in 1899, under the title of The Greater Inclination, the most salient fact about them and the one which brought swift recognition was their mature power, their finished art. 
as it seemed to us then, the clear-cut, polished brilliance of those eight keen studies of human heart-pangs represented the full development of a talent of unusual magnitude. Now, from the vantage point of a dozen years, we can see that the author of The House of Mirth and Madame de Trames was still far from having found the full measure of her strength that a plenitude of culture and social wisdom had veiled an unsure technique, and that a normal sympathy for human weakness was either lacking or else deliberately masked under an assumption of amused irony. It is possible to show with a fair degree of conclusiveness that in these respects Mrs. Wharton's later work is bigger and stronger and more human. Yet the changes are of a subtle kind that would not strike the casual reader's naked eye and for that reason it is more helpful, in considering her general characteristics as a storyteller, and before taking up her separate volumes, to ignore any division into periods, and to treat of her style, her methods, her philosophy of life as though there were no essential difference between her first book and her last. Now the first thing that must strike a discriminating critic, whether he makes her acquaintance through the medium of the muse's tragedy, or the letters, is that he has to do with an author of rare mental subtlety and unusual breadth of culture. A worldly wise person with wide cosmopolite sympathies, yet rather rigid prejudices of social caste. One would guess, with no further help than the light shed by her own writings, that here was a mind that might be likened to a chamber of art treasures, not overcrowded, but sufficiently rich to offer a pleasing harmony of color and form. Such at all events is the impression that one gathers from her stage setting, she lingers over each interior, its portieres and wallpapers, its etchings and mezzotints, its choice old furniture and fragile porcelain with the grudging reluctance of a bibliophile relinquishing a first edition or a priceless binding. So far as the atmosphere of her stories goes, there is everywhere a pervading sense of art and literature and culture, a sense, as it were, of sunlight softly filtering through richly stained glass, of life seen relentlessly within the limits of a definite angle. Mrs. Wharton's literary activity has resulted up to the present day in somewhat more than fifty short stories and novelettes, and three novels, and of these the great majority deal frankly with the literary and artistic circle. One has only to run over in memory the separate stories to realize the truth of this. There are, for instance, no less than a dozen in which the hero is by profession an author. Every reader recalls at once the muse's tragedy, souls belated, full circle, expiation, the legend, the touchstone, and there is no use in amplifying the list. And next to authors her favorite heroes are artists, as witness the portrait, the recovery, the Rembrandt, the moving finger, the daunt Diana, the letters, the verdict, and the potboiler. Yes, her angle of outlook upon the world is rather narrow, but, like the proverbial still waters, within that angle her thought runs rather deep. Yet if Mrs. Wharton shows a predilection for artistic and academic society, she nevertheless has a far-reaching, I was tempted to say an exaggerated, instinct for social values. In all the various settings of her stories, whether in the self-satisfied provincialism of a New England college town, or the full flood tide of New York life today, or of Lombardy a century ago, she never for an instant allows you to lose sight of the fact that there exists a local social code more potent than any laws of Medes and Persians. A fine stratified caste system, too attenuated for any but the native born to grasp in all its details, yet inflexible in matters of cause and effect. Her subtle sense of the far-reaching significance of some quite trivial, perhaps unconscious infringement of these unwritten rules of conduct, gives us the real key to a number of her strongest situations her understanding of human nature, her relentless pursuit of a motive down to its ultimate analysis, her deliberate stripping off of the very last veils of pretense, showing us the sordidness and cowardice of human souls in all their nudity, are unsurpassed by any other woman novelist now living. She has a trick not merely of describing even her secondary characters so clearly that you feel you can see them both inside and out, but she often flings out some single line of description which ever afterwards sticks to that particular character like a burr, and is probably the first thing we think of each time that character reappears. For instance, in Souls Belated, Mrs. Tillotson Sr. dreaded ideas as much as a draft in her back. In A Coward, Mrs. Carstyle was one of the women who make refinement vulgar. In The Mission of Jane, 
Mrs. Lethbury is described as a woman, most of whose opinions were heirlooms. She was proud of their age and saw no reason for discarding them while they were still serviceable. And still again, in the portrait, Vard, the political boss, is described to us as a man who had gulped his knowledge standing as he had snatched his food from lunch counters. The wonder of it lay in his extraordinary power of assimilation. And such examples could be multiplied indefinitely. But this is merely a superficial aspect of Mrs. Wharton's treatment of character and of life. And, to some extent, the surface sparkle of her style is at times a blemish. We find ourselves straying away from the central interest of the story in order to relish for a moment the sheer verbal cleverness of some casual epigram, such as, Genius is of small use to a woman who does not know how to do her hair. Or, to many women, such a man would be as unpardonable as to have one's carriage seen at the door of a cheap dressmaker. Her whole attitude toward the personages of her stories is a direct application of La Rochefoucauld's maxim that in the sorrows and misfortunes of our friends we find something that is not altogether displeasing. And her stories allow her abundant opportunity to do this. From first to last they deal with the victims of fate men and women who are caught in the meshes of circumstance and struggle with as hopeless impotence as so many fish in a dragnet. Mrs. Wharton may not be conscious of it, but there is a great deal of predestination in the philosophy of her stories. Nearly all her heroes and heroines seem foreordained to failure. Of struggle, in the sense in which drama is defined as a struggle, a conflict of wills, her books contain little or nothing. Her tragedies belong to one or the other of two classes, or to a combination of the two. On the one hand, to the complications arising from not understanding, from the impossibility of ever wholly getting inside another person's mind, and on the other, from the realization that one cannot escape from one's environment, that one's whole family and race have for generations been relentlessly weaving a network of custom and precedent too strong for the individual to break. As for the first of these tragic keynotes, that of misunderstanding, it is only necessary to glance through a few of the separate stories chosen, almost at random, to see how the word recurs over and over with or without variations, like a light motif. Thus, in the story entitled In Trust, Halliden sums up the crucial point with the words, I can't make her see that I'm differently situated. In The Last Asset, Garnet lays his finger on the difficulty. Ah! You don't know your daughter. In the portrait, Mrs. Mellish says, I wish you'd explain. And Lilo answers, Would there be any failures if one could explain them? In Souls Belated, Lydia asks piteously, You do understand, don't you? And the heroine of The Muse's Tragedy says pathetically, I shall never be quite so lonely again now that someone knows. That's the dreadful part of it said Mrs. Westall in The Reckoning, the not understanding. And even in the Daunt Diana, where the idol of old Humphrey Meave's heart was not a woman but a statue, the same light motif recurs in the concluding paragraph. Now, at last, we understand each other. The other tragic motive, that of the inexorable demands of social traditions, the unwritten law of noblesse oblige, we find forming the very warp and woof of all Mrs. Wharton's bigger and more serious efforts. In the House of Mirth, Lily Bart is tossed as helplessly as a cork in the whirls and eddies of the social stream, tossed and buffeted and finally dragged under with her eyes wide open to her own helplessness. In The Valley of Decision, Odo Valseca and Fulvia Vivaldi sacrifice their happiness to the obligations of rank, a prince's duty to his people. And they do this not in the spirit of generous sacrifice, but rather because they recognize the impossibility of doing anything else. And so again in Madame de Trems, even an American finds that all the vaunted freedom and independence of our republic avails nothing when confronted by the impalpable yet unyielding wall of French family tradition and prejudice. So much for the general character of Mrs. Wharton's situations and problems. Before turning to take a more specific glance at some of the separate stories, it is well to get the following points clearly in mind regarding her technique of construction. Mrs. Wharton is one of those exceptional writers who do not greatly concern themselves with conventional rules of length and breadth. Economy of means is a principle which never binds her against her will. 
her short stories frequently lengthen out into the structure and dimensions of a novelette. Her novelettes might so easily have been expanded into full-length novels. She writes apparently to suit herself in whatever way the narrative comes most naturally to her. A mot passant with a different ideal of story structure, a more relentless self-discipline, would have used a vigorous pruning knife on almost any of her stories and gained, it might be, sharper effects, but at the sacrifice of much delightful cleverness in some rare and subtle half-tones. We must accept Mrs. Wharton as she is, recognizing, frankly, that she is one of those writers who must do the thing their own way if they are to do it at all. But do not let us fall into the widespread error of assuming that because her stories are so remarkably good she necessarily has a flawless technique. It would be impracticable as well as bewildering to attempt a detailed survey of all or even a majority of Mrs. Wharton's stories. We must necessarily make a slender choice, touching only the higher places. The first volume, however, The Greater Inclination, needs closer attention for the purpose of pointing out some structural weaknesses. The opening story, The Muse's Tragedy, deals with a young critic's interest in an older woman who in earlier years was the source of inspiration to a now deceased poet. Daniers the critic has learned to know Mrs. Annerton first as the Sylvia of Vincent Rendell's verse. Secondly, through the gossip of a quite negligible woman, Mrs. Memorall. Thirdly, by direct association with Mrs. Annerton herself. And lastly, through her voluntary self-revelation, when in one sentence she not only destroys Danier's hopes, but sweeps away the entire legend that had gathered around her. It is because Vincent Rendell didn't love me that there is no hope for you. Now the central idea of this story is clear as crystal, the tragedy of an unloved woman as seen through the eyes of another man. Two men and one woman and a single point of view. That, I think, is the way Mrs. Wharton would have written the story ten years later. She would have done it more in the manner of the dilettante, and by doing so have gained in power. A Journey, Mrs. Wharton's second story, offers one of the strongest situations she ever used. A woman bringing her invalid husband home to New York discovers in the morning, shortly after leaving Buffalo, that he is lying dead in his berth. To avoid being put off the train, she all day long keeps up the pretense that he is too ill to be disturbed, and breaks down under the strain only at the moment when the train glides into the Grand Central Station. Now the greatness of a short story very largely depends upon the trick of choosing all details of structure, with the idea of making each in turn add its share to the poignancy of the situation. In the present case, it seems axiomatic that the ultimate tragedy of the situation would depend upon the degree of affection that the wife felt for the dead man. Mrs. Wharton has chosen to tell us without reserve that the wife had ceased to care for him at all. She is a frail woman, physically unstrung, a little frightened at her isolation and helplessness. But that ultimate turn of the screw which comes of a great personal bereavement is missing. And thirdly, we come to that much-praised story, The Pelican. The history of a woman who, finding herself a widow with a small child and no property, undertakes to support herself by lecturing in hotel parlors and before women's clubs. She has a scant mentality, but she makes a moderate success, thanks to her upper lip, her dimple, and her Greek. Thanks also to encyclopedias and an indulgent public that sympathizes with her desire to educate her boy. Thirty years later, she is still making the rounds of clubs and parlors for the purpose of raising money to educate the same boy. Now the crucial moment of the story comes when the boy, a bearded man of thirty, runs across her at a hotel, discovers her subterfuge, and demands an explanation. All this is natural enough, but the story is told in the first person by an old friend of the mother. The son drags this old friend, a stranger to him, into his mother's presence, and before him denounces her in terms that make one wince. His whole manner is in bad taste. Perhaps Mrs. Wharton meant him to be precisely that kind of a man, but one doubts it. At all events, if she were writing that story today, she would not have made him a man of quite that kind. In this way we might take up those early stories one by one and show how they miss that fine perfection which Mrs. Wharton began to show in crucial instances, and which she shows so triumphantly in The Descent of Man. It is hard in speaking of this third volume to discriminate in favor of any particular stories. They are all so extremely good. In the one that lends its title to the book, we have the delighted irony of the struggle of old Professor Linyard between the hobby of his life on the one hand and the practical needs of daily sustenance on the other. 
his heart is in the ethereal reactions of the infusoria and the unconscious cerebrations of the amoeba he has contempt for the world at large and writes what he thinks to be a biting satire on the modern popular thirst for books of pseudo-science but the public insists on taking his satiric volume the vital thing in earnest and on making a lion of him and when we take leave of the poor professor he is still planning for some time or other to go back to his serious work in life the amoeba but he has just signed a profitable contract for a sequel to the vital thing but unquestionably if we must discriminate we should do so in favor of the other two the story of a woman twice divorced and a third time wedded when waythorn married alice varick who had earlier been alice haskett and had brought with her haskett's little daughter he had fancied that a woman can shed her past like a man but in this he was to learn slowly that he was mistaken both of his predecessors are still alive both of them by a series of quite natural coincidences come into contact with himself and alice partly through business relations partly through social exigencies he rebels at first fiercely yet impotently then little by little accepts the inevitable and the curtain falls at last on the group of all three husbands past and present assembled in waythorn's sitting-room with alice placidly pouring tea for them there is not a single brush-stroke a single touch of colour in the whole picture that one could afford to alter it is a little masterpiece of its kind a deliciously ironical apotheosis of conventionalism these examples suffice to show the peculiar and inimitable quality of mrs wharton's gift for the short story when she is at her best the later stories differ often in their specific kind but scarcely any of them show a higher excellence than she had already attained in the descent of man it is a temptation to linger over such a delicate piece of artistry as the daunt diana in which an impecunious art collector after having long and hopelessly coveted a famous collection of rare antiques unexpectedly inherits a fortune buys the collection and then finds himself more unhappy than before because the collection is not really his it has not been gathered slowly and laboriously piece by piece it lacks that ultimate zest known to all true collectors that of pursuit and conquest he has no other remedy than to sell the collection at auction scatter it to the four corners of europe make the greater part of it practically inaccessible and then begin over again and squander the residue of his fortune in tracking down and buying back each one of the scattered treasures then again there is the letters a cruel little story of a man's easy-going selfishness and a woman's limitless tolerance when vincent deering is left a widower it seems to lizzie west who for years has been his little daughter's daily teacher and companion and for months has listened to his protestations of love that now after a decent interval they may marry deering is an artist and has made his home in france but now money complications summon him to america lizzie writes to him at first each day then once a week then at longer intervals but never a line comes back from him two years pass then one day she casually runs across him in a restaurant at heart she is unchanged but externally she is a different lizzie from the one he knew and forgot she has had a small fortune left her by a distant relative and prosperity has already set its mark upon her deering finds an ingenious and convincing explanation for his long silence an explanation that sets him in a noble light of self-sacrifice and swept along in the full tide of his eloquence lizzie forgives him and surrenders herself and her fortune it is not until some time after their marriage that she accidentally comes across in an old trunk all her former letters to him there is nothing strange in the mere fact of finding them it is the further detail that they are unopened that he never took the trouble to break their seals that brings enlightenment in her first passionate resentment she wants him to know that she has found him out wants to taunt him with his shallowness and his hypocrisy and then to leave him and some such ending would have been the blunder of a lesser talent mrs wharton was wiser than that she knew that for the lizzie wests of this world though an idol may be shattered there remains no resource but to go on worshipping the fragments she understood now he was not the hero of her dreams but he was the man she loved but to speak separately of each short story which for one reason or another stands out conspicuously beyond its neighbours in these several volumes would be to consume a disproportionate space and time upon only one side of mrs wharton's literary activities 
she began by proving her easy mastery over the short story form. The interesting question remained whether she would be equally dexterous in her management of structure in the full-length novel. For this reason, it is worth while to examine at some length her first and most ambitious experiment in that direction, the Valley of Decision. She was fortunate at the outset in her choice of a subject peculiarly congenial to her temperament and acquired tastes. Her ambition was to sum up, in a single volume, Italian life as a whole in the latter half of the eighteenth century, that crucial settecento, which has aptly been compared to the closing act of a tragedy. It was a period of fallacious calm, following the war of the Austrian succession, when beneath the surface all Italy was seething with undercurrents of rebellion against the old established order of things, when the little Italian courts were still dozing in fancied security under the wing of Bourbon and Habsburg suzerains, when clergy and nobles still clung tenaciously to their class privileges and united in their efforts to repress the spread of learning, when throngs of the ignorant and superstitious still crowded the high roads to the shrines of popular saints, and a small but growing number of enlightened spirits met in secret conclave to discuss new and forbidden doctrines of philosophy and science. It is a big subject and one full of epic values, a subject which it is easy to imagine a Balzac or a Tolstoy treating in the bold, sweeping, impressionistic way that it demands. But it was not easy to imagine in advance what an introspective writer such as Mrs. Wharton had hitherto shown herself could make of such a theme. That the resulting volume showed much comparative excellence came as a pleasant surprise. She brought to her task no small amount of erudition. She was saturated to her fingertips with the historical facts of the period. The motley and confusing tangle of petty dukedoms, the warring claims of Austria and of Spain. She gave us not merely a broad canvas, but a moving panorama of the life of those restless times, presenting with a certain dramatic power and a clear sense of relative values the discontent of the masses, the petty intrigues of church and aristocracy the gilded uselessness of the typical fine lady with her cavaliere servente her pet monkey and her parrot the base ignorance of the peasantry the disorders and license of the bohemian world the strolling players and mountebanks in short all the various social strata and substrata of the period the book is less a novel than a sort of cultured seat and guestit of the epoch comprehensive thorough and rather ponderous it is not surprising to find now and again a certain avoidance of the concrete and the specific. That is a defect commonly found in historical fiction of any period. It is always safer to leave out a detail than to run the risk of putting one in that has not been amply verified. Yet, curiously enough, the value of decision lacks much of the time another element which needed no verification. Namely, the sunshine, the blue sky, the redolence of warmth and color and surface gaiety which is the very essence of Italy, which makes itself felt in every page of Stendhal's Chartreuse de Parme, is woven into the woof and warp of Aromola, and goes far towards redeeming the tawdry sensationalism of Ouida. There are times when one cannot help suspecting that Mrs. Wharton has something in common with her hero, who, she tells us, had lived through twelve Italian summers without sense of the sun-steeped quality of an atmosphere that even in shade gives each object a golden salience. He was conscious of it now, only as it suggested fingering a missile stiff with gold leaf and edged with a swarming diversity of buds and insects. Her consciousness of nature is, in this volume, of much the same sort. When she pauses to describe it, she usually does so from a purely aesthetic point of view, with an artist's professional enjoyment of some grouping of rocks or trees which would make an effective picture, a scene which Salvatore might have painted, or abandoned the road where the roadside started into detail like the foreground of some minute Dutch painter. And these descriptions are always of the briefest character. It is only when she becomes interested in some matter of aesthetic or philosophic import that she permits her pen to run freely. It is worth while to quote even at some length a characteristic passage of this latter type, because such passages constitute a formidable proportion of the pages in this particular volume. Quote, in the semi-Parisian capital, where French architects designed the king's pleasure houses, and the nobility imported their boudoir panelings from Paris, and their damask hangings from Lyon, Benedetto Alfieri represented the old classic tradition, the tradition of the grand manner, which had held its own through all later variations of taste, 
running parallel with the barochismo of the seventeenth century and the effeminate caprices of the rococo period he had lived much in rome in the company of men like winkelmann and maffei in that society where the revival of classical research was being forwarded by the liberality of princes and cardinals and by the indefatigable zeal of the scholars in their pay from this centre of aesthetic reaction alfieri had returned to the gallicized turin with its preference for the graceful and ingenious rather than for the large the noble the restrained bringing to bear on the taste of his native city the influence of a view raised but perhaps narrowed by close study of the past the view of a generation of architects in whom archaeological curiosity had stifled the artistic instinct and who instead of assimilating the spirit of the past like their great predecessors were engrossed in a sterile restoration of the letter it requires a certain conscious effort to disinter from under all the superimposed erudition the essential central thread of the story the stage setting is an imaginary petty dukedom pianura in the north of italy owing allegiance to charles ferdinand on the one hand and attached by marriage to the house of Habsburg on the other the hero odo valseca is of the old order heir presumptive to the throne of pianura and kept from the succession only by an invalid cousin and the latter's sickly child in his character and temperament odo represents the conflicting tendencies of the times he is in sympathy with the new ideas of progress and liberty and has brief flashes of energy and enthusiasm but they soon burn themselves out for he is fundamentally lethargic and indifferent inheriting the fatal taint of his house the heroine fulvia vivaldi represents the new order she is the daughter of a professor of philosophy who has suffered exile for his temerity in teaching the forbidden learning under fulvia's influence odo becomes an eager disciple of the new philosophy and he is on the point of sacrificing his prospects and accompanying her to france when the death of his cousin unexpectedly makes him duke of pianura to the man and the girl his duty is plain this is so typical of mrs wharton the idea of rebellion against fate hardly seems to occur to them he must accept his burden and devote his life to securing for the people of pianura the liberty to which they are entitled as for fulvia she may either continue on her way alone to paris or she may remain at pianura under conditions which she will not accept Quote, the regent's mistress she said slowly the key to the treasury the back door to preferment the secret trafficker in titles and appointments that is what i should stand for and it is not to such services that you must even appear to owe your power i will not say that i have my own work to do for the dearest service i could perform would be to help you in yours but to do this i must stand aside to be near you i must go from you to love you i must give you up no one can say that this was not excellent reasoning but three years later fulvia changes her mind returns to pianura and accepts the very conditions which she previously so emphatically refused the result is an impression of inconsistency a feeling that the fulvia who went away and the fulvia who came back are two quite different persons apparently however her return was a structural necessity in order to pave the way for an effective and tragic ending fulvia spurs odo on to give the people a liberal constitution for which they are not yet ready and in the midst of the ensuing riots receives in her heart the shot intended for her lover such in brief is the substance of a story which the general tendency of criticism has been to overvalue the characters are clearly and conscientiously drawn the drama in which they play their part deals with vital questions of life and liberty and human happiness yet for the most part they leave us cold they fail to touch the keynote of responsive sympathy the explanation lies of course in the author's willingness to subordinate the human interest of her story the individual joys and sorrows of her characters to the exposition of her main theme the sociological conditions of eighteenth-century italy in other words at the time of writing the valley of decision she had not yet learned the trick of that delicate balance between the general and the specific theme which is the hallmark of the strongest and biggest type of fiction there remain three other volumes which demand specific notice the house of mirth madame de trems and the fruit of the tree two intermediate volumes the touchstone and sanctuary although highly characteristic are of no more significance in relation to mrs wharton's growth as an artist than the majority of her short stories perhaps rather less significant than just a few of them 
the fruit of the tree although the latest of her long novels may well be put out of the way first as representing the greatest gulf between purpose and accomplishment that any of her books afford the story opens with an accident in a woollen mill by which an employee loses an arm the affair would be hushed up but for the efforts of john amherst assistant foreman and justine brent hospital nurse both of whom lose their positions in consequence the mills are run in the interest of capitalists and in defiance of factory regulations they are owned by a young widow bessie westmore who has been content to shirk her responsibility and leave matters in the hands of her trustees john amherst marries the widow believing that he has convinced her of the justice of his plans to reform the mills and here begins a long slow struggle and an inevitable estrangement since bessie contrary to her husband's expectations cannot see why her money should be thrown away on club rooms and gymnasiums for the workmen when she needs new gowns new carriages new automobiles estrangement begets defiance and bessie deliberately risks her life on a horse that amherst has forbidden her to ride the result is a disastrous fall and serious damage to the spine near the base of the brain her husband cannot reach her for weeks he is travelling in south america the doctors know that there is not one chance in a thousand for her recovery but there is a hope through the cruel skill of modern surgery of keeping her alive until amherst can arrive but this can be done only at the cost of unimaginable torture an augmenting anguish that rings from the sufferer a ceaseless hoarse inarticulate cry increasing in intensity with the slow passage of the days justine brent the trained nurse who has been a lifelong friend of bessie finds her patient's agony more than she can bear to witness and mercifully cuts it short with an extra hypodermic of morphine she believes in her conscience that she has done right and not a doubt assails her until in the course of years she herself becomes the wife of john amherst and he comes to know that in the eyes of the law she would be regarded as the murderess of his first wife the plot of this story in so far as it concerns the right of the medical profession to shorten suffering where a cure is hopeless is not a new theme it has been briefly but poignantly handled in a short story by mrs atherton it has been worked out at great length by edouard rod in la sacrifier mrs wharton has nothing new to add to this issue and by bringing in factory reform and labor questions she has simply obscured her main theme the house of mirth is a book of altogether different caliber a big vital masterly book of its type and one that utterly refuses to be forgotten like so many of mrs wharton's earlier and shorter stories it is a trenchant satire on the manners and customs of certain social strata in new york of to-day the pages are not overcrowded with figures yet these are so wisely chosen and so deftly sketched in as to give an impression of many-sided kaleidoscopic life the book however belongs primarily to the type of the one character story it is a history of just one woman lily bart through a few crucial years the remaining personages in the story whether few or many are mere background shadow shapes that come and go with no other effect than to make the central figure stand out in sharper relief lily bart at the opening of the story is in spite of her nine-and-twenty years still essentially a girl with a girl's unquenchable desire for a continuation of the ease and luxury pleasure and adulation that have hitherto been her birthright but her parents are dead her resources are almost exhausted and she has all the helplessness which characterizes those brought up in accordance with the sheltered life system when confronted with the elemental problem of self-support she has in fact only one obvious path open to her namely marriage she may marry for money and despise herself or she may marry for love and repent at leisure or else suffer the equally probable pain of seeing her husband do sufficient repenting for them both so she temporizes and meanwhile puts off the evil hour from week to week living at the expense of her friends in a round of visits playing recklessly at bridge and of course losing heavily and foolishly accepting a rather large loan from a married man under the thin pretense that he has been speculating for her and has sold out at a profit but these details merely skim the surface of a book which quite wonderfully and unsparingly probes into the deepest recesses of a woman's heart dragging to the surface much that she would have refused to reveal even to herself and back of this merciless analysis 
and perhaps even bigger than it is the sense of an inexorable logic of cause and effect which leads us by closely correlated steps from the moment when lily bart first breaks one of the unwritten laws of her social set by a brief visit to a man's bachelor apartments down to the hour when she renders her final account and the empty chloral bottle tells its story it is easy for those who echo the modern cry for a spiritual uplift in fiction to carp at the house of mirth but the fact remains that the name of Lily Bart will be handed down in the list of heroines with whom the well-read person is expected to be acquainted. And now, quite briefly, let us look at Madame de Trem, a slender, unpretentious little volume which I believe, none the less, to represent Mrs. Wharton's high-water mark of attainment almost flawless in structure and in content. It is an extremely simple story. John Durham had, in the old unrestricted New York days, known Fanny Frisbee long and intimately, but it never occurred to him to find her desirable until, fifteen years later, he met her once more in Paris as Madame de Malrive, separated but not yet divorced from her husband. Her estrangement from her husband was now of five years standing, so John Durham could see nothing premature or indelicate in urging his own claims and persuading her to seek her freedom through the courts but he was destined to learn that in france especially among the old families there is a hereditary code so powerful as to make appeal to the courts well-nigh hopeless durham cannot understand the law is the law it all seems so simple but fanny de malrive knows better she has a little son whom she has pledged to bring up as a frenchman he is only half hers even now and she must do nothing that will lessen her hold upon him nothing that her husband's mother and sister and uncle the abbe do not approve this sister madame de trem holds the key to the situation if durham can meet her and win from her a statement whether or not the family will oppose a suit for divorce he and fanny will know where they stand the main story of the book is the contest between durham and madame de trem the duel of verbal finesse that is like the crossing of fine flexible rapiers and lastly that wonderful final thrust through which madame de trem by the very act of granting what he asks effects his total overthrow and to her own surprise hurts herself almost as keenly as she hurts him the book represents a high development of all of mrs wharton's admitted qualities and beyond these it has a more perfect technique of form and a greater sense of real sympathy with the people of her creation than anything she has written before it or since End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of Some American Storytellers » by Frederick Tabor Cooper « This LibriVox recording is in the public domain » 9. Newton Booth, Tarkington Upon renewing acquaintance with the gentleman from Indiana from the vantage ground of a ten-year interval, one realizes by what a narrow margin Mr. Tarkington rescued the born storyteller within him from the would-be maker of purposeful and serious fiction. This book, in fact, represents a parting of two ways, a battleground between two opposing impulses, two widely divergent views of the aims and ambitions of a novelist, and for that reason it fails, in spite of occasional strength, to be a really good book, a piece of symmetrical and finished workmanship. Although it was his first published work, The Gentleman from Indiana was far from being Mr. Tarkington's first attempt at fiction. It has often been told that the germ of the two Van Revels was a short story of two thousand words written many years earlier, and that while The Gentleman from Indiana was not begun until 1898, Monsieur Beaucaire was written a year earlier, and Cherry not only antedates them both but was accepted as a two-part serial at a time when its author was practically unknown. In a lengthy critical study of Mr. Tarkington's writings, Arthur Bartlett Maurice rather happily conjectures that, perhaps it was of himself and of his own disillusionment that he was thinking when he described in The Gentleman from Indiana, John Harkless occupied with a realization that there had been a man in his class whose ambition needed no restraint. His promise was so complete, in the strong belief of the university, a belief that he could not help knowing and that seven years to a day from his commencement this man was sitting on a fence-rail in Indiana. And Mr. Maurice hereupon adds, Sitting on a rail fence in Indiana was figuratively just what Tarkington was doing from 1893 to 1899. Now, in order to understand how the author of Monsieur Beaucaire ever happened to write The Gentleman from Indiana, it is necessary to keep just a few facts in mind. 
In the first place, Mr. Tarkington had throughout these seven years been vainly trying to obtain a public hearing and had been persistently denied. Even after Cherry had been accepted for magazine publication, the editor seems to have had a sober second thought and the manuscript was sidetracked until the subsequent success of his other stories gave it an unforeseen and intrinsic value that hurried it into print. Secondly, in the closing years of the nineteenth century, there came a sudden demand for a rather serious type of political novel and of the novel that professed to study the social and economic problems of American life and especially of life in the West. The times were ripe for just such books as Brand Whitlock's Thirteenth District, Mr. Tarkington's Gentleman from Indiana, The Virginian of Owen Wister, and bigger and greater than these, The Pit and the Octopus of Frank Norris, which were to come later. It was quite natural, quite pardonable, that a young man in Mr. Tarkington's position, sobered by discouragement, should have attempted for once to meet a specific popular demand especially when the attempt to meet it meant no greater effort than simply to open his eyes and set down faithfully what he could see from his viewpoint on the fence rail and what he thought about the things that he saw. Unfortunately, this method of work, which to many another writer is the simplest and most congenial, was one which Mr. Tarkington, with the best intentions in the world, found himself unable to sustain. He is one of those whose worship of the God of things as they are is at best an outward show. The mantle of realism is upon his shoulders a curious misfit, and he has done wisely in discarding it. The gentleman from Indiana is a luminous object lesson. There are in it two interwoven stories so radically different in their spirit, their outlook upon life and the key in which they are told, that it is rather difficult to say with any assurance which of these two was Mr. Tarkington's starting point, and just what important thought, if any, he undertook to develop. Apparently his theme was something of this nature. When a discouraged young man from the East, discouraged because he knows that he has the ambition and the energy to succeed, but lacks the opportunity, finds himself at last in a somnolent western town, and by remorselessly driving himself day and night succeeds in instilling some sort of life into that town, and at the same time making himself the most important and most respected of all its citizens. He is quite likely not to see that success is already holding out her hands to him, quite likely to feel that he is stagnating, wasting his strength and his years in a jumping-off place from which there is no escape, and all the while he is building for himself unconsciously a big and splendid future. This is what I think that Mr. Tarkington was trying to say, that the surest way to play a big part before a large audience tomorrow is to play your little part before your small audience today, and to be sure that you play it with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. The trouble with the gentleman from Indiana, which might so easily have been made a really big book, is that in trying to say this, Mr. Tarkington said it so very badly. The book makes one think of a long steel girder which has buckled and broken in the middle from sheer structural weakness. Harkless, the young Easterner, who has come to the town of Platteville and invested his last dollar in the Carlow County Herald, accomplishes a number of rather difficult things with almost too much ease and promptness. He rescues the paper from a moribund condition and makes it a recognized local force. He drives an unscrupulous political boss from power and ushers in a new era of honest government. He declares war against the lawless band of white caps who constitute the squalid settlement at Six Cross Roads and for years have terrorized the neighborhood, and his crusade results in landing a considerable number of them in state's prison. The remaining white caps, however, have sworn vengeance, and because he will not take their threats seriously and will not guard himself properly, they catch him one night on a lonely road and on the morrow there remains no sign of him save some footprints in the mud and trampled grass. Suspicion is divided between the whitecaps and a couple of shell-men, whom Harkless had been instrumental in driving out of town. Public opinion condemns the whitecaps, and a well-equipped lynching party is proceeding to make short work of them, when a telegram arrives from the neighboring city of Rouen. Quote, Found both shell-men, one arrested at noon in a second-hand clothes store, wearing Harkless's hat, also trying to dispose torn full dress coat known to have been worn by Harkless last night. Stains on lining believed blood. Second man found later at freight yards an empty lumber car left Platteville 1 p.m., badly hurt, shot and bruised. Hurt man taken to hospital unconscious. Will die. Hope able question him first and discover whereabouts body. 
Now the details of what happened at the Six Cross Roads and what share the shellmen had in it need not concern us here. The above telegram is quoted solely for the sake of pointing out the big dramatic possibilities of the subsequent scene when a delegation from Platteville arrive at the Rouen Hospital in order to take the shell man's dying confession, and the mass of bruised flesh and broken bones opens its eyes, and the white scarred lips move and speak with the voice of Harkless. This is all good workmanship. The surprise, when it comes, is complete and the whole story has been worked up slowly, carefully, with a painstaking diligence of details, an ingenious plausibility that effectually veil the underlying melodrama. But it is just at this point that the girder breaks and the book's structure goes to pieces. There is, of course, the usual obligatory young woman in the story, although up to this point it has not seemed needful to the present writer to make mention of her. She is known as Helen Sherwood, and, like Harkless, is an outsider, being in Platteville only on a visit. But in reality, she is only the Sherwood's adopted daughter, and her father is old, broken-down Frisbee, whom Harkless has befriended and saved from drinking himself to death. Now, what Mr. Tarkington, in the naivete of early authorship, asks us to believe is this, that while Harkless lies in the Rouen hospital fighting for life inch by inch, Helen Sherwood, nay, Frisbee, with the courage of utter ignorance, rushes into the breach and with no newspaper training, no knowledge of politics, no practical experience of life, proceeds to edit the Carlo County Herald, to increase its size, to build up its circulation and, most amazing of all, to start a campaign in favor of Harkless that results in securing him the nomination to Congress. All this is sheer romanticism, and if taken at its face value is exceedingly good fun. But, unfortunately, the first half of the book was conceived in a sane and sober spirit of actuality, and that is why the first and second section of the book part company with a violence like that of a railway train if a switch were suddenly misplaced beneath the middle car. The purpose of giving so much space to the gentleman from Indiana is not solely in order to show its structural defects. It is a book which one may quite sincerely like without being blind to its faults. It bristles with absurdities, yet, in spite of them, one cannot help feeling the warm, lovable human nature in its characters. To create characters that seem thoroughly alive is part of the inborn gift of the true storyteller, and no amount of farce or melodrama will quite hide it. But characters endowed with the breath of life are not the exclusive prerogative of either romance or realism. If, on the one hand, we have Major Pendennis and Colonel Newcomb, on the other we have D'Artagnan and Chicot the Jester, equally alive, equally impossible to forget. It still remained to be seen which of the two methods was Mr. Tarkington's natural medium. The publication of M. Beaucaire promptly solved the doubt. No one but a born romanticist could have written that dainty and consistent bit of fictional artistry. It had no more serious excuse for existence than a miniature on ivory or a finely cut cameo, and it needed none. Its best excuse was the blitheness of its mood, the symmetry of its form, the swiftness of its action, the tingling vitality of it from start to finish. But it, immediately and once for all, defined Mr. Tarkington's proper sphere and limitations. It proved him one of those writers whose stories, whenever and wherever laid, should carry with them something of the once-upon-a-time atmosphere, the fitting atmosphere of the story that aims frankly to entertain. It reduced at once to an absurdity the bare idea of Mr. Tarkington's ever again attempting to write a novel opening with such prosaic actuality as There is a fertile stretch of flat lands in Indiana where unigrarian eastern travelers glancing from car windows shudder and return their eyes to interior upholstery. From the clumsy heaviness of the gentleman from Indiana to the debonair self-mastery of Monsieur Beaucaire is indeed a rather far cry. But it is precisely this type of a story which has the most to lose in the retelling. Something of its fragile charm must inevitably brush off at the first careless touch, like the golden pollen on a butterfly's wings. It is less a tale than an episode in the life of a princely young Frenchman who, temporarily out of favor at court, is sojourning incognito in England and falls under the spell of gold and snow in the blue sky of a lady's eyes. Now, Monsieur Beaucaire, so it is rumored, has come to England as a valet in the suite of Monsieur de Mirepoix, the French ambassador. 
For this reason he has been publicly rebuffed in the pump-room at Bath by no less a personage than Beau Nash, and for a time he lives quietly and is visited surreptuously by just a few men of fashion who know him only as a professional gambler but believe that his play is honest. The story opens at the moment when Beaucaire catches the Duke of Winterset in the act of cheating at cards, and, as a price of his silence, forces Winterset to introduce him into the upper social circles at Bath as the Duc de Chateaurien of Castle Nowhere. He has only to strip off his imposing mustachios and his black peruque and shake down the sparkling curls of his yellow hair to make the transformation complete. As Duc de Chateaurien, vouched for by Winterset, he meets and woos the Lady Mary Carlyle, the most beautiful woman in England on whom Winterset has already turned a covetous glance. This is the reason why Winterset does not keep his pledge of silence, and why he spreads the rumor that the successful suitor for the hand of Lady Mary Carlyle is none other than Victor the barber and Beaucaire the gambler. And one clear September night, when the mists were rising slowly from the fields and the moon was radiant overhead, and all of Bath that pretended to fashion was present at a certain fete at a country house in the neighborhood. Monsieur Beaucaire seized the opportunity while escorting the Lady Mary's carriage to bring his suit to some definite issue, when suddenly a party of horsemen charged down the highway, raising the battle cry of Barber, kill the barber! And being six to one, they overcame Monsieur Beaucaire, bound him, and would have shamefully beaten him before the Lady Mary's eyes, had not his belated servants arrived in the nick of time to save him. The attacking party, however, had already branded him as an impostor, and as he stands there, slowly bleeding from a hidden wound and held erect only by indomitable pride, he sees belief fade out from the blue sky of Lady Mary's eyes, and limitless scorn take its place. The climax comes two weeks later when Beaucaire, though warned to quit the country, reappears in the pump-room of Bath, his incognito laid aside, and is formally presented to the Lady Mary and his enemies as His Highness, Prince Louis-Philippe de Valois, Duke of Orléans, Duke of Chartres, Duke of Nemours, Duke of Montpensier, First Prince of the Blood Royal. The list trails on indefinitely while a bystanding Frenchman murmurs in an aside, Old Mirepoix has the long breath, but it take a strong man today to say all of the names. It is here, in the final page, that Mr. Tarkington gives the one last artistic touch. Monsieur Beaucaire forgives the Lady Mary for her bitter mistake. It is nothing, less than nothing. There is only just one woman in the whole world who will not have treat me in the way that you treat me. It is to her that I am going to make reparation. Cherry, written prior to either of the books already mentioned, followed next in order of publication. It is not one of Mr. Tarkington's significant books, but it attracts attention because of the whimsical nature of its theme and its still older setting. For it is a story of a college student in the days preceding the American Revolution. It is told in the first person by a certain Mr. Sudgeberry, intolerably priggish, incredibly self-satisfied, who at the age of nineteen is finishing his third year of study at Nassau Hall. Mr. Sudgeberry is, so far as his preoccupation with himself will permit, deeply enamored of a young woman, a certain Miss Sylvia Gray, who is addicted to cherry-colored ribbons and who is curiously tolerant of one of Sudgeberry's classmates, one William Fentress, whose riotous and ungodly mode of life Sudgeberry sternly condemns. The exaggerated pedantry, the unbelievable thick-headedness of Sudgeberry, while cleverly sustained, become wearisome when prolonged throughout a hundred and seventy-four pages. The story of a girl who, while accepting attentions from one man, amuses herself by keeping another dangling upon the string, and using him to keep her father engaged in conversation is too flimsy material from which to make a novel, even when eked out by a lover's quarrel, a burlesque highway robbery and rescue, and Christmas chimes presaging marriage bells. No author can produce three volumes of such varying degrees of merit and of success without learning a good deal about his readers and about himself. What Mr. Tarkington seems to have learned pretty thoroughly was that, whether the general public did or did not care for serious fiction, problem novels with weighty lessons behind them, from him at least they asked only entertainment, and that entertainment was the commodity that he could most easily afford them. Accordingly, he wrote The Two Van Revels, a novel of the high-class comedy type, blithe, wholesome, optimistic, peopled with men of old-fashioned courtliness and women of gracious manners and soft-voiced charm. 
Technically, it was a better piece of work than the gentleman from Indiana, which in date of composition immediately preceded it. The plot structure, although frail in substance, showed careful workmanship. The character drawing was done with a surer touch. And best of all, Mr. Tarkington knew precisely in what key he was pitching his story, and he held to that key from first to last. There is nowhere in it the least suggestion of an attempt to pretend that it is anything else than sheer romanticism, which here and there trespasses across the borderline of melodrama. The setting is once more the Indiana which Mr. Tarkington knows so well, but he secures that rose-tinted mist of distance, so essential to romance of this type, by throwing back the time of action a couple of generations, to the days just preceding the outbreak of the Mexican War. As in all three of the earlier stories, the plot turns upon a prolonged misunderstanding. And, as in two out of the other three, the nature of the misunderstanding is a mistaken identity. And herein lies the inherent weakness of the two Van Revels, the lack of plausibility that no amount of verbal dexterity quite succeeds in disguising. Where a story hinges upon the chance confusion in the mind of a young girl, of one man for another, in a town where everyone knows everyone else, and she is constantly meeting first one of the two men and then the other at all sorts of social functions, talking with them, dancing with them, liable at any moment to hear them addressed by name. Under such circumstances, the difficulty of carrying conviction increases with each additional page of the story. In Monsieur Beaucaire, the hero's identity is an easily kept secret because it is shared by no one but his loyal servants and M. Beaucaire had the further advantage of being very short. In The Gentleman from Indiana, the fact that the heroine is the substitute editor on the Carlo County Herald is easily kept from the hero because he is flat on his back in a hospital ward in another town many miles distant, and there is the further advantage that the secret had to be kept throughout only a third of the volume. In The Two Van Revels, Miss Betty Carew's blunder in taking Tom Van Revel and Crayley Gray each for the other is the very essence of the whole book, its starting point, its continued suspense, its culminating tragedy, its sole excuse for being. It would have served admirably as the substructure of a short story, in which form Mr. Tarkington is said originally to have conceived it. But as a full-length novel, in spite of a great deal of ingenuity, one feels that the situation is forced, artificial, and perilously near a breakdown at almost any moment. Old Robert Carew has the reputation of being not only the richest man, but the best hater in the community. And at the time that his daughter Betty bids farewell to her convent school and comes home, his long-standing feud with the Van Revels has blazed up with renewed heat. In his opinion, openly expressed, the law firm of Van Revel and Gray is made up of a knave and a fool, and in this opinion he is not in the slightest degree shaken by the fact that the public at large has never made up its mind which of the two it loves the more. Steady, loyal, wholly dependable Tom Van Revel, or light-hearted, fickle, fascinating, and utterly untrustworthy Crayley Gray. Betty Carew warned by her father that if young Van Revel ever dares set foot inside his grounds he will shoot him on sight, finds a delicious and perilous joy in clandestine meetings with a man she thinks her father's enemy, but who in reality is Crayley Gray. And all the while she is hearing disgraceful, scandalous tales of Crayley Gray, and because of them doing her best to make herself hate and despise the man whom she fell in love with at first sight, and who, of course, is the real Van Revel. The story proceeds with clever artistry to its inevitable melodramatic tragedy and would deserve to rank rather high among Mr. Tarkington's productions, excepting for the fact that we cannot escape from a sense of its being in a measure expert jugglery, a tour de force, of a literary prestidigitateur. Next, in order of time, comes a volume of short stories of such wide divergence of merit that one suspects some of them at least to belong to a rather early period. Nevertheless, they deserve for certain easily explained reasons somewhat more serious attention than Mr. Tarkington's critics have chosen hitherto to give them. The title of the volume is In the Arena, and the theme of every one of the six stories, directly or indirectly, is political. These stories are quite serious studies of existing conditions in American politics as Mr. Tarkington sees them and it proves that while he is unable to do a sustained full-length novel in this serious vein, he can keep it up quite easily so long as he confines himself to the short story dimension. It is hard to discriminate in favor of any one story over the others. There is a great deal of human nature in The Need of Money, in which we are told how it happened that Uncle Billy Rowlandson, 
a lifelong democrat and a man as honest as the day is long one day so voted as to kill a party measure and was in consequence read out of his party and then there is that delightful bit of social and political satire combined entitled mrs prothero it recounts the waterloo of a certain alonzo rawson who happened once upon a time to be the senator from stackpole now alonzo was a raw-boned half-educated intensely earnest young man who took his duties especially those connected with the drains and dykes committee with such solemnity that he nightly prayed on his knees for guidance of course a young man of alonzo's education and environment could not have been expected to fathom the wiles and fascinations of a creature of infinite resources and sagacity such as mrs prothero social butterfly and veteran lobbyist proved herself to be the odds were really unfair and from the moment of his first encounter he was lost the cause of his downfall was a certain sunday baseball bill which he was pledged to oppose which with untrained but moving eloquence he had already publicly denounced and which mrs prothero succeeded in convincing him was a generous and noble measure on behalf of the downtrodden working man it happened that mrs prothero owned the local baseball grounds the rent of which would have doubled if they could have been used on sunday but this the senator from stackpole did not know until afterwards his moral back somersault was dexterously turned his final speech in favor of the bill was an able effort and all might have gone well but for the unfortunate circumstance that a political opponent had happened to see him at the crucial moment when behind a sheltering screen of palms he had rashly kissed mrs prothero and the news thereof had been disseminated throughout the senate a particular interest however attaches to the last story in the volume entitled great men's sons the occasion of the story was a certain performance of l'aiglon at the time when madame sarah bernhardt and monsieur coquelin were touring the country the story however concerns l'aiglon only indirectly in the audience on the night in question there is a certain thin old man with a grizzled chin beard and a high-pitched voice his name so mr tarkington explains is tom martin and his home a small country town where he commands the trade in dry goods and men's clothing it is after the play that tom martin permits himself to tell mr tarkington what he thinks of the performance they seem to be doing it about as well as they could but he thinks they were badly handicapped by the play itself Quote, folks always like to laugh at a great man's son and say he can't amount to anything of course that comes partly from fellows like that ornery little cuss we saw to-night thinking they're a good deal because somebody else done something and the somebody else happened to be their pa and the women run after em and they get low down like he was and so on i read the book in english before i come up and it seemed to me he was pretty much of a low-down boy yet i wanted to see how they'd make him out here and it was thought the country over to be such a great play hereupon the old man wanders off with apparent irrelevance to a story about a certain fellow townsman of his orlando t bickner's boy mel it is a simple plainly told tale of silent self-sacrifice and splendid courage showing how a young fellow with the right kind of stuff in him fights an almost hopeless battle educating his sisters and younger brother holding the family together keeping his mother from want and winning the love and respect of the whole community and then on the threshold of achievement he breaks down from overwork and dies as uncomplainingly as he had lived without its ever once occurring to him that he had done anything more than his simple duty but the story gets its point the kind of point that mr tarkington in his later work is fond of making from the suggested contrast between the romantic glamour of thrones and titles and the simple pathos of actuality Quote, well sir i read that leg-long book down home so i thought i'd better come up and see it for myself how it was on the stage where you could look at it and i expect they done it as well as they could but when that little boy that always had his board and clothes and education free saw that he just about talked himself to death and called for the press notices about his christening to be read to him to soothe his last spasms why i wasn't overly put in mind of melville bickner three more volumes need to be commented upon briefly not because they serve to throw any new light upon mr tarkington's methods but simply because they are exceedingly good of their kind the first of these is the beautiful lady like monsieur beaucaire it is merely a trifle but a very charming and a very perfect trifle 
The opening scene is one of the open-air cafés in Paris at the corner of the Place de l'Opéra. The principal actor is one Ansolini, an impoverished Neapolitan, who, in order to pay for the board and education of two little nieces, has accepted the humiliating office of being an animated billboard. His head is shaven and adorned in brilliant letters with the legend, Théâtre Folie Rouge, Revue de Printemps tous les soirs. His contract obliges him to sit for weary hours day by day with his head bowed above one of the small café tables surrounded by a curious and jeering throng. Just once during all these days does he hear a word of sympathetic understanding. A woman clad in grey whose voice proclaims that she is an American and that she is young pauses before him and far from seeing anything amusing in the sight exclaims involuntarily, Ah, the poor man! She has perceived that he is a gentleman. This is the beginning of a delicately wrought idol, the peculiar and elusive flavor of which is due in no small measure to the skill with which Mr. Tarkington makes the Neapolitan tell the story in a variety of English which he flatters himself is triumphantly idiomatic, but which at times is fearfully and wonderfully constructed. We come next to the conquest of Canaan. The theme briefly stated is simply the difficulty of living down a bad reputation after it has once been firmly established. Joe Luden found himself, at the age of nineteen, a much-neglected and misunderstood young man, owing to the conditions of his home life after his father's second marriage with a widow having a son of about Joe's age. It was not unnatural that, failing to find companionship among the more staid and respectable citizens of Canaan, he should seek it in the back rooms of saloons and in a still less savory resort known by the name of Beaver Beach. Naturally, enough bad company begot bad manners and at last a day came when a certain mad adventure won for him the enmity of Martin Pike, the smug, sanctimonious, and utterly unscrupulous old millionaire who dominated Canaan with an iron hand. There was nothing left for Joe Luden to do but to leave Canaan, and for long years his whereabouts and his methods of life are an unknown quantity to his native town. In those earlier days Joe numbered among his acquaintances only one real friend of the better class. She was the granddaughter of an impoverished painter, and her name was Ariel Tabor. She was shabby in dress and painfully conscious of it, and she had the shyness and the awkwardness of movement which in girlhood not infrequently are the forerunner of later grace and charm. But in those early days, at least, she was as far from winning the approval of Canaan's autocrats as Joe himself, and their common grievance helped to cement their friendship. Seven years elapse between the time of Joe's disappearance and his return as a man sobered by hard experience, strong from his single-handed fight with the world, and ready now to settle down in his old home as a practicing lawyer. To his amazement, he finds that the old prejudice against him is still smoldering, the bad name once attached to him has not yet been forgotten, the young men and women who knew him as a boy imitate the example of priest and Levite and pass him by on the other side. The clerk at the National House curtly informs him that the rooms are all occupied, and the greetings of his father and relatives are even less cordial, his stepbrother sarcastically inquiring whether he has saved up enough money on which to starve. In short, all respectable Canaan conspires to drive him back to his old haunts and old companions, and he finds that if he is to stay in Canaan and fight for his rights he can do so only by seeking shelter at Beaver Beach and accepting the human scum and refuse of the place as his first clients. Such is the beginning of a prolonged, tenacious, doggedly contested struggle, which is destined to end in Joe Luden's complete and triumphant conquest of Canaan. From passive scorn the town soon awakes to active hostility with Martin Pike, his millions and his newspaper representing the entrenched forces of Canaan's respectability. From this point on the story becomes frank melodrama, of that glorified sort which could not be appreciated on Third Avenue. The shy, gauche Ariel Tabor returns from Europe transformed into a vision of feminine grace and charm, wreaks havoc with the male population of Canaan, and gives to Joe the one needful incentive to keep him from weakening at the crucial moment of his fight. Joe promptly wins a series of great victories. He triumphs in a prolonged legal fight, although all public opinion is against him. He exposes the rascality of Martin Pike, who has nearly defrauded Ariel of a fortune and the curtain is finally rung down upon him, as the curtain always should be rung down upon the hero of a melodrama, in the hour of his exaltation as mayor-elect of Canaan and the accepted suitor of the woman he loves. And lastly we have the guest of Quenet, 
which some of Mr. Tarkington's more enthusiastic admirers have pronounced the best piece of fiction that he has yet produced. It is somewhat difficult for an impartial reader to find any adequate reason for thus discriminating against his earlier volumes. The Guest of Quenet is a readable story, with a picturesque setting and an atmosphere of considerable charm. It has an underlying mystery so transparent that it ought to cease to mystify any person of average intelligence at least as early in its progress as the fifth or sixth chapter, and it does contain one or two ideas of serious import. Yet, take it all in all, it is simply a new variation of the old Tarkington formula, a prolonged social tangle based upon mistaken identity, with only this difference that the person whose identity is in question is as much a puzzle to himself as to anyone else. Several years before the opening of the story, its heroine tried that familiar and dangerous experiment of marrying a dissolute wreck of a man with the intention of reforming him. The experiment resulted in the customary failure. The husband was before long making himself notorious on the Paris boulevards in company with a Spanish dancer and the outraged wife was seeking a divorce when a grim automobile accident very nearly crushed life out of him and completely crushed out all knowledge of himself, all memory of the past. The automobile accident, by the way, is a fine bit of pictorial sketching. Mr. Tarkington certainly has a rare gift when he wants to use it for freehand drawing of scenes of carnage. All of these details belong structurally to the prologue. The real story begins a couple of years later when a strikingly handsome young man with prematurely gray hair, a young man who looks, so friends of the automobile victims say, as though he might have been the latter's younger brother or his own better self at an earlier age, makes his appearance in a little French village within easy walking distance of a chateau temporarily occupied by a beautiful stranger who is understood to be an American woman. The story is told in the first person by an American tourist to whom, at the outset, none of the principal characters is personally known, and, being himself much mystified, he succeeds in surrounding his people and his events with a certain amount of verbal fog. Nevertheless, it takes no great ingenuity to conjecture that the young man with the prematurely gray hair who looks out upon life with the wondering gaze of a child is the former dissolute husband whose accident has blotted out all memory of evil and that the beautiful stranger at the chateau is the wife who, in spite of neglect and humiliation, has never ceased to care for him, and who now is tremulously fearful lest his loss of memory of other things involves also the memory of her. Persons whose past has been blotted out by some injury to the brain have been the theme of more novels than it would be now worth while to count. Mr. Tarkington in a measure justifies the use of an old idea by injecting into it this new suggestion that we are all of us hampered by our memory of the past, handicapped by our knowledge of the evil in the world at large, and more specifically in ourselves, and that if upon reaching maturity some accident should blot all this out, leaving our minds as blank as in early childhood, and give us a chance to start over again, to ignore evil and learn only what is good, we might make of ourselves far nobler men and women than we were before. Mr. Tarkington contents himself with making this suggestion. He proves nothing, nor does he try to. His story ends on the threshold of the new life, and whether his hero is a permanently reformed character, or whether he slowly but inevitably drifts back into his old evil ways, remains tantalizingly an open question. But this does not alter the fact that the author has written a very agreeable summer idyll pervaded by the soft sunshine, the fragrance of flowers, and the singing of birds an atmosphere which altogether brings a thrill of nostalgia for the highways and byways of rural France. These eight volumes pretty well sum up not only what Mr. Tarkington has done in prose fiction, but what he is likely to achieve in the future. In spite of much diversity in time and setting, his talent is not an instrument of many notes. His themes, as already suggested, are few and oft repeated. The basis of every story he has written is a misunderstanding of one kind or another, of identity, of purpose, of character. He sees life, even the prosaic, everyday life of his home environment, through rose-tinted lenses that both soften and magnify. He has an imperishable faith in the innate goodness of the human heart which, coupled with a wholesome scorn of sham and snobbery, gives to the people of his fantasy a certain whole-souled quality that makes them lovable even while we feel that they are a little bit too good to be true. 
all of these qualities offer in themselves as much promise of success in drama under existing conditions as in prose fiction indeed one has only to glance at a play like the man from home in which his share in the collaboration with mr wilson can be shrewdly guessed between the lines to see how every one of his favorite tricks in his novels is there reproduced with even more felicitous effect there again in that play we have a situation depending on a whole series of misunderstandings and mistaken identities a russian prince masquerading as a simple german traveller an escaped anarchist disguised as a chauffeur a whole group of adventurers and tricksters male and female passing themselves off as shining lights of european aristocracy and the man from home himself voluntarily posing as a very simple homespun personality but in reality the brightest keenest most indomitable personality in the whole group and here more than anywhere in his novels mr tarkington allows himself to fall back upon that favorite makeshift of the romanticist coincidence everything happens in the nick of time a person's name is mentioned and miraculously he appears upon the scene a secret is whispered and somewhere a window or door opens stealthily and the secret is overheard a tangle of situations is tightly knotted up and the only people who can unravel it are supposedly scattered widely throughout europe and asia and presto they are all discovered simultaneously beneath the roof of a sicilian hotel here indeed we have the very essence of booth tarkington from first to last under various disguises he has always been as he is to-day a successful exponent of glorified melodrama End of chapter 9